Hey, welcome to the Mythic Dungeon International, day two of the season one global finals. I'm your host, Doa. With me are Tuttles, Makes, and uh, Nagura, and we're ready to get into it. That's right, the gates will open soon. In fact, very, very soon, as today is a big day. We got six matches, and we have our first teams being eliminated. And with a pack as tight as this group is, perhaps one of our closest ever in a global finals, uh, it's going to be tough to see some of these teams go. Isn't that right, Tuttles? Yeah, I mean... I mean... A lot of the matchups yesterday were 2-1 decisions that honestly, if you ran them back multiple times, they could have gone either way. And, and oh, we yeah. are in a situation where I think it wouldn't even be unlikely to see a team make a really deep lower bracket run, potentially even get in that third, fourth place. It could They could also upset a couple of teams and make it into that finals as well, because it's like you stated, <laughs> all eight of the teams that we've brought this weekend are playing at an absolutely insane level. Right. Makes, what are you most looking forward to today? Uh, we're going to see Temple, which has to be a big point that we're all excited about because we haven't seen Temple in this MDI weekend yet. And then there's also going to be a lot of eliminations and I don't want to say look forward to them, but elimination series back to back usually is pr pretty exciting. So it's maybe something other people look forward to. I'm just sad that teams are getting eliminated. Yeah, it, it is tough, Nagura, but I want to put you in a tougher situation which team will be eliminated first today? It narrows it down a little bit. Wow, you don't have a ton of choices so based mean. on the matches we got. <laughs> I'm sorry, this, I, right. this is just what um, happens sometimes. I have my, my clip button ready, Nagura. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is so difficult. All right, difficult. well, here's, here's our teams. All right. Yeah, so, okay. hmm, so it's going to be either uh -huh. Thunder, Donuts, Legendary, or Sloth, right? And. Uh, I mean, I, I technically would want to say Thundered because, in my mm. opinion, they were the team that made it into the Globals that were the most, like, unexpected to make it. But then they won a dungeon against Echo, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's just so hard to tell. I yeah, honestly, I, mean, I, can't, I can't say. I, I don't want to say it because I think it could literally be anyone. All right. Sorry, well, to be fair, I did put you in a very difficult position. I, I apologize. But <laughs> here's our here's enough. our format for everything. We'll find out soon enough anyway um, who is going to be going home. But it is tough to see. We got eight teams, of course, this weekend. Best of threes for all of our matches until the finals, which is a best of five. 300k USD on the line right now. And, of course, got some practice time, all that. Teams are allowed to ban a dungeon uh, each match, but not the first one. So that means uh, that first one, you know what it's going to be in advance, but you better be ready for it. What uh, what dungeon? Oh, um, and here's Wait, our additional this? rules as well. This is something we decided to bring in today because we felt like we needed to clarify some things. So let me go through these because it's kind of complex. Wait, Teams wait, are allowed to ban one class one? from the opposing team. This cannot be Major Warlock. Tournament administration can call a match restart any time if the vibes don't feel right. Uh, new affects summon <laughs> Tettles. This is a big one. If a team falls behind, they can summon Tettles into their opponent's party, and he will replace the team's tank. That can that can have a major impact on a team's time. To be clear, and of course, teams are allowed one dungeon ban per series. Chat can veto this ban now by spamming one enough times. Just so you know, out there in Twitch land. Oh God, spam yeah. ready Tettles. Yeah. Please spam. Ooh, I, you know, 
Oh, I was yeah, talking like, to Tuttles. Yes, yes it's back. <laughs> <laughs> Best transition. You know, I was talking to Tuttles about these rules before the day began, and he says he's been practicing a lot of brewmasters, so he's ready to jump in whenever they need him. Um, he's really up on the meta, you know, obviously by saying brewmaster is the tank to play. He can't think of anything else uh, that would fit best in an MDI, and that's what we can expect, I think. Isn't that right? No Guardian Tettles? He's tuned over a newbie. <laughs> He doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to talk about it. Talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he wants I, to keep it a secret because otherwise the enemy team would know. I, I can't leak that's true. Right. It's an advantage. I can't, can't leak, leak that I've been in the lab crafting up a great prop paladin. Dratnus and I have been on the he's case. Been cooking. He's cooking. He's been teaching me the routes <laughs> that we need. I heard um, that one before. <laughs> my question is, whatever team you end up on, would they be the new dark horse? No, they would be actually the tournament winner. Thank you, though. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Respect on my name. <laughs> I appreciate the confidence. I appreciate the confidence. It's Let's check confidence. out our, our dungeon. Accurate. Oh wow, supreme confidence. Interesting. Well, now I hope it happens. I hope we get to implement these rules. We got to do it now. Admins, you listening? Here's our dungeons <laughs> Wait, for today this? in our matches. Oh, uh, yep. Of course. Oh my god! This I is, would uh, love dark card tickets. That would be, Let's it's been it. a while since I've seen that one. What is Mel How's Melfurion yes. doing these days? I can't what remember. Never ending <laughs> eternal. Cathedral <laughs> Cath Cath over over of the never again. ending eternal. Night. Wailing Caverns <laughs> plus 24. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> oh, Lord. I mean, I hope the All teams right. are ready, right? I think so. I mean, this 22 Dark Heart Thicket, though. What do you, what do you think about that? Starting things, uh, starting things off for uh, our match number five here. That's going to be, so, of course, Echo versus Cheese. Sub Subrogue is actually very powerful in Dark Heart Thicket. Um, they allow you a lot of uh, potential funnel opportunities, <laughs> and this? the priority damage that's brought up by the the Subrogue <laughs> in that in that matchup was always Production very is popular. like no tettles. <laughs> uh -huh. Turns out we're going to Temple the Jade Serpent instead. Although uh, some of those dungeons on there, I kind of wouldn't. I I want to see like you know Blizzard's starting to kind of bring back some older dungeons and all that, make men plus Wailing Caverns. Maybe there's a way. Maybe we can save it. They it's did. So, they did dead mines, right? So they can yeah. bring back WC too, can't they? I, no, I don't think they can. See, the thing with so, Wailing Caverns yeah. is, is imagine all the different ways teams could approach it because you can basically go any direction in that dungeon. I'm losing it. Chat. It's not strategy. Be it. So, Caverns, so many so. strategic options. Yes, it's true. Why don't you bring back Stone Core? Nagura got Noah. so excited oh, about no, the perspectives of Dark Heart Thicket, so she just, you know, turned her computer <laughs> off and she's logging in to compete. <laughs> it's have you seen the movie Smile? <laughs> I don't I don't want to make any comparisons, but, but Nagura, like it's ch change match. your expression. Just staying on that one expression for a long time is kinda of off putting, isn't it? Nagura, blink once if you're excited for Temple of the Jade Serpent. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh no, she's so <laughs> she can't blink. She's not excited for Temple, bro. Uh oh, all right. Well, That's we'll try right. to get. To... Right. She's oh no, she's not. Oh, thank she's goodness here. she's moving. She's okay. All right, she's oh, she was moving. She was moving. Everyone, she's fine. Yep. <laughs> oh lord. This is good. We're off to a great start. It's a global finals, everybody. I, what I is swear the we're background here. here, anyways? Oh, the I bands. don't even know anymore. There we go. All right. Well, so here are our, our bands, Valor halls band of Valor. From cheese? Exactly. Wait, okay. court is open? We got court through. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, what? that's kind of shocking. This is the first time that we've seen court really let through in any major series in a while. I think that there were only there have only been a couple of teams that have been really willing to run the Court of Stars. Now, it was one of the last stand time trials maps. Is hmm. Like, how good is this for cheese? Is this, like, really good for them because they've practiced it a lot recently, at least for uh, last stand time trials? Could be, but I mean, everybody's um, kind of played that dungeon a ton, right? So I mean, just over the years. My my information was that Echo is trying to avoid court, but with them actively banning Ruby Life pools instead of that court that they could have taken out, that is going to be the second map for sure, and I'm really excited to see it because it is one of my favorites in the MDI. But before we get there, we have to look at that Temple of the Jade Serpent, which was also a last stunt dungeon, which Cheese, after a little bit of, 
of start difficulties looked really good in as well. So, do yeah. you think we're gonna we're gonna see the the prot paladin or the prot warrior here, Tettles? Ooh, I think that I mean I think that prot war. Okay, I think that you realistically could play either one, but I think that the prot warrior is more likely going to be the selection here. I, I think that things such as like interrupting shout. Um, that's that's obviously very strong in Temple of the Jade Serpent, and, and with like the sheer size of the pulls that they are doing in here, um, it's going to be. I, th I think the Prop Warrior is going to be slightly edging out the Prop Paladin. Now, obviously, these are two choices that you're never upset to see. And with the dungeon being actually a 21 tyrannical, I have a suspicion that it's going to be a lot less volatile than what we saw in Last Stand a few weekends back. <laughs> because yeah. that was like a, was like a 22 sure. fortified Sanguine, and so like that was like really difficult. And so 21 Tyran. It's going to be something yeah. similar to what we saw during like cup weekends where teams were able to consistently get those big bulls dealt with. Well, you know, we got some comments from Cheese before the weekend began too. And, and uh, they were saying that one of the things they were not super thrilled about is the patch change coming in, which of course makes you rethink your tank strategy. It's not just all about the production warrior. But I believe, if I recall correctly, we saw them still lean towards the production warrior yesterday. So it seems like they're not ready to jump on the Prot Paladin bandwagon quite yet. Yeah, they ran Warrior all three dungeons yesterday. So, yeah, so I, I think you're probably pretty safe to say we're going to see the Warrior. I, I mean, I think I think it's like a, a dungeon-specific thing more often than not. But, like, both yeah, of those tanks are just so, so incredibly strong. The Prop Paladin got uh, some changes in 10.0.7, which ended up equating to, a, like, effectively a buff. But, mm -hmm. hey, I mean, it, well, both of those tanks now, it, it's interesting to see a multi-tank meta for the, the Global Finals. That's always cool. Very very infrequently do we see multiple tanks that are really in the meta for Global Finals. Yeah, and uh, we're going to see what the choice is going to be on the tank side for each of these teams in just a moment here. As the players are loading in, and we see game one of Echo versus Cheese. Obviously, Echo, you know, far and away the favorite to win this one, but maybe not okay. as far and away as uh, usual with this. Uh, yesterday we did see them drop a map to Thundered. You know, that does happen sometimes. Um, it's not, uh, I, I think if you picked Echo on your pickums or whatever to go the distance, that's still a pretty likely thing. But gods can bleed, we found out. So I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen today with them. This is a map that yeah. I think caused a lot of potential upsets. What, what do you think, Mix? Like, this is, this is so volatile. Exactly. There is, uh, basically this map consists out of three massive poles i want to say and then some more big mm. poles in between and each mm. of them is very very volatile like you said there's a lot of interrupts that need to be right there's a lot of dodging that needs to be done we talked about why is mari as a boss again and again and leo flameheart is also not without any oh, trouble God. but without Here further we ado we're going in and i'm seeing something that my little demonic heart wow. is extremely happy about Fragrance is back on that Havoc Demon Hunter tells. Yeah, I mean, the, the comps are just so different from both sides. So we already see both of the tanks that we were talking about. We see one Protection Paladin, one Protection Warrior. And then the DPS composition for Cheese, they're running a Destruction Warlock, which is one of the most safe picks in this dungeon. We talk about it a couple of times, and it's just due to, like, uh, free AoE stuns. They, uh, Havoc Demon Hunter bringing Chaos Brand and really, really good AoE damage, honestly. That's one of their strengths is... A strong AOE damage, and then that Shadow Priest to help buff up and and buff the party for the side of Cheese. This composition is actually very unique, and it's not something that we commonly see in this in a lot of dungeons. But this is like the Cheese special. If they had the opportunity to play a comp that they yeah. think that they're the most comfortable on, I think it's this. Yeah, I think it's very Gouda, you know. Um, very happy <laughs> to see them back here with that Havoc Demon Hunter. I honestly, it makes me so excited. And the last time we've seen the Havoc Demon Hunter from Fragments, from Cheese, was in that Algathar Academy, where they actually mm -hmm. had a lot of really cool tech with it. Like, they even snapped mobs by using it. So I wonder if they figured out some new tech for this dungeon on the Demon Hunter as well. But looking at what we have so far, a little bit more trash count on the side of Echo, a, a couple 0. Point percent, and then both of the teams are neck and neck when it comes to Wise Mari. Now it is 21 tyrannical, so this boss shouldn't take too long. However, there's still substantial amount of difficulty here with running, with dodging, with thundering in this key, and uh, we have seen players die to it before. So I don't want to, don't want to jinx anything here. We're going to wait and see how this one plays out. 
How, how are you feeling about how the compositions are going to stack up on like the uh, the courtyard pull, for example? That, fir that first pull of the dungeon is one that uh, teams are normally pretty consistent on, especially at like, this dungeon level, even on Tyram. That courtyard pull is the one that's going to be a, a, probably a little bit more challenging for Echo to be able to deal with, and, and it kind of op opens them up for if they make any mistakes, uh, there, there's room for potentially a wipe, yeah? I mean, there's room for potentially wipes, I think, nearly at every corner in the MDI. But mm -hmm. the big thing that I'm a little bit worried about is that they're basically missing the massive AoE that Feral and Unholy DK bring. Obviously, okay, the Warlock has, yeah, the Warlock has similar amounts of AoE. And I think I know someone that can tell us a little bit more about that because Nagura doesn't only play Moonkin, she also plays a, a warlock named Nago Nagony. So, uh, Kara, why don't you tell us more about how that's <laughs> going to play out? N Nagony is ready for this match. Seeing Draneko play warlock here is amazing. Nagony also, of course, plays destruction. So, I mean, I know everything about this class. <laughs> but yeah, it's really cool to see, especially on this boss that we're going to be seeing in just a second. Of course, having Havok for the two bosses that are going to be coming up is going to be insane and for this big pull as well but look at now doing so much damage for echo here on this initial pull absolutely crazy damage coming out of both of the tanks not just now but also femme on the prod warrior but now the damage dealers are ramping up the damage hey. and they're using all of their defensives to make sure that they survive those shy explosions but it looks like salia is just finishing off that book completely yeah. alone on the rest of shaman really cool we actually saw Zatsy doing something similar on the right-hand side of your screen as well. Um, so basically, they end up wearing a Desperate Invokers Codex. This is actually pretty common in a decent amount of MDI maps, but it's actually super popular in Temple of the Jade Serpent because like one Stormkeeper from the Resto Shaman plus what the Desperate Invokers Codex with a couple of stacks, and you're able to just solo that thing and start this RP for Strife and Peril almost immediately as, hey, she's able oh. to pull the boss before Echo somewhere in the order of like three to four seconds, Nagura. It okay. looked like sim It looked like they pulled it at the exact same time, but she's finished off the first boss two seconds later. So she's definitely okay. made up some time here. Um, but yeah, they're really close together. This is so close between those two teams. They have to be careful, of course, with the spiteful shades that are going to be spawning in just a second. As soon as this, these two trash mobs go down for both the teams, but they have a little bit of extra funnel going on here, uh, even though it is maybe not too useful for the comp that they're running. Um, because they already have the this, two bosses, of course, that is in a funnel for some of those classes. Okay, so interestingly enough, uh, Jinji was holding that that damage buff on the side of Echo for a little bit until he had the opportunity to be able to get off the boss and he passed it to Clicks. Whereas for the side of Cheese, Dranako had that uh, buff spawn on him very early on and he passed it to Ricky almost immediately, allowing Ricky to have a few more stacks for this boss. But Echo... Hey, they're, they're getting a little bit better at this exchange. It looks like Strife and Peril wow. is dying significantly faster for them. Yeah, I, I think it might be the difference here between the cheese come maybe being a bit more reliant on their offensive cooldowns, Infernal being a pretty long cooldown, and Drenoko okay. using the Infernal on the pool before this boss, while Echo maybe not too reliant on them, actually finishing off this boss quicker, and cheese being a little bit behind here, because as I said, they pulled the bosses pretty equally, and now Echo already done quite a lot quicker. We will see the boss split in just a second. But yeah, Echo making up a lot of time here, and now we see them skip this Infester. Maybe a little bit of an awkward timing for Cheese, but um, Ooh, they the do gate. have the gateway. Yeah, nice. Somebody jump. All right, perfect. Bang. Okay, so we saved, we saved some time. They, they actually pulled Fragments. Okay, there we go. We see the we Shadow Melt coming out from Fragments. <laughs> Let's hope it resets and it looks good. Yeah, I think it did reset. That would have been really awkward. This cost them a lot of time because I'm not sure if they even wanted to pull those two mobs, the patrolling mobs, because um, Echo already gathered up all of this pull and this is another really dangerous moment, right? There's yeah. so many shafts exploding simultaneously, but it is only a 21 Tyrannical and it looks like all of them are fine. They used all of their defensives. You can see Drenico, both Dark Pact and Unending Resolve popped and all of the other defensives as well, Darkness, just everything coming out of these teams and it looks easy when you execute it well but this is very difficult there's just so much burst ue damage going out in the greer hey and right as now's uh defensive cooldowns expire is right as these spiteful shades come out so he 
he rotated his defenses really, really well, um, just being able to get this pull dealt with. And Liu Flameheart has already been engaged on the side of Echo. And on the right side of your screen, Nagura, I think you were right whenever you were talking about that Infernal. Just every single time that, that Infernal is up for Dranaco, Cheese is able to do just an insane amount of damage. And Liu Flameheart is pulled at like virtually the same point for both of these two teams. Yeah, and now we see Setsi for Cheese uh, picking up those two extra mobs for the trash content they still need. Uh, when it comes to curse dispels, Cheese, I mean, technically they do have Jinji and Echo Set that can dispel curse as well. Well, for Cheese, mm -hmm. they only do have the Shaman, the healer. But then on top of that, you also have a magic debuff that has to be dispelled on the tank. So what they might want to do is they either have Jenako with an Imp or Ricky with Mass Spell dispelling Femme. And Satsi dispelling that curse dispel, while Echo, of course, has multiple dispels, so not too big of a problem for Echo. But looking at boss's HP, Echo again, even though they pulled the boss pretty simultaneously again, because she's dealt with the trash quicker, um, they are now ahead on Echo's side again, because probably cooldown differences here. Dranako not having the Infernal for the boss, using it on the trash pull instead. Do you think it's possible that either of these teams take all the trash from the boss for the last pull? I think Zatsy they have going to. Down? Satsi actually going... Yeah, we see the instant Ankh coming out of Satsi here. <laughs> but that's five seconds on the board. And honestly, they are so close that these five seconds might actually make the difference if both of the teams do the pull that you're referring to. I, it's, it's something that we've seen... I don't think we've seen a team successfully be able to pull all of the trash into the final boss here, have we? We've seen some teams try it. I don't think it. so. I think they've always wiped. Yeah. I think we've seen some teams try it when they knew that they're... But Femme goes down, actually, oh for Cheese to do immediately battle as Femme. But Dranico now also dropping really low. I think they might have recovered, but that was very scary for Cheese. Really good on them that they managed to somehow survive a tank death on this boss. <laughs> But yeah, I think we've seen teams try that to trash pull into boss only when they knew they were really far behind. I don't think yeah. any team ever did it uh, when they knew they were ahead. So we'll see if either of those teams attempt it because it's just incredibly difficult. There's just so much stuff going on with that last trash room and the boss as well. So, so a pretty common strategy is just doing all of the trash in one singular pull. Um, like that, that, mm -hmm. that's pretty popular where we're going to see all of this trash grab together. Now, there's a question as to whether or not it's also going to be going into the Shaw of Doubt. This pull also has caused a lot of issues for a decent amount of teams, and you saw Zelia hexed a mob. Off to the side. I think it was one of those mist weavers, uh, just in that front right pack to make sure that they weren't going to be getting too many of those curses out for, for those dispels. And it looks oh. like Echo is pulling the Shaw of Doubt with all of this trash, Nagura. Uh, and this is going to be incredibly dangerous. Yet. Yeah, they still have 20 seconds of Bloodlust. They're pulling this without oh Lust. This is absolutely crazy. And look at those curses coming out one on Salia, one on Clicks. They did dwarf one of them on the healer and one dispelled on clicks and now they're just dropping so low they have the cheese. master spell of course but she's doing the same thing on their side too this is absolute insanity for both of those teams ricky going down with two curse debuffs on ricky no dwarf racial available does go down they do have a battle rest and they get him up really quickly but he drops low again with all of those shots fixating ricky and just look how much chaos it is for both of those teams as they enter the demission phase you see all of these uh fragments of down fixating the players and they're so spread out with all of those spiteful shades up as well so i wonder if they can even they finish them off this? in time on she's aside yeah okay look at the bounce reality cast i think that they they only have two more Oof. of these these images to kill off okay the boss didn't heal everything's fine we, we were able to get out of the bounds of reality phase on the right side for cheese but echo Oof. i dude i think that hex is super important that we saw from zelia it allowed that mistweaver yeah. that like that extra mistweaver was what ended up killing ricky and so, uh, just being able to have the foresight to hex that on the side of Echo, make the pull a little bit safer that you're taking it into the boss anyways, that's so cool. I like that a lot. You can also use Control Mind from Shadow Priest to actually mind control one of those Mistweavers and then just uh, release them later. But I'm not sure if Cheese did that or if they just decided they don't need it and then it just went sideways for them with two of those curses going on Ricky simultaneously not having a dispel or it just overlapping with the the Sha explosions just being too much to handle all of a sudden. But yeah, I mean both of the teams managed to finish off all the trash and somehow ended up not wiping, but because mm -hmm. Echo had less issues on their side, they are quite a bit ahead on the boss and 
even though she did a really good run as well i mean echo just did the same thing and a little bit cleaner not having any deaths on their side and this is just a record timer for echo they might not even get another uh, intermission phase here oh my gosh if they beat this bounds of reality with lust this would be crazy. Oh my god. If, if you look on the right side of your screen, Cheese is not close to beating that. And Ooh. Echo able to kill it before that Bounds of Reality cast. A zero death run in Temple of the Jade Serpent. Holy moly. Wow. Echo has, uh, I know it sounds cliche, but Echo has come to play today, putting together a perfect run in Temple for their first time out of the gates in day two of the MDI Global Finals. And uh, yeah, that's just Echo. That's, that's what you have to beat. Can anyone do that? I don't know. Makes? We're, we're going to find out for sure, but this match in particular has a little bit of extra spice, right? Because Fragments used to play with Echo, now he's facing yeah, off against them true. after years and years of competition and, and playing in that same team. And it's cool to see that she's just trying to innovate in terms of classes, and we are going to talk a little bit about that Demon Hunter build, because I've been wanting to do that for a while now. But before we do that, we're going to go into this key. Of course, it's casting at the beginning, but just to show you a little bit of that Warlock utility, we've seen this skip with other classes too, but the Warlock makes this and the skip in the previous room just so much nicer with that extra Warlock portal. You can just get down there and have everything summed up pretty nicely and then from here on is where the bigger differences occurred because for cheese stuff went a little bit wrong in this big mm -hmm. pull here they had a tank death during the boss they had uh, a healer death that anked and it just was a little bit of extra seconds lost that obviously then also cost them to lose damage because they're busy trying to get people back up and back to life now this pull is what i was really excited for because in the last stand, we didn't really see it, or when we saw it, it went awful. But now that the key is a little bit lower and it's on Tyrannical, we really get into these giant pulls. And it cannot be overstated how difficult this one is. There is so much going on. You want to interrupt the casters. The water speakers are a threat. There's mist weavers that you need to get under control. You need to get out of those frontals. And with a feral and an unholy DK, you have a lot going on in melee already. You kind of want to stay there as well. And the title bursts are giving you some problems, pulling all of that on top of the boss without even having bloodlust available is mind-boggling to me and i'm so so impressed of how they managed to do just that on the other side cheese had a little bit of problems here but still very cool that both teams attempted that and i do think that cheese is throwing up a fist and saying we can compete with this even though echo took that first map I don't think the case in this series is super clear cut just yet, and I'm curious for how that Court of Stars is going to go. The fact that tanks, yeah, I mean, uh, Echo certainly needs that. to. Oh, go ahead. As I say, the fact that tanks in my weekly keys can't even tank one of those packs by themselves, and Echo <laughs> and Cheese are doing all of the trash into the boss. Oh, good, good lord, that pull, and man. <laughs> look at the Proud Paladin damage: 101k overall DPS. And that's pretty yeah, crazy. Then, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of damage, but also the Demon Hunter. So maybe we can go back to that Demon Hunter DPS and talk a little bit about it. Because previously, when we looked, for example, at Cement Gaming, a lot of it was talking about how they pulled specifically to kind of deal with how Havoc Demon Hunter has more of a five target cap, even though I-Beam is a little bit more uncapped, it still falls off on more targets. Now, how Fragnance is dealing with that is he actually skills out of Fodder to the Flame and out of Illusion Decree does not go for them and instead picks up Inner Demon, which is uncapped. So a lot of the damage that he's doing is over that I-Beam and the Inner Demon, which allows him to do the MDI style pulls with a Havoc Demon Hunter. Now, do not make any mistake, this is not your average puck skilling. If you whip this out in a puck, you probably do less damage because puckies don't usually pull 30 targets at once. But here in the MDI, it's a very cool decision that I did want to highlight. What did you think of uh, Fragments not running that, that Onyx Annulet? Because we know that like Havoc Demon Hunters on live tend to end up playing that Onyx Annulet. It ends up being like a, actually a pretty significant gain for them. I'm not sure, honestly, with this build in particular. Maybe for him it falls off when he goes into okay. that inner demon. I haven't really looked too much into that specific build and how the amulet plays in there. But I would assume that uh, he knows best and kind of 
figured out what worked best for that specific build. I think um, yeah. the annulet is also mainly played by like for single target damage in DMDI so far, what we have seen. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess there isn't that much single target damage going on, right? Like in Temple, we just saw huge pull into boss, huge pull into boss, right? So maybe they just really want to have those extra stats to buff their own uncapped AOE abilities uh, like Demon Hunter has compared to just, you know, getting kept annulet procs or single target focus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, makes sense That's for really a <laughs> <laughs> that graph is yep. so close. Look at that. That's crazy. Very close. Yeah. I mean, it just shows it you how close. It shows you she's what? Where they fell off too, right? If you're looking at that yeah. six minute mark before, she's and Echo were super close, and then that's that courtyard pull where just a little bit of trouble occurred for Cheese, unfortunately, but still very, very close. And going eye to eye, face to face with Echo, is something that has to be commanded. But we're heading into that Court of Stars next, and uh, my cat is heading up onto the desk next. And uh, <laughs> I've heard some whispers, Word. you know, through the grapevine from several people that some of the teams might actually not bring a healer into this key. Wow, no so really? excited All right. to see Court of I mean, Stars. We see it on live enough, but yeah, do you think, Nagura, that we're going to actually see uh, a healerless Court of Stars? Um. I mean, it is 23 turret. Uh, I don't know. I, it's possible. But the problem with not running a healer is that it's like a prod paladin has to use a lot of holy power to use on healing rather than, you know, mm -hmm. damage. So I'm not sure if it's worth it considering the pulls that they're doing. But right. I wouldn't say it's impossible. I know... Uh... I know some teams during last stand time trials were doing interesting stuff on the second boss with kiting mini bosses around the room. I wonder if we're going to see that as well. Like, I, I, w I wonder if Talix say on a twenty three tyrannical is like if it is possible to do that with either without a healer, with your healer kiting mini bosses around the room. Like, what does that really look like for these teams? Is that going to be something that teams are going to be looking to do? Um, and it's, I mean, this dungeon is one that we haven't seen across a lot of the cup weekends. So I think a decent amount of the strats just haven't been explored that often for what can be done in here. Well, it yeah, can I be a very unforgiving dungeon too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Especially at plus 23. There's... Exactly. There's it's also tyrannical the question of... The question of Go what ahead. do you bring in if you drop a healer, right? Like which class is going to be your fifth DP or fourth right. DPS class, your fifth class overall? If you're not playing a rest of shaman, a Prevoker, I would assume it's a bloodlust class, right? So maybe we're going to see some some enhancement shaman action, possibly. Why not? Cool. They're good. They're really good right now. They're good with the prot warriors. I think good with a lot I of. I think shaman. Things. If they're going to play it anywhere, it's probably going to be court because shaman has really great funnel. But the problem mm -hmm. with shaman is that they're target capped, right? So. For right. usual MDI dungeons, it's not that great. But for court, you have to do a lot of single target focus. And there's not too many like super big pulls you can do. So maybe. And they have great off Well, let's find out. Well, no Ooh, enhancement challenge this is. time. But we got that uh, demon again. Oh, no, is that, doing it. Is that what? That's teams. Dev Evoker? That's Dev Evoker. What? It is. <laughs> oh, it is. All right. Oh well, God. enjoy. I love we'll see it. see if she's can tie it up. So okay, no exactly. healers for either of the teams. Echo is playing Clicks, which presumably is going to be on that Enhancement Shaman, mm -hmm. not an Elemental, right? Yeah, so we have the Enhancement Shaman on Echo's side. Salia playing Shadow Priest, while Satsi is playing Destruction Evoker, and both of the teams are pulling everything into that first boss. Echo already engaged Captain Gerdo, while Cheese is still gathering up a little bit of the trash here before they engage the boss. Yo, Nagur, what do you think about the differences in tanks for, for like no healer compositions? Whenever we see no healer comps, more often than not, it's ran with like a prot paladin. But cheese, them's on a prot warrior. That is very interesting because usually the prot paladin enables these no healer comps because prot paladin had so much off healing with Road of Glory. So the fact that cheese is not playing that prot paladin, they don't have that much ability to actually off heal because they have an unholy DK. Yeah. It cannot off heal. They have a Havoc Demon Hunter that cannot off heal. And pre 
the, the, I mean, Devastation Evoker also doesn't really have that much. It's only very Janako that has Nature's Vigil and a little bit of, like, maybe heals you can throw out, and that's it, right? So they're really basically playing without <laughs> any healing at all. <laughs> I mean, Ben's got Leech. And, yeah. And, and, yeah, that's about, <laughs> that's about it, actually. <laughs> it stops there. Oh my god, this is amazing, I... but looking at the affixes as well, I mean, they don't really have many affixes that would need a healer, right? There's no Grievous, there's no Bursting. Yeah. Raging, of course, can be an issue, but if you just kite the mobs, or if the tank is fine, it's and you interrupt all of the spells, it's okay. We got Dev Evoker. Press Oppressing Roar. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think that I like the... Just just at an initial glance, I think the Echo Composition is something that was more standard for what... When, whenever somebody mentions, oh yeah, no healer composition, this is what I kind of expected whenever I'm looking at Echo side. For Cheese, the fact that they're running a no healer composition with this, I I'm really interested in seeing like what the difference is between the two teams. Like, what is that going to mean? Look at the right side of your screen. Cheese is just continuously pulling more and more trash into this boss. They pulled that uh, Arcanist guard patrol, and now you see uh, Zatsu running up the stairs, grabbing more of these mana worms with another guard that's at the top. They're going to have so much count coming off this boss. Yeah, Echo did as well. Echo pulled some trash on top, and now they are done with the boss. We see Clix is actually the chosen player to do the skip. So he does um, get in combat with this um, construct. He's going to go to the other side, but Sally went down for some reason. Not sure what happened to Sally there, but that's one death on the board for Echo as Cheese is still fighting Gerda. So even though they do get all of this extra trash, as you mentioned, they're now up to 50%. They're still losing quite a lot of time because they're pulling all of this extra stuff onto the boss. Echo is now dealing with the harbor pool while Clix is doing that skip. And mm -hmm. yeah, that harbor pool shouldn't be an issue for them even without a healer. Ooh, look at this. Clix is grabbing some of these buffs. He's grabbing the food buff. He's going to be dying to these imps in just a second. So, so typically you want to either grab like a... You, you want to be grabbing some like the damage orbs and stuff like that that are off to the side whenever you make your way through. Clicks grabbing that food, allowing the rest of his party to have that 10% bonus HP buff as they make their way into the courtyard here. And I think that this is where the two the two different teams are going to diverge the most. Looking at Cheese, it, there's a 4% count differential, but you only need 178 count in this instance. Oh, look at this. Is that going to be able to get that killed? Oh, nice. <laughs> So it looks like Echo did already summon one of the mini bosses here, and they're pulling it on top of um, an Inquisitor pack and an Imp pack as mm -hmm. well. So um, they have to finish off this mini boss though before they pull another one, because otherwise they're going to be buffing each other. It does look like they're just carrying it along though. They're also gathering up this uh, two mop pack on the left side where the orb is, and the bridge pack too with an Inquisitor and a construct. So lots of interrupts that have to be done here. And you can see the group actually is taking a decent amount of damage on Echo's side. But they can do these pulls because they have the prop paladin. For G, they so have to be a little bit more conservative with these pulls, right? I'm so confused as to how Zatsy... Where did we get these mana worms from for cheese? They just like appeared when Zatsy died. Like Zatsy died, released land slid, and these worms were just there still? I thought they... Huh. I don't know where she's got that those mobs from. Look at this. Dude. They probably like, were just cheese? the initial ones at the start when you release. There's this mana worm pack. Yeah. The, with the two mana worms was it that one? Yeah, yeah, but they they stay, I guess. Yeah, they they, they don't instantly uh, get removed. So I guess he just released okay. and instantly aggroed them. Okay. Cool. It looks like neither of the teams are doing any of this mini boss kiting strategy that we've talked about. At least. Not with all Yet. mini bosses, right? Because both of them did deal with Amakatia, which is the first mini boss. And their Echo is dealing with an enforcer now. So that means that they are gonna deal with a second mini boss too. They might be able to cut the third mini boss if they wanted to, but at that point I wonder if it's even worth it. We'll see what they do. I think that there's a chance that Cheese kites two of them here. I think they're done with count once they kill this construct. Yeah, so how much percentage is the last boss? Because I know how much count it is. It's 12 count question. that it gives, 12 right? 12 count, I'm not, is... not sure what the percentage is, admittedly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. As uh, Echo is now dealing with the second mini boss, right? So. What is she going to do here? Still a chance they're kiting the last one, but uh, not likely. She 
Jesus um, kiting Mike Wazowski and LeBron. Look at this. There look it this, is. They are kiting. Oh my gosh. Okay, I so like this a lot. What, you, what, what Zatsy is doing is he's keeping threat on those two mini bosses and he's going to be guiding them around this area. And, and so like these, these mini bosses are not going to despawn. They don't despawn the boss if you take them out of bounds. Um, so Zatsy is just going to be kiting them basically around the world. And if we cut back to the other group where we see like Femme and Dranaco in them, they're going to be just battling the boss. This is actually very dangerous on a 23 Tyrannical. Uh, like the amount of healing that they have on this group, like Nagura was talking about earlier, is really low compared to some of the other, the other like non-healer style compositions that we're going to be seeing um, like sometimes. And look on the side of Echo here. They also have somebody who's kiting that mini boss off to the side. You can see him uh, leaping away. And, and Echo instead are only kiting one where Cheese are able to kite two. And if this is able to be pulled off by Cheese, I think they're able to take this map. Yes, I mean, it. I think so as well. I mean, she's cutting a two mini boss is actually saving them quite a lot of time here. You can see Satsu, of course, struggling though, because if. Here's the thing, the reason why the mini boss has to be kited is because they buff the boss and they buff each other with a huge yes. damage buff, right? So these two mini bosses that Satsu is kiting, they're buffing each other. So if the second mini boss, which is the one that actually casts, gets any cast off on Satsu, then Satsu will die. This. One mini boss that is jumping around and doing the shockwave, that one isn't actually too dangerous because it only melee attacks and it does a shockwave, a frontal. So it's actually not that dangerous. The much more dangerous mini boss is the second mini boss that I'm not sure what happened with Cheese aside, but I didn't see it there at the very end. Not sure where uh, what happened with it. But yeah, Cheese is looking really good right now as they're finishing off Talixa. And yet, the fact that they can stay alive on this boss on a 23 Tyrannical is actually incredibly impressive without a prop paladin. And Dude. Satsi going down there at the very end, <laughs> this is really great by Cheese. Well, it's fine because now, now the mini bosses are just gone, right? Zatsi, yeah. Zatsi can just likely release. What is Fem doing? Oh. What is, what is going on? Something's happening, but I can't tell what. I can't tell what the what the issue is. Obviously, they're talking about something. I, I think that Zatsy dying there maybe wasn't intended. Maybe not. It doesn't matter. Either both of the teams are doing the game now. Now they both have a class that can deal with the spy game, right? We do have uh, oh, Fragments that has um, found it. Spectral side, so they have to c talk to all of the spies though for Spectral side to work. Well, now on the Prat Paladin does have the Transmog, the Legion uh, artifact weapon that or shield that you can see where the spy is in in which group. So you don't actually need all of the clues to see where the spy is. So Echo um, is behind still. You can see she's now already engaging that mini boss. So she's definitely ahead. And if you look at the death penalties, both of them have two deaths. So it's completely equal when it comes to the timer too. So it's looking incredibly good for cheese here. It's all gonna come down to single target damage because it's a mini boss and it's the last boss. So full single target damage coming into the last couple of minutes of this dungeon. Who do you think has the edge when it comes to single target damage? He's actually lasting the very end of this mini boss. Ooh, interesting. They were less thing, but now it's a cool man. Wait, hold on. Now it says it's down. It hold on for 25 seconds. It, maybe it was a visual bug. I'm not actually 100% sure. It probably my, was a visual bug, yeah. Uh, oh, it apparently has something to do with the Evoker force set. Okay. Um, so my initial impression is I think that... I think that Echo has slightly more single target damage with the Enhancement Shaman and the Spreest. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as compared to Cheese's, like... Devastation Evoker and Havoc Demon Hunter, but I actually think it's, I think it's close enough to where you're not, like, I, I don't think that Echo is going to be able to catch up here just purely on boss damage alone. I think this is a situation where Cheese is going to get this pulled 25 seconds, 20 seconds in advance, and I think that that by itself is going to be enough for them to be able to uh, win here. Lust is coming up for both of these teams, as you do see it happening in, in just a couple of seconds. It Looks like it's been popped now. I'm not 100% not sure. It could be the Evoker Force set again. But hey, I think this is looking really good for the side of cheese, Nagura. I think so as well. And I mean, Devastation Evoker has so much burst with Bloodlust and everything here at the start of uh, Melandris. You can see just how much damage Satsi is doing here at the start. Absolutely insane damage. Echo now also in Melandris. It's going to be a pure single target fight between those two teams. The thing though is with Cheese's comp, they actually fall off quite a 
quite a lot whenever the boss gets lower, right? With a Devastation Evoker losing a lot of damage when the boss is lower because of the mastery, right? So Echo does have an opportunity to actually catch up. And so far, it chooses ahead, but I think Echo still has a chance to actually oh. make this. Yeah, I mean, in addition to that, I think that there's a difference between like a prop paladin and prop warrior in regards to the amount of single target damage that's going to be uh, provided by that prop paladin as compared to the prop warrior. On top of that, too, she's again, they don't, by not running that prop paladin, they don't have like a lot of off healing uh, opportunities for them. Now, now that that could be a situation where some of your players have to play a little bit safer on the side of cheese and that could cost them some damage but i mean the death differential is the same echo has popped their lust a little bit later uh, than cheese did but cheese is still just ramping here they're they're able to maintain a 10 percent hp lead on advisor melandris D the death timers are the exact same if cheese is able to kill off melandris in advance it was that double mini boss kite that was the biggest difference in the route between these two teams here and Hey, Nagura, I think that she's is going to be able to do it. I think that she's going to be able to take map two in this Court of Stars. Oh my goodness. It's looking so good for Cheese. Only 4% left. And oh my god, as you said, the double mini boss card was just so good. good. And look at good. that. <laughs> Cheese upsetting Echo. Wow. And actually winning that second game, tying it up in that second series today. Oh my god. That is what we came here to see today. This is it. Teams pushing Echo to the limit. And not just any teams, but teams like Cheese that came out of the last stand tournament to get here. That is impressive stuff. And cool, you know, unique comp from both sides. Cheese just that slight bit faster. But uh, makes, I, I think we were all like freaking out the entire time with this dungeon. Like this is, you don't see things like this in MDI very often. Yeah, you could say it was unbelievable as they went through this dungeon here. Oh. I'm really, really excited to once again see a team that is able to step up to Echo. Uh, let's get into this key, shall we? Because there was a lot that was going on. Of course, first off, a lot of class difference. Both teams opting to naturally play a class that brings you that bloodlust that they usually have uh, placed on the healer. Uh, so it had to be a class that brings that bloodlust naturally, one side opting for the Devoker, the other side opting for that Enhancement Shaman. I really like the difference between Prot Paladin and Prot Warrior. I think I prefer the Prot Paladin for that last event and also for the fact that you don't have a healer just to allow a little bit more off healing. But I'm very curious to see how it looks in the damage breakdown that we are going to go in in just a little bit. Now, when it comes to those skips, there was uh, a little bit of a different assignment in the teams because Cheese sent Satsi, who maybe is, I think, a little bit slower than a Druid, but obviously always does the skip for his team when he plays healer here. So it was cool to see him do that again, and he was able to release. I think you were wondering about that. Tells he he died. He released instantly. Got in fight with the mana worms, and then allowed Fem to pick him up later. And then here is where where the real fun begins, right? We have a graph of both teams that we hopefully can show you of the healing during this boss fight. But Zatsi just went on on a little uh, trip on an adventure, you could say, all the way around, and then Jinji on the other side went back here to the harbor with Jastra Rue, and I'm not sure if you noticed it, but he comes back to the boss, so he joins his team at 50%, wow. which is why I thought maybe they can hmm. catch up even though they only kite at one mini boss. And it wasn't enough, the two mini boss kite with one player away was still stronger than having him return here. You can see he's gonna come back to the team and be able to do full damage for half of that boss fight. But in the end, Cheese remaining here on the top is going to get that key and we are in a 1v1 between cheese and echo and there is going to be a third map once again which is extremely exciting so did that mini boss just not make it back to talixay in time did it end up just taking a while for it to patrol back because like we saw exactly. melt it off yeah interesting very interesting uh something Sorry, else that happened for echo we checked the log um, is that on the very first boss they didn't have an interrupt for one of the casts and 4.37 million healing went on to patrol Captain Gardo, which also threw them behind just a little bit. I don't think it was like everything in the end, but it definitely wasn't ideal. Definitely not planned for them either. Let's have a look. So this is uh, Talixay 
the healing for Echo that you can see. And you can just see how much now is is doing for his team here. That's 6.8 million healing. <laughs> and uh, obviously supported by, I would assume, Empiric Embrace by Nature's Vigil and so on. And then we're going to look at the healing on the side of Cheese, which uh, looks live. a little bit different. Dude, I just, I still don't fully understand how they were able to live this boss without a, without a healer with this composition. I guess Fragnus doesn't need healing. I agree. Like, <laughs> I, I guess, I guess Leech Apparently is enough. Not. I feel like, I'm, I feel like I would just be so scared if I was Drenaco. Like, the Feral Druid is the one that can actually die here. I mean, Feral Druid does have a lot of self-healing and has Nature's Vigil as well. So maybe yeah. they all can just uh, somehow keep themselves alive and that's good enough, right? So you don't need off healing if everyone can just keep themselves alive. <laughs> so I, I guess that's what they were counting on. I'm down. That's cool. It was I yeah, love 40 I love runs. I think I think that like hmm. I think that it was it was an opportunity that wasn't explored very often because we didn't see quarter stars um, more often than not in cup weekends, but I think I just think that 40 FPS compositions are super cool whenever you see them and especially whenever they're so specialized as Oh yeah, we're just busting this out in quarter stars. That's, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love. Ev I love everything about it. Well, I think Cheese loves it a little bit, a uh, little bit more right now as they were able to actually take that map. But that was close. That was one of the closest dungeons we've seen in MDI this season. I think just a matter of slightly less than ten percent of bots HP determining the victor, uh, and that does mean we're going to that Algathar Academy for our third and final map in the series, and. I think this one's up for grabs. I mean, Cheese has shown they have planned, they have been able to execute. Can they finally do it when it all comes down to it, this final map here? Or will Echo kind of reign supreme? It'd be wild to see Echo get knocked down to the lower bracket so early in the weekend, wouldn't it? I think this is going to really be interesting. Yeah, I, I wanted to Go say ahead. that it's this is going to be the most interesting map to see between those two teams because we have seen Cheese. I think it was the first team that played Affliction Warlock plus this Havoc Demon yeah. Hunter in Academy. And now we've seen Echo play Academy in the Global Finals yesterday, and they also played Affliction Warlock, but they played the Fire Mage and the Feral Druid. So we'll see if um, Cheese also adjusts their comp to play a Fire Mage in addition to um, the Affliction Warlock, or if they still stick to that Havoc Demon Hunter. But I think it, gonna be, it could really go either way, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, just looking at Echo's run yesterday in uh, the same dungeon, they ended up finishing at 1934 with uh, just three deaths. And like you said, that composition that you just mentioned as well. So that's kind of the benchmark. That's that's what they want to be. And you almost want to take some seconds off and assume Echo's just not going to die. What, what wow. do you got, Tettles? Do you think, Mix, do you think that Echo is just going to Echo diff everybody in AA here? Do you think that this is like their map? I mean, I have it Time to on find out. good authority that Echo does not do tech. They just do raw DPS and win by that. So we'll see how that uh -oh. goes. Word. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mix. Uh, okay. So we're starting off with the Algathar Academy. Both of the teams going to the left side here in this Veximus area. We're seeing a little bit of difference in composition, Nagura, between the two teams. Now, still sit sitting on that prop paladin, Fem, maintaining that prop warrior. But uh, there's also some other differences in regards to disc versus shadow priest and then preservation evoker um, on the side of cheese. How, how are you feeling about the two comps? Yeah, so I think the different, the main difference is the, the class that provides bloodlust. So Echo decides with fire mage. Is the class that is supposed to provide the bloodlust here. Well, Cheese mm -hmm. decides we don't want a D DPS with bloodlust, we want the Havoc Demon Hunter. So, therefore, they have to play Evoke, uh, Evoker to get the bloodlust uh, because they don't have a damage healer that provides it. Well, Echo can play the Disc Priest to get the PI on either the Affliction Warlock or the Fire Mage, while Cheese that does have to play the Shadow Priest in return to get that PI. And I think both comps can do really well. I don't think that either of the teams really has an edge here, personally. Uh, and if there's going to be an edge, it's a really small one. And uh, then, of course, Echo has the Mark of the Wild as well. They have the extra versatility. Well, Cheese yeah. does not have that available on their side as well. So I think it's going to be really close between those two teams. And you can already tell the first pull, both of them uh, finishing off pretty equally. But Echo dealt with 4% extra trash already, while Cheese still has to deal with that. These are the live affixes for this key as well with the uh, Sanguine Explosive. So you have to be really, really cautious about Sanguine Healing. I think that in the series that is so close, like we've been seeing between Echo and Cheese, any any mishaps with Sanguine, any things that would uh, 
be a mistake but not punish you in other series versus other teams this is one where if you make a small mistake with your sanguine healing you get like one or two ticks on either a boss or a large trash pack it, it can really come back to haunt you and so you have to be super cautious uh, just about getting all of that sanguine healing dealt with perfectly yeah 100 percent. and i think Echo might have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to Sanguine management because they have the Druid that does have Typhoon and they have the Disc Priest that has the Knock as well. Now, of course, she also does have the Evoker with the extra Knock, but I do think that Typhoon is just on a, on a lower cooldown uh, compared to the Evoker Knock. So technically speaking, the, uh, Echo might have a little bit more tools for Sanguine, but so far it doesn't look like either of the teams did get much Sanguine healing at all, so it doesn't really matter for Cheese that they have a, a, a less tools to deal with it, they're doing just fine so far. So, so interestingly enough, uh, Jinji is also running big Blast Wave, and so Blast Wave yeah. is like a small knock uh, that they use for like a dis disrupt sometimes, but the fact that he's able to play big Blast Wave, it turns it into it's like a thunderstorm-esque ability then um, that's like around around his character and that also allows for a little bit better sanguine management um assuming that it's yep. used in a timely manner yeah so they actually have a lot of knocks right they have the typhoon they have the blast wave and they have the the priest knock now geez though um did lose fragments just now they had to commit a battle rest to get fragments back up getting a combo of what it looked like it was a mana bomb and maybe some other extra damage that went off. So they have no more battle rest available for the next seven minutes, which can be a pretty big um, disadvantage for them if something happens later on. And Echo is also ahead in boss DPS too. Both of them are now at 24% trash. So both of them dealt with the exact same count, but Echo dealing with the boss a little bit quicker. So Cheese does have to make up some time here in the next couple of minutes or the rest of the dungeon, as Echo is now gonna do the bridge skip we can see Salia does have Bob. He's going to be fearing all of those ads, and he's going to be shadow melting off the aggro in just a second. So the rest of the team can walk ah. past this, which is a really cool skipping strategy by Echo. The classic priest shroud. If you say that on your pugs, the priest <laughs> yeah. in your group will certainly know what you mean. Or you say priest shroud. <laughs> and, and she's on the right hand side of your screen implementing the demon hunter shroud equally as popular. Okay, so neither of these teams are actually running rogue, so the ability to be able to snap packs is a lot more challenging in some of these areas. Uh, you have to come up with a lot of, you know, weird strats to be able to get the mobs uh, grouped up on top of some of these other platforms. But if you are so able to do it, and, and we saw it from Echo yesterday, the, the snapping of like lashers and stuff like that is so sick. Yeah, so in the past, uh, the way the, the, the wind bridge worked, was that if you are in mm -hmm. combat, you cannot actually use the wind bridge. So that's why you actually needed rogues, um, because then you can tricks of the trade the tank, you pull something, they will snap to the tank, and then the rogue could vanish off the combat and then use the bridge. But now they actually fix the bridge, or they, they hot fix the bridge, so you can still use it while you're in combat. I think they did it because of spitefuls. So now the snapping actually becomes a lot easier for these teams, and basically anyone can do it. There's still a big problem because whenever a mob is snapping to a different location, they will be evading for a little while. And as soon as they stop evading, they will just have aggro on whoever pulled them or anyone that is close. So it can be pretty dangerous for these kind of pulls, but it's definitely a lot easier because you do not need misdirect and you do not need uh, tricks from a rogue. So it's just um, Clicks that is doing it for Echo's side. Celia is actually joining Clicks as well. You can see they're just mm -hmm. now coming back, but Celia actually went down there. So it's possible mm -hmm. that they might reset some aggro because Clicks shadow melted. Oh, so if Celia so was the only one in combat, they might not be snapping the lashers now. Oh no, and this is a massive time loss for Echo Nagura, whereas on yeah. the side of Cheese, they're trying to play like a more consistent strategy, something that's a little bit easier, something that's a little bit more tried and true. We saw this from them in uh, the last stand and in their cup weekend, where they just used that like sigil of flame to snap this battle axe mana fiend pack into the Guardian Sentry. And while it is it's still a dangerous pull, it's not, it, Echo making a mistake there, Zalia has to make his way back to the group and he's still not even back. I mean, they have to pull the lashers somehow now, right? Because, like, what did they yes. do? Either they tried to pull the lashers and snap it. them. It looks like Sally did maybe snap them. Like, maybe Sally is in combat here with the lashers, and they're going to be 
coming over in just a second because if Sally did not pull the lashes here, they're going to lose a lot of time. But Satsi died as well for cheese and they have to mm -hmm. use an out of combat rest because they're out of battle rests. So we'll see for Echo in just a second because Sally is now back. If the lashes come with Sally, they are fine. But if the lashes are not here, that's going to mean it's a huge time loss Where's for Echo Frag? because they Ooh. will have to deal with the lashes later. What is Fragnance doing, Nagura? Look at this on the right Fragnance side of the screen. Fragnance is pulling the lashers to the eagles, for sure. Okay. For cheese. Is he going to be able to get all of them? Okay, so he caged the skitterflies. So skitterflies don't snap. This is an important variable. So skitterflies don't snap, so he's caging them off to the side because he doesn't want to deal with them. Now he's running through the middle. He doesn't have meta. We also does not have, have explosives meta. that are spawning. Fine? This is kind of dangerous. Yep. All right. We're going. Looking good. It's... It's looking good. Ranging explosives. All right. Yep. Six yeah, yards. Looking range. fine. I think he's good. All right. I and think I think this is looking Perfect. really good for Cheese because Cheese now does have the lashers that are going to be snapping in just a second. Echo will have to deal with the lash with the complete lasher pool when they get to Overgrown Ancient, <laughs> and they have to wait for the RP for the boss to spawn. Cheese is not going to have to do that as soon as they are done with Croft. Overgrown Ancient is already going to be spawned for them as they go back so, because they're now dealing with those lashers. So does Cheese take the lead here, Nagura? I think so, yes. That's crazy. I don't know. Dude, I still don't know how the lashers for Cheese snapped from the the Overgrown Ancient area to the Croft platform. Like, they didn't They didn't even hit the bridge, like, at all. They literally just snapped all the way across. Wonder, wonder how. It's just because so Fragnus cool. is incumbent with them, and uh, he he's just like really quick at going over, I guess. Yeah, this be. is it, a it, really cool pull by Cheese. Now going down for Echo as well. They have to... Actually, I think they... Yeah, okay, so it was at the end of the pull. But yeah, Echo having quite a few issues here. This big death on Sally, costing him so much time. Now having another death on now, right before Kroth spawns. Now we do know that Echo is playing the strategy where they try to do both of the goals simultaneously, but because okay. they had some issues, they might not be able to line it up with Thundering, and that might be a huge loss. Maybe they also are not going to be lining up with some of the offensive cooldowns. We're going to have to keep an eye on that. All right, so so looking at the right side of the screen, Cheese are, are going to be able to get this Alpha Eagle killed off here in just a moment, and once these two Alpha Eagles die, then Croth is going to be spawning in just a moment after a little bit of RP. I think Cheese are in the lead here, Nagura, um, just with the like with the knowledge that Echo has to go and do the Lasher pull Natty like you do on live, and uh, for the right side of your screen, we know that Cheese is going to be able to go straight into Overgrown Ancient. I think that they have a slight time advantage. Now, we're not going to know until we see uh, basically Overgrown Ancient pulled, like that's that's about the point where the teams will merge back up uh, timer wise, and we'll be able to really assess like where teams are. But if I, if I'm being honest, I would take all of that trash in the Overgrown Ancient area for 40% of Croth's HP any day of the week. I think that this is looking spectacular for Cheese. And on the left side of your screen, like you were talking about earlier, look at this triple goal for both sides on uh, for both of the goals for the side of Echo, and they're going to be dunking simultaneously here in just a couple of seconds. I agree. Even though Cheese does look like they're behind, because they dealt with the Lashers, I think they are technically ahead. But Echo yes. is lower on Croth, and you can see they're already on the fourth Screech debuff. So they're going to get a fifth Screech in just a second, which is going to do quite a lot of damage on a 23 Tyrannical. So they have to use all of their defensives to survive here. You see Jinji did reset the Screech debuff with, uh, with Ice Block before, so it didn't do too much damage to him. And everyone else used all of their defenses to survive this. And now it looks like they might be raiding for Thundering. If, if, there we go. Thundering is happening for Echo. They're going to put in all of the goals here, and they're going to. And Combustion is actually running for Jinji here as well. There's going to be so much damage coming out for Echo, and they're going to be blasting Croft in just a second. Now, another advantage for Echo is that they have the Fire Mage, right? Having Fire Mage for these single target bosses on a 23 Tyrannical is actually really important because Fire Mage does so much single target damage, it's absolutely crazy. So even though I think Echo might be a little bit behind, I think they can still catch up because they have this Fire Mage comp uh, being able to do just so much boss damage. Mm -hmm. So now there's there's a large pull that Echo has to deal with. They We knew that they would want to snap this into both the Croth platform and to that Guardian Ancient. 
uh, uh, Guardian Sentry, Guardian, Guardian Sentry. Now they have to be looking to do all this trash, and they might play some Skitterflies as well for bonus count. So they, they're doing effectively a live pull that is mandatory to be able to even spawn Overgrown Ancient. We're on the other side of the plot, on the on the other side of the screen. We have Cheese. Thirty-two percent separate them from Croth being able to go down, and they already have the Overgrown Ancient activated whenever they make their way to that platform. And so we're going to see whenever both of these teams pull Overgrown Ancient, who is going to be in the lead because it is it is certainly a question that is up in the air. I think that Ek Echo is actually killing these Lashers off pretty quick. The Lashers are looks like one of them is pretty high, like seventy-five percent, but the other Lashers are both at fifty. Yeah, see, that's the problem, right? They have the Affliction Warlock, which is really good for Val Lasher damage because all of these tiny Lashers die, and then the Soul yeah. Flame damage just do a huge amount of damage to the big Lashers, so it should be pretty quick. Um, but yeah, you can see, they're still, you see the, the skull, um, oh, oh, now oh, actually oh, going oh, down. Oh, they do oh, have oh, a Battle Rest, they have to kite, they might be able to kite this out until they can get a rest onto now, but this is another big damage loss for them because they cannot DPS at this point, they have to run away. It's another... Big time loss for Echo. And you can see Cheese is still fighting Croth. But as soon as they're done with Croth, they will go to the Overgrown Ancient and the boss will be spawned already and they can immediately attack it. While Echo has to finish off all of the Lashers and oh they have gosh. to wait for the RP to be done before they can fight the Overgrown Ancient. And you can see all of these Skitterflies jumping around doing insane amount of damage to everyone and they have to kite Sanguine as well on top of that. It looks like they might be done with the Lashers very soon. This is so close between those two teams still. But still, I think she's slightly in the lead as they are already on their way to pulling Overgrown Ancient in just a second. You were talking about the uh, Affliction Warlock damage too, but now dying reduces the amount of Soul Flame, like passive damage that was going to be exploding. And Echo also just loses that Thundering there. It's very unfortunate for them, and they wait a couple seconds for Overgrown Ancient to get pulled, where Cheese on the right side of your screen, able to pull Overgrown Ancient, and both of these teams are at a virtually identical spot. If you look at the difference in death differential, though, uh, there is a five-second advantage in favor of Cheese, and we are going to have a race to the finish here, Nagura. Look at the count difference, though. Um, there, there is a 5% count differential in favor of Echo, but that's likely to be made up by the fact that Cheese are going to be killing these Skitterflies here in just a moment. And this is so close between those two teams. It's absolutely crazy. We do see um, Echo no sanguine, being no lower in the no boss. Sanguine. Yeah, Sanguine is incredibly important. You see Cheese kiting the boss away. It looks good. But because they had to kite the boss, um, they're going to have a little bit less damage from the Affliction Warlock onto the boss, right? Fem does try to get the boss back in because they want those Soul Flame explosions onto the Overgrown Ancient. And it's looking pretty good. They have the Sanguine actually on some of these Lashes as well, which meant that they have been healed up by the Sanguine a lot. And looking at boss HP, Echo still ahead. So I think I did overestimate how much time Echo actually lost from the Salia death earlier and not being able to snap them. Echo doing so well, still ahead, even though they did make this pretty big mistake. I mean, they're just they're just so fast and their and their composition is so strong that even with that mistake, they're still able to be. I I, I guess they would be slightly ahead of Cheese at this point, even with uh, the five second death differential. But look at this. Cheese is trying to make sure that they're able to keep up. Them doing a great job of dragging the overgrown ancient in the middle of all of these lashers, letting that soul flame cleave just passively hit everything. They have a lot of lashers up <laughs> uh, currently on the side of Cheese. Uh, and Overgrown Ancient on the left side of the screen, though, is going to be going down for Echo here in just a couple of seconds. And they just have one pull in the dungeon that separates them and being able to finish this off. But for Cheese, they are hot on their heels. Okay, so now the most important moment in this dungeon is going to happen for Echo now. Because we know they have played Academy mm -hmm. yesterday. And we know that they're pulling... 22% trash into the last boss, which is an insanely difficult pull to execute on a 23 tyrannical sanguine explosive. So what they're doing is they gather up all of this very carefully. They're actually doing it pretty slowly. You can see they're going to stop halfway through. They line off side the mobs onto the left. Then they wait until they gather up a little bit more and then they move together into the boss room. They're going to be dropping mm -hmm. the ring of frost to make sure the ads are going to be succeed. And then they pull the boss and use bloodlust and all of their cities. Sally actually going down. They do not have a battle oh. rest available. Four minutes oh, for battle no. rest. Clicks did shadow melt. He might be able to out of combat rest, but it doesn't look like Clicks is resting. There we go. Clicks is actually he's casting getting the revive. He's getting the revive. There we go. The shadow melt might be saving this pool. The revive him. is coming out. Him. No, Cl Sally released. Oh, I think he got. This might have been a miscommunication. 
I think he might have got a combat by an explosive orb, Nagura. Oh. Ooh, this is this is. They cannot pull the boss until Sally is here. They have to wait. No. It Look looks like right. they might be dealing with the trash before until Sally. But Mary's Maris dying. goes down too. They already bloodlusted trying to deal with this trash. But Maris, no healer alive, does not survive and now has to release as well. Cheese, on the other hand, no issues so far. But it's another difficult point on their side as well. They do not have a ring of frost to help gather up this pool. So we'll see if Cheese can handle this. Then it's all going to be on their side. Echo just having so many issues on their side for this pool, unfortunately. And this is a huge moment for Cheese. Their strat was a little bit slower. Their route was a little bit slower. This is the final moment of the dungeon that separates them from victory. If they are able to get this trash killed off, they are totally fine. They do have one battle res available. We got to be looking at Fem's HP here. Looking at all of this trash that's coming in, these invokers, whenever they're casting that uh, missile on players, and particularly on the tank, it's a situation that can be very dangerous. The power vacuum gets cast. We need to make sure that the Echo Adoragosa does not get healed for the side of Cheese, but things are looking great. Ricky continuing to cast Dominate Mine to move mobs away. They do a great job of dodging out of the breath of Echo Adoragosa. We just have to kill off the trash. If we're able to live this pull for the side of Cheese, they are going to be able to take down this second map and send the back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back champions to the lower bracket. Oh my gosh. They said it couldn't be done. This is absolutely Jeez. insane. Cheese is doing so well. Just All they have the to boss. do is finish up. The do not heal the boss with Sanguine. They have to control these mobs perfectly. You can see Fem is trying to cut. Fem is out of defensives okay. at the moment. Though Ricky, Ricky does I? go down to a breath. You yep, do have a Battle Rust available, so they can use the Souls on here from Danico, and they are getting Ricky back up, but they still have a very difficult moment to handle here because they have all of these mobs still alive. You can see they're using their knockbacks to knock the mobs away right before the vacuum uh, sucks them all in so they don't die to the whirlwind from these Echo Knights. But there's still so many mobs alive. They have to execute this perfectly and cannot get any Sanguine heal. They're running out of offensive cool and defensive cool as Jenico does go down they do not have, okay. not have any more battle rushes available they have to wait one more minute before they can get Jenico back up and they still have trash alive there's just so much going on for cheese still they're just fully focusing the boss it looks like and sanguine might be an issue here as Ricky drops really low and Satsi goes down too they do not have a battle rest they have to play the rest of this fight without a healer in 40 seconds they can get him back up but Echo in the meantime dealt with all of the trash and they only have the boss left Frankenstein too oh my Oh my god, Cheese are gonna wipe Nagura! Oh my god, it was looking so good for Cheese, but now with those three players' deaths, it's it's gonna be so difficult. In 20 seconds, they can rest somebody back up. They should be resting a damage healer at this point, because if they rest a healer, they're not gonna be able to win against Echo. So they have to rest Fragments or Dranago, and they somehow have to finish off this boss. But Echo only has the boss itself. All of their members are alive. They have Bloodlust. They don't have Bloodlust, but they have a rest available in a second too if something goes wrong. So it might mm -hmm. still be Echo winning. There's no death differential either, because both of the teams have six deaths on the board. So all of a sudden, it's looking good for Echo again. I think she's. I think she's loses, dude. I. I don't they think even with the. They have to use an engineering rest. Somebody. I don't know if they have an engineering rest because they don't have. Fem. Fem has Fem to get like somebody up. Oh my god! Now there's only eleven percent that separates this team. Okay, and the restorer is come out of the dominate mind. They have to actually kill this mob too. Cheese doesn't Ricky. have count. Ricky goes down to the restore melees, and Fem no. is now able to finally res somebody. He actually drops the savior. He's gonna commit to dying. No. And it's gonna be a full wipe for Cheese. No. The res the savior's gonna res everybody, but it's too it's over, Nagura. Echo's gonna be able to kill the Echo Doragosa. Oh my God! What a heartbreak for Cheese. They did no. so incredibly well. But it just ended up not being enough for Cheese aside as to have a full wipe. Echo, on the other hand, they made so many mistakes in this dungeon. And you can see, I, I feel like they, they think they're losing. But they're not, because Cheese oh, just had a full wipe. God. And Echo is going to be the team that actually is going to win against Cheese and continue in the upper bracket. And, and oh my god, what an insanely close series this was that between was... Echo and Cheese. Unbelievable. All they had to do was avoid wiping the Echo and Doragosa and all the trash, but I think it just proves how difficult that six-pack pull is into the boss. They're trying to do 30% count on top of it, and it's just like, if you have one person die to just like random damage or the Invoker and stuff like that, it just spirals out of control as Echo 
finally takes down the Echo of Doragosa. Wow. No yeah. way. You ever, you ever hear the concept called a plot armor, right? Where a character is so important to the story that they just can't be allowed to die. And so you know they'll survive anything. I feel like Echo's been around MDI long enough now. They've won enough that they apparently have plot armor. It is impossible for them to get knocked in the lower bracket. It was close, but they managed to sneak it out over Cheese, who tragically makes wiping on the last boss there. That was, that was heartbreaking to see. It was, but before we get back to all the all the whatever that was, we're gonna go back to the beginning of the dungeon. I did want to showcase a little bit of cool technique that I think we first saw out of Cheese, but then Echo showed us this version. So what happens is that the mobs get feared. You can see it here as well from Cheese. They're using the Demon Hunter sigil, whereas the other team is using the Priest Fear. The team runs through, but because all of the mobs are feared, it is only Fragments who's in fight with them. He's going to use Shadow Melt right now, and they just drop aggro, do not have anything to do with this boss. It's a really, really cool, I think else you called it, the, the Demon Hunter Shroud and the Priest Shroud. Um, yeah. yeah, if, if someone I'm ever asks you to do what they do in the MDI, that's exactly what it is. Now, continuing this trend of things happening that we don't normally see. Here we have Fragments, who's bringing this entire horde of Lashers <laughs> over to the other side. And I was a little bit confused, but he gets out of range, so does not get hit before he gets to the bridge, so he can just hop on over. He does have that Shadow Meld available, and I think what happens is he gets on over, gets healed by Satsi, and then drops his Shadow Melt so they don't all snap to him, but instead drop mm -hmm. to Zatsi and Feta. So, Feta, or Fem, rather. Feta. Um, so, I think that's what's going on. Feta, yeah, it's, come on. They, they put their names like that. It's not my, my mistake. <laughs> it is confusing. We'll, we'll give you that. I guess. Big cheese. Sometimes I just read, okay? On the other side, for Echo, stuff went wrong. And I was watching, trying to figure out what exactly happened. Clicks brings everything up here using the same idea that I said before. Zelia heals him, so he had a shield on Clicks, gets in fight with them. And the idea is that Zelia Run. jumps on over yeah. and Clicks shadow melts. No. <laughs> but Zelia couldn't take the bridge, so he must have got spit on by one of the lashers or something. Does not get the snap, and instead they play all of that with the Ancient. They were so fast. They were so fast to finish off all of those lashers before they pulled this boss. And then towards the end of the dungeon, I think I'm 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 gonna need a couple more minutes to work through what I just saw happen because Dude. there was so much in there. First, the drama for Echo with Sati going uh, down, uh, with Zelia going down, them not getting that revive out, and then him releasing, and they still managed to play the pack and uh, then pull Echo of Doragosa, and on the other side, Cheese, who had even worse happening to them already into this big pull onto boss, Echo of Doragosa, over 50% damage taken, they do not have a battle rest, Satsi goes down, Draneko dies before him, and after that, it's just pain and suffering, getting defeated by the mob of the same named team, Echo gets this series <laughs> back under control, no but it was very oh, close. I see. <sighs> the the Echo uh, boss working oh. for Echo the team, apparently. But look Jeez, at the so Sanguine close, healing. Though, but... 20 million for both? Not bad. Wow. That's not that bad. I, I wouldn't hate pretty, that. Pretty even. We've seen worse. Yeah. I've certainly yeah. seen worse, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what can you say, though? I mean, sometimes, like, if you're cheese and you're on that last boss and you know you're ahead, you're just, like, repeating the litany to yourself. You're like, don't wipe, don't wipe, don't wipe, don't wipe. And then it's almost like reverse psychology, right? You're thinking so hard about not wiping, you end up walking into a mechanic you wouldn't have otherwise, or something happens, right? And that ended up being the difference maker here. Uh, Tettles, walk us through this this wonderful graph. Uh, you know, it's got a lot, a lot of ups and downs, Doa. Had that. There, there are sure a ton of ups and downs at, at pivotal moments of the dungeon <laughs> where we see things. There's a particularly a strong down for Echo there, whatever they're uh, having, a, having a wipe and cheese also have a... The, the biggest down that we see is that one for cheese that's at like... 2050 or so, right before the 21 minute mark, whenever they have to drop the savior because that's the wipe. You just see that towards the end, Cheese's, Cheese's damage just falls off a cliff. They honestly could yep. have four-manned that boss, and they would have been fine. 
What they could not have afforded was a full wipe in an unfortunate situation. That boss is really, really frustrating with the power vacuum and the orbs. And they just had a couple of people go down. They didn't have any battle reses available. And it was just, man, that, that series was ridiculous. I, dude, what a, what a way to start the day. My goodness. I feel like I think Mix's cat has a face that reflects again. how she's is feeling. Yeah. Right now. yeah, we need to calm down and look at Mix's cat for a second. Like <laughs> we need to take a deep breath after this series. I gotta take a breath <laughs> you know yeah. our, our yeah. April Fools rules that we're like, if something does not pass the vibe check, we're just gonna remake it. Like they, Put should, they in. should now be in power, and we're gonna we're gonna remake that game. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I, I don't know if not, we're gonna but, do that, but we might. Uh, we might have a. Tettles pick one of the roles and play next time. Uh, or maybe he doesn't get to choose. Maybe the team does. I don't know. Maybe I get to choose. Who knows? The sky's the limit, right? Well, here are our uh, schedules for... Here's the schedule for today. That's, that sentence didn't work out. Next is going to be mandatory versus perplexed. And uh, mandatory... The only team coming through yesterday with a 2-0 <laughs> over their opponent. Excuse me. Somebody take the wheel. I'm dying over here. Yeah, so Mandatory was the only team with a 2-0. Perplexed came into the weekend. It was kind of a question oh as to gosh. whether or not they were going to be consistent. And while they did have a three-map series, I felt like they did come in and they looked a lot better than they did in, like, Cup B weekend. Um, now, Mandatory looked like they had absolutely no flaws with either their strategy or their execution, which is something that, like, if I'm perplexed, I am quite scared of. That team looks very very strong but if there is going to be a team that is going to be able to take either maps or the series off mandatory it's going to be perplexed but they have to play at the absolute top caliber which with the teams that we had this Absolutely. weekend it's it's not an insane ask <laughs> i mean you kind of what do you what, what can you do right you got to do it well i got to take a break the rest of us have to take a break when we come back our second match of the day it's going to be mandatory versus perplexed we'll see in just a few here on mdi goodbye
And we are back for a second match of the day here at the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals for Dragonflight Season 1. Your host, Doe, here along with Dratnos, Ironic, and Nagura. And I still can't believe how that last series ended. Like, we were all completely convinced Cheese was going to win that until they inexplicably wipe on the boss. I don't know. I, I don't know if we really need to say that much more about it. I'm still kind of reeling from it. I'm sure the two of you are too, but let's move on and talk about mandatory versus perplex. This is our next one. You touched on it right before the break, but mandatory looking extremely good in their 2-0 yesterday. Uh, and we should mention too that mandatory is the Munka roster. They were picked up by the big French esports org mandatory. So congrats to them. And uh, so far doing them proud. Right, Dradnos? Absolutely, yeah. I think Perplexed also have looked really strong yesterday, too. We saw them put up that 9-minute, yeah. 16-second run in Ruby Life Pools, so uh, incredible run out of that team, too. So either of these two teams, these were probably the teams that I, I was expecting to get second and third to Echo this weekend, maybe, but then we just see Cheese almost beat Echo, so maybe these, I mean, the, <laughs> the entire top four, top six of this weekend is just so crazily close. Here's a look, though, at our map pool for the, the day. We have Algathar taken out by Perplex, so we're not going to see a repeat of the uh, last boss wipe that we just saw in the last series. Court of Stars taken out by Mandatory, so we're not going to see a repeat of the no healer strategy if either of those teams would have had that ready for that dungeon, which means we are going to be seeing Temple of the Jade Serpent into Halls of Valor into a potential Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. The Temple is an interesting one, though. That one is one of our lower keys, the lowest key of the series here at 21. Still a very nasty dungeon, though, with uh, just the mobs themselves and Tyrannical being active as well. Oh, yeah. So looking at this Temple of the Jade Serpent to start us off, one of the fun things we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to compare these runs with what we just saw, right? Where we saw F uh, Echo basically do a perfect run, end it in 12.03. Zyronic, what do you think we're going to see? I'm really, really interested to see what mandatory brings to the table here. I'm honestly both of these teams, like Dratnos yeah. just said there, I think a lot of us were expecting both of these teams to potentially be like the second or third place finishing team this weekend, of course, all shaken up by how amazing a performance Cheese just put together. But um, yeah, we'll get a really great comparison to Echo and Cheese here in this very first dungeon. I'm glad that we had both of these as the first round of the top two matchups of the day so we can make that comparison. I mean... Mandatory is the team that I, I thought had the highest chance of taking down Echo this weekend, so I'm really, really looking for them to put together a good run here. And of course, like you mentioned, they're the only team that got a 2-0 yesterday. So they are on a roll. They're, they're the most informed team we saw yesterday, so I'm really expecting a lot of things from them here. Yeah, I mean, it really feels like uh, anyone can beat anyone this weekend, though, uh, Nagura. It, it's, it's a tough one to call. Like, I had Perplex second coming out of the weekend. Uh, who did you have, again, predictions-wise? I'm trying to remember. I had Echo first and Mandatory second as well. Okay. Uh, the one thing that I do want to say about the Temple here, though, is that Mandatory actually banned Temple against Legendary in their series yesterday. So True. it's possible that they maybe are not super confident about their route here, or they just wanted to save like their strategy for the second day. So we'll see what they have for us here. Yeah, we'll see what they can do. The match is underway. Let's see who takes the first dungeon. Once again, differing comps coming out from both teams. Mandatory opting for the Prot Warrior versus the Prot Paladin for Perplexed. And also we have the Warlock instead of the Unholy DK yet again coming out. So we'll see if history repeats itself. It was the DK that won last time around, but tanks are swapped this time around compared to the previous matchup. Yeah, you can see both of them actually dealing with the trash pretty uh, equally. And Mandatory and both Perplexed as well engaging wise mari here now one thing that is a little bit of a downside when you play with the destruction warlock is that you have a pretty long cooldown on that really important uh, infernal so wolf disco using that infernal and that first trash pull still having it up a little bit for the boss here but it might be a going a little bit in advantage for a mandatory because they have a little bit more consistent damage possibly with the unholy dk on their side but it's looking pretty close still when you look at boss damage here Mandatory just slightly ahead, but just by a, f I mean a second maybe, if even. Yeah, actually, I, I think the consistent damage is more going to come from the Warlock. Like the Unholy DK does have more cooldowns, but it's definitely more bursty. Now, one of the major differences we saw in the previous matchup between Echo and Cheese is that Echo kind of just sent through PI on cooldown, right? 
we can see mm-hmm. that the power infusion comes up in about 45 seconds for both team here. Echo just sent it at the end of the boss, whereas Cheese decided to save theirs for the big pull going into the second boss room. I wonder what the plan is, because honestly, like, I could see the teams doing either one, trying to get a more efficient power infusion out, but it seemed like it worked out for better for Echo, because they got like a 20, like a 20 second or so advantage throughout the dungeon. And again, if you look at Perplex, they don't really have a great power infusion target when it comes up in 20 seconds here. You're going to give it to the Incarnless Feral Druid? I don't think they want to pop that Incarn here, even though it's coming off cooldown. Or are you going to give it to the Infernalist Warlock? Like, it just doesn't look like a great... There's a great PI target in general for them to give it to here. And just like Ashine actually did pop that Incarn as soon as it came up, well, it looks like Maystein on the mandatory side is actually saving the Incarn for the next pull. So... We'll see if that gives Perplex a little bit of an edge here on boss damage, but it doesn't necessarily look like it. Mandatory is still ahead on boss damage, Crims is holding on to the PI though, and Mason is also holding on to that Incarn, while it looks like both Swag and Ashine did pop those cooldowns for Perplex side. So you can see now they actually caught up on boss damage. Oh, Crims going down too for mandatory, so it looks like they were committing the battle rest, but Crims is not taking it. So they did just not use that, uh, not commit the battle rest. Crims is going to be releasing, and the boss split is two seconds in favor of Perplex, but keep in mind the extra cooldowns that they committed. So that means mandatory might be clearing the next trash pool faster because of those extra cooldowns. Now, the other thing to mention, though, Wolf Disco does have that Infernal coming up for whatever pull they end up doing here. They also have the option to gateway across the room here and get, make their way down to the book a little bit faster so they can get a little bit more free ad cleave on that boss whenever it does spawn without having to run all the way around. So just a little bit more efficient on trash damage. But again, it's it's really you really want to make sure you're pumping as much boss damage as possible here. And I just think the Unholy DK with the power infusion, when it does come up, will be able to pull Mandatory ahead like it did when we saw Echo pull this off earlier. Again, we'll have to remain to see if that's the case. A lot of damage coming out for Perplexed here as those Shaw, those haunting Shaw, start to die off. But they're able to keep everyone alive. So interestingly enough, Perplex did already finish up the book to spawn the boss here. Ryzen did focus down that book like 10 seconds ago. And I don't think mandatory, at least I didn't see mandatory finish it just yet. So. There we go. Strife and Peril is engaged for Perplex already. So they killed that book wow. really quickly, and now they're gathering the rest of the trash down onto this boss. So this is giving Perplex quite a bit of an advantage here, while mandatory finishing off the book later means the boss is still going to take quite, uh, a few seconds for them to spawn. But this is very dangerous for Perplex, because you have all of these mobs here. You can see the tiger jumping around, and you still have uh, the host in, uh, alive as well. So it's going to be extra damage on the vine field. And looking at the cooldowns, the defensive cooldowns available, there's not too much left, at least from what we, we can see. Mandatory still has yet to kill off that beetle in the back, I believe. Nope, that's just the Songbird Queen. Okay, they have killed off the beetle already, so they're in a much safer spot than Perplexed is. Perplexed only just now de dealing with that beetle, but look at the boss damage difference here. Perplexed almost 20% ahead on the boss. This is a tyrannical key. That's a lot of HP that they have to chew through. Mandatory, though, trying to warm their way back into it a little bit. They've got the Army of the Dead active on the DK, and he is doing a ton of damage here. But it really doesn't look like they're making up that much ground. Yeah, they, they pulled the boss so much later. It, I think they did a little bit more boss damage, but because they engaged the boss so much later, they're not actually catching up to Perplex here. Uh, their strategy just being a little bit quicker and more efficient, but Perplex actually immune to Strife. You can see Strife does have the Absorb Shield on him. That means that they are not going to be able to DPS this boss while he's immune, stacking it all the way up to 10 stacks. So this is another time loss for Perplex here. Even though they pulled the boss earlier and they were doing so well, this is costing them a little bit of time, but they still finish off the boss quicker and they're already able to move on. And now they have the gateway to be able to skip um, this Infester as well. So this is going to make up a little bit of time for Perplex because they don't have to walk all the way around. And this is the problem, I think, that Mandatory is running into here. That Power Infusion was off cooldown for a long time on that boss. Grim just hasn't been able to pop it for the next 30 seconds, for the last 30 seconds or so, because they need to make sure they have that up for this next pull. Perplex, though, going too fast for the PI, it's not up for this pull at all. And they also don't even have the Infernal either. That's a lot of safety on this pull that's gone for them. Those AoE stuns are incredibly useful at making sure those Spitefuls don't run too amok. So let's see if they're able to make it work. It looks like Wolf Disco doesn't carry any of the PI or the Infernal to do damage. He's still popping off, doing over 600k on this poll. Spirit Link doing a great job to keep everyone alive as the Haunting Shaw start to die off. One last set of them is going to spawn from the Shambling Infester. 
and it looks like they're home free mandatory just now starting up their pull their first set of shots starting to go down they're doing a great job to keep everyone alive looks like the pull's going well for both teams here yeah, both of the teams doing an amazing job dealing with this pool. It's incredibly dangerous. Just so much damage coming out onto the group. We see Ryzen on Perplex side pulling those two mobs from the bridge to be able to deal with them while they also do the boss. And they get a thundering simultaneously. So that's really going to help them out for boss damage. And both the teams actually engaging Leo Flameheart at the exact same time. These two teams are so close to each other in this dungeon. But look at that again, the PI difference. Swag didn't end up using PI on the AoE pull. He has it for the single target damage on the boss here. And because of the way things will line up, he'll actually have it back up again for when they go into the mass AoE pull after this too. So it, like, the PI timings have just been better for Perplex in this dungeon. I think it's what's kind of keeping them in here, even though Mandatory should technically have the better overall comp for the dungeon. I mean, I think another big difference that we haven't really been paying too much attention to is the difference of the Prop Paladin versus the Warrior Prop Paladin just capable of a little more overall damage and of course you know 20k dps is not a huge chunk but over the course of a dungeon it definitely does end up adding up and look even though they pulled the boss at the same time here the difference of the cooldowns here has given perplexed a 10 percent lead on the boss yeah it's looking really good for perplex but this boss is not going to cause too much issues anymore for either of those teams i resume the only difficult moment that we're still going to see in this dungeon is what I presume both of the teams are going to be doing, and it's going to be the trash pull onto the last boss. We've seen Echo do it earlier, and we've seen Cheese do it as well in this series just before this one. But it was so difficult. We've seen both of the teams struggle a little bit, and now we're going to have to see if Perplex and Mandatory can pull it off. Perplex, of course, a little bit quicker with this boss, and looking at the cooldowns, uh, Infernal still one minute off, so they might not necessarily have it for that trash pull into boss. And we also don't have an Incarn available either. PI is going to be up, but we'll see if they can deal with it. Dwarf Rachel's also not ready on Ryzen. That might be a little bit of an issue because there's so many um, mystery risks that they pull. There's so many curses that go off on the team unless they use something like Hex or Control Mind on either of them. That uh, having the Dwarf Rachel is actually really important. Yeah, I mean, that's been the major thing that kills off people right on the, on the back. I think there's four Mistweavers in there that you have to deal with. And if anyone ever gets double cursed and you don't have a decurse available for them, you just get one shot by it. There's no way of living through it without a decurse, unless you have, like, literally every external in the game. Huh, I wonder... Does Paladin potentially run Spellbop in this dungeon just to live through that? I maybe need to look at the talent tree or have somebody look at that in the... Uh, the caster talent discord to see if that goes off but perplexed not going for the mass pull here they're taking it easy nagura this could cost them here mandatory what are they yes. going to do if, if they go for the full pull they could definitely pull ahead here look at that even hexing one of the mist weavers to make it safe yeah they're going for it perplexed but they just kind of handed the dungeon back to mandatory yeah, it's all on mandatory now. Can they finish off this pull? They did not engage the boss just yet, though, on mandatory side. They did pull everything except this mystery that is hexed, hexed in the in the back, but they're not pulling the boss just yet. Perplexed, there we go. Shaft Doubt is now engaged for mandatory. They do have Bloodlust in 14 seconds. Perplex now also engaging Shaft Doubt with the rest of this trash group. And this is just going to be so close between those two teams. Divine Field dropping it's pretty so low, close. but did manage to recover. And they do have Bloodlust in five seconds on both of the teams. One death. So a five seconds death penalty in favor of Perplex. Okay, here's the big deal though. Because of the way Mandatory pulled this trash pack, where they pulled the trash pack, did damage to it early, and then pulled the boss, they're not gonna have to worry about too much about Spiteful Shades while they're in this intermission phase. Perplexed, however, the trash is still alive, and the Shades are still active in hunting them down while they're in this intermission phase. They're gonna have to kite around and do a great job of DPSing these fragments down, but look at this Mandatory already out of the intermission phase. Perplexed, though, still in it, still taking damage, still getting meleeed by the fragments. Wolf Disco does go down, the health bars are dropping so low, Thundering goes off, off on Divine Field and Ryzen, that's two dead. He does have the Ankh. They, ha they have the Battle Res on Wolf Disco as well. They still do have one on the board. When is he going to take it, though? Oh, that was a lot of time that Perplex just lost, and a Shine going down as well. I think that's going to be all she wrote. They've got no way to get him back alive. This is just such a disaster for Perplex. And, I mean, Wolf Disco had Infernal up as when he went down. So they lost so much damage on this trash. And they did not manage to finish, off, finish it off. And it was too much for Divine to handle. They did somehow manage to not fully wipe. But it's still just such a big time loss for them to have this one damage dealer death that they do not have a battle rest left for. Mandatory, though, on the other side. 
had no issues whatsoever in this poll. They're done with the trash because they dealt with this a little bit differently. And all they have to do is finish off the boss here. They're going to be winning. So even though it looked so good for Perplex, this last pull that they did here just not working out for them. You can see Swag now going down to Ryzen following. And it's going to be a full wipe for Perplex here. It's all on mandatory. And yeah, Perplex just not having the Bloodlust. Um, having Wolf Disco go down with the Inferno with their big cooldown that they need to finish all of this trash just costing them too much very unfortunate for, for perplexed at the end there but the potential was seen i just wonder what the thought process was on just not pulling that first trash pack into, into the big aoe pull it cost them so much time and then they felt rushed it seems to get the trash onto the boss and that just chain reacted into that wipe, but that's going to be the first game of the series. Shaw of Doubt goes down for mandatory, and they take a 1 0 lead over Perplexed. All right, that was really interesting. Mandatory taking the uh, the first dungeon, looking clean, doing it, of course, too. But Perplexed with a little bit of a, a perplexing uh, move at the end there, where, like you said, doing that one pack and then going into the room with the boss. But honestly, with the way we saw them struggle a little bit on the boss, maybe it was just kind of a thing where it's like, we know we can't handle that whole room and the boss. Let's split it up, damage, try to get that done efficiently. Again, we can, we can think about that a little bit really more as we have a Dratnos kind of break down the map for us. Sure, yeah, so one thing I want to mention here, as always, we're seeing our teams break break the scroll from upstairs, usually with the healer, just hopping up on that little fence, toss a couple of globals down, uh, sometimes using the Desperate Invokers Codex, which both of these healers were using as well, to just dump a huge damage global into that scroll, pre-activate the boss. Perplex were even then able to use this gateway, which one of the many upsides to Warlock in this dungeon, and I actually think Perplex comp is really good here, is Warlock has several good gateways here, right? There's the one uh, there, and then there's also the one after that boss that you can use to skip, you know, 10 seconds of walking around a little pathway. So uh, that's, you know, those, those little time saves are actually really valuable in a dungeon as short as 12 minutes, which this one is, right? Now, this courtyard pull as well, one of the reasons I like Prop Paladin in here is you just can pop the bubble, stand in, you know, not have to dodge the swirlies, not have to dodge the leg sweep, uh, keep everything all grouped up. A lot of a more uh, safe lifestyle than the warrior here. You can see Skylark just gets kind of beat up for a little while, gets back to his spell block now, and he's ready to start hitting that, and then he's got spell block for the next 20 seconds, and he ends up being okay there, but it's a lot more hectic, a lot more hairy, and I think the Paladin has definitely a, some nice upside in this dungeon in general, and in that pull in particular, this pull onto the last boss as well, uh, I think it works nicely on, but obviously for Perplexed, ended up going a little bit wrong, as you guys pointed out, uh, how that sort of fell apart, and ending up with more deaths than you have battle reses, it all sort of starts to fall apart. And this is not a boss that you can kind of get killed if you have people dead, because those intermission adds need to die within a certain amount of time, especially on Tyrannical, right? If you have four players alive, the adds that you spawn are not necessarily going to die in time. So it's it's a very high likelihood you're going to full wipe if you are trying to, four, to kill that boss with four players. So... Uh, unfortunate for Perplexed, nice run out of Mandatory, just the one death on the board for them, probably pretty close to their uh, potential time in that dungeon. Perplexed, I, I feel like if everything had gone their way, if, if that dungeon had gone their way, they maybe were going to be a little bit faster. I do like their comp a little bit more. I think the Warlock and the Paladin are awesome, but uh, did not work out for them this time. Well, thankfully for them, it's only the first map of the series, but before we go on... Um, Zyronic, any anything numbers wise jump out to you at this one, either from this screen, from the graph we're gonna see. Actually, to be honest, not really. The big thing that I was personally looking at was the difference between the Prot Warrior and the Prot Paladin. And surprisingly, sure. the Divine Field isn't too far behind Skylark. Now, of course, Skylark did get you know eighty percent of a boss also on his damage meter, so maybe his overall would have been potentially even a little higher, which is surprising. That's that's completely opposite from the trend we've been seeing, right? Where Prop Paladins are doing more overall damage than Prop Warrior. So maybe it's not as big as a difference as we initially thought. Hmm. But overall, like, DPS comps, even when teams are running quote-unquote non-meta stuff, like, for instance, with Cheese with their comps, it doesn't really seem like there's too much of an actual difference in overall DPS. It just comes down to which utility you want to choose. It's really nice. It's one of my favorite things about MDI this season is that we do have like a pretty huge amount of uh, diversity and DPS choices for the for the teams, and we're also seeing that extend a little bit into tanks and healers as well. Um, you know, you and I were talking actually a little bit before the the day started, Zyronic, and you were saying that you'd, you'd be willing to say this is our our 
tightest MDI finals ever as far as like the uh, comparison between the teams in the uh, in the group. Oh yeah, absolutely. And in, in the past, you know, five years that we've been doing MDI Global Finals, right? This is by far the closest Global Finals we've ever had. I, th I think every single one of these teams, legitimately all eight teams, could find a way to win this competition. Whether whether it's just from comp diff in a particular dungeon, being more comfortable in a particular dungeon, or just being the more consistent team. Everyone technically could win here. And, you know, in the past there's been, you know, one or two teams where you're like, you know, they're really good. I could see them taking, you know, a game off of one of the top teams if they get lucky. But you couldn't really see them making a run through the entire bracket. This time around, not the case. Everyone is insane. Yeah, I mean, Echo having to make it through two two ones to stay alive that we just saw in our last series. Looking ahead in this series, we're going to Halls of Valor next. Going to be fortified, bursting, and explosive. So a lot to worry about there. Lots of things blowing up. And we'll see if Perplex can tie things up or not, or if Mandatory is going to take the 2-0. They did 2-0 yesterday. Again, bringing that point back from earlier. They were our only team from the first round of the Global Finals that uh, successfully 2-0'd their opponent. We'll see if they can keep the momentum going now. Yeah, so we actually did see Mandatory in the halls of Redder already. They had an 18 minutes 21 run with zero deaths, and they won against Legendary early on. Um, so we'll see how Perplex is doing here. Perplex we haven't seen at all yet, and I would say that Mandatory is a little bit favored here just because the strategy looked so good, but Perplex did not ban the Halls of Valor, so that must, must mean that Perplex is really confident that they can beat Mandatory's route here, even if they do play perfectly. So both of the teams are running the same comp, it looks like. They're running the Prod Paladin, the Disc Priest, and the Fire Mage Unholy DK Feral combo, and both of them did pull all of the trash into the first boss heal him himdel they have to be very careful here um with the damage that is coming out plus all of the the dragons that are flying over and the frontal that the storm rate is doing but it's looking like both of the teams are executing this very beautifully and looking at boss damage they're so close to each other just really neck on neck i think that's something that's really interesting to point out we are on map five of the day here and i think this is the first time all day that we've actually seen just a one for one mirror matchup across the board very exciting stuff this time around with the global finals where people can play a lot more differing and interesting comps but there's definitely still a difference in play sometimes around as we can see for perplex one of their players has gone down they're going to have to commit the battle res very very early on into the dungeon and as we know halls of valor has lots of non-stop huge huge pulls so that safety net being able to get somebody back alive is gone for the next eight and a half minutes for perplex they literally will have to play perfectly otherwise this dungeon run and this series could be over very very soon for them you hate to see that so early on yeah, definitely not too good for Perplex here. Mandatory does use Mind Soothe to go past a lot of these trash mobs here. And now we do know that they're gather they're gonna be gathering up a lot of this trash and they're gonna be pulling it into the mini boss here. So we'll see if that works out for mandatory because it's an absolutely crazy and very difficult pull to execute. We do see a ring of frost from Crims coming out here as well, and uh, making sure these um thunder colors and um the rune carvers are not coming into the pool early on because there's already a purifier that they have to interrupt on top of dealing with Solstice AOE Eye of the Storm here. So they want to see those mobs first so they can deal with the shield maidens and those purifiers first and then they will be coming in later on into that pool. But yeah, this is still very, very difficult. Of course, we have all of those explosives going off that Moat has to deal with, while also the Eye of the Storm on a 2245 does quite a lot of damage and they need to deal with the Aspirants cast here as well. It looks like Maystein actually shadow melted the Aspirant's cast. Uh, actually, no, it was Moat mm -hmm. that shadow melted it. So really nicely done and not having that go off. Ooh, I believe that was an explosive that just went off and popped for a bit of damage on everyone, but they look like they're nice and safe here. Solston does go down, so not another Eye of the Storm going down for them here, but they're not going to let up with this pull. This is probably instantly going to go into the other mini boss the second they feel comfortable. Or maybe they might just play it a little safe, try to get this purifier down first and then pull it into Ulmir. Yeah, I think that's the play here. They were also waiting for that advance as well. Onto mode mode, but here we go. Into the second mini boss ad a little bit faster than perplexed, still here. Doing a good job of making their way through the dungeon. Yeah, definitely doing a good job. We do see another ring of frost coming out from Crims on mandatory side with the rest of the trash that uh, was there in the back. This 
Still don't want to deal with it just yet until they finished off this Aspirant and the Shield Maidens that are still alive. Moat does not have Shadow Melt available for this jump, so he does have to survive it somehow. Moat actually a little bit low on mana. You can see a pretty low Master Spell on cooldown too, so he has to deal with the rest of these mobs uh, with pretty low mana, but the uh, Olmir and the Aspirant actually don't do that much damage, so they should be fine without mana here. Well, Perplexed uh, still has quite a lot to deal with when it comes to the HP of Olmir. But uh, yeah, I mean, looking at the percentage, Perplexed dealt with a little bit more trash. But Mandatory is going to deal with this, these three mobs that they see the whole time while doing Hersha. So they're going to be making up that difference in just a second. Here we go. Hersha already pulled from Mandatory at the 4 minute and 20 second mark. Nice. But let's see when Perplex actually ends up pulling the boss. They're already at least 15 seconds behind, you can see on the timer at the bottom right here. So mandatory just from play and also death timers have been just that much more efficient at the start of the dungeon. Here, Herja pulled 4 minutes 40 seconds. So 20 second advantage for Monka already in the dungeon. And we know already from yesterday, like you mentioned earlier on, this is a great dungeon for mandatory. They had an insanely fast time of 18.20 yesterday, more than a minute faster than anything we saw in any of our cups here. And it's not like that's just a key level difference, right? Halls of Valor, 22 fortified, pretty high key level. It's not the 23, that's the highest, high, our highest key level, but it's still up there. And of course, fortified, so much trash in this dungeon that you have to worry about. It's a long, long dungeon, but it doesn't seem to bother them that much. And of course, they were also the team that kind of pioneered that rock strat in Finrear's room, right? Mode mode will jump up on top of the rock, grip the mage up, and then they don't have to worry about those jump bleeds at all. The first team to pull that off with Finrear. Everyone else did it solo beforehand, and now everyone has copied mandatory strat. So you know what they you know what they say, right? You can copy someone's strat, but to get better at a copied strat is pretty difficult to do. It definitely is. Now Mandator is already an eight percent on Hersha. I think they might not be able uh, they might not get another I uh, storm. Which will be good because Moat is still low on mana because Moat actually never left combat this whole time. But yeah, there we go. It doesn't need the mana. Esther moving on um, to the Fenrir area in just a second. Perplex still having to do with Hersha. Looking at the trash percentage, both of them are actually completely even right now. So it's very clear to see that Mandatory is going to be ahead depending on the boss split here. So once you see the second boss split uh, finish for Perplex, you will see the exact difference between those two teams. There we go. So it's going to be a 17 seconds difference in favor of mandatory here. Plus the 5 seconds death penalty. Yeah, plus the death timer. So around 25-ish seconds of an advantage for mandatory. Still opening that gap up just a little bit. They got a little bit more boss damage out there as well. And they're on towards Finner's area. Now the question is, what does Perplex have cooked up? Are they going to do anything differently? From mandatory here because i mean if again if you're just copying mandatory strat it's going to be very very hard to make up that 25 seconds gap like it's very hard to be better than the team the strat you're copying from so far though doing the same pull as mandatory but look mandatory is almost done with this pull already by the time perplex have it pulled together i mean it's going to be rough for perplex they really really need some mistakes to come out of mandatory here yes one thing that is going to help Perplex a little bit here is that they have the Thundering for this pool, while Mandatory got it after the pool because they were quicker. So Perplex a little bit of an edge here with the Thundering timing, uh, being able to maybe do this trash back a little bit quicker in comparison. But still, Mandatory now skipping that Storm Drake, and they're going to be engaging Fenrir in just a second. You can see Maystein actually walked a little bit to the left. Not sure if he engaged maybe one of the mobs here, one of the bulls. Uh, I don't see one just yet, so we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, it's, it is a 45 key, so Fenrir shouldn't be too big of an issue. They also have multiple Shadow Melts, and they have the Prowl in Karn available for Maystein as well. So they can skip a lot of those leaps. Uh, but there we go. They actually are pulling Fenrir into this uh, Marksman pack. So they have to be a little bit careful when it comes to those traps that they're throwing out because they can do a lot of damage to the group. Yeah, absolutely. Getting hit by one of those traps and not having something like an immunity or a dwarf racial up could spell the death of one of the players. That bleed is very nasty here. Of course, ranged players doing a good job to bait those out and make sure they're behind the groups so and don't have to worry too much about them. And I didn't see, did they commit one of their melds to that very first leap? I don't see it anywhere on the board, but I imagine they did because we don't see any bleeds on their characters right now. Second, was proud by goes out. Yeah. Prims is going to invis this one. Was it prowled by Maystein? Okay, perfect. The greater invis here for Crims to make sure they don't get any bleed stacks as well, even though the boss is about to phase. They still do have all, all of their Shadow Mounts across the board, actually, so 
They're going to be very fine on Fenrir as well in second phase here. Let's see how this pull goes for Mandatory. Of course, we know what they do here. We've seen it before. We've seen a lot of teams copy it. But we're going to see Mode jumping up on the rock here right behind Fenrir with a fade to make sure he doesn't accidentally pull the boss. And then he'll grip Crims up to safety, and they'll pull every single wolf in this area. And we'll see this happen in just a second. You can see Mode is already jumping up on that rock. The grip is coming out. There we go. And combustion being used by Crims. All the wolves have been gathered by Star uh, Skylark on mandatory side. So huge single target, but also um, splash and cleave damage coming out onto these wolves as well. And we can see the first sleep is coming out. It looks like it's going to be mode that maybe is going to be shadow melting that one off so they don't get the leap at all actually the leap doesn't happen right because they're on the stone so they don't even have to deal with that pain sap coming out as well on skylark to make sure that the tank does not go down here because there's actually a lot of tank damage on this pool this is something we don't talk about too often but tanking fenrir while also tanking all of these wolves is a lot of tank damage that's why skylark is actually using bubble here but basically does go down i'm not sure if that maybe was an aggro issue because of the bubble taunt that happened by Skylark. Sometimes there is an issue with that because it does have a 15 yards range and sometimes it doesn't hit all of the mobs or, and the boss. But uh, they do have the battle rest to get them back up, so it shouldn't be too big of an issue. But they're still ahead. Perplex now doing the same thing on their side too. But yeah, they are a little bit behind still on Perplex's side. Let's see what the difference is here. Stop the clock from mandatory on the boss there. You can see that boss force split is now ticking up. If you look at that difference on the boss force split when Fenrir dies, we'll be able to see what the difference is. When Herja went down, it was a 25 second difference. Were Perplexed able to claw any of that back here? Not quite sure. It's going to be very, very close. So if they did pull an advantage off here, it's going to be very, very minimal though. However, Mandatory moving onwards with the dungeon here. They've committed their second Bloodlust to this bear pull. The entire forest is pulled, every single grizzly is pulled, and look, the difference is still exactly 25 seconds from Herja to Fenrir. No time difference was had in the dungeon. Not looking good for Perplex, they really need to amp it up here. So mandatory actually does commit bloodlust for this bear plus bull pool. So there's a lot of bulls in there, plus the bears, again, a lot of damage on Skylark here. And they have all of these AOE casts go out from the bulls that they have to interrupt, plus the piercing horse coming out as well. So lots of interrupts required and a lot of defensives from Skylark uh, that you need to survive this pool. Perplex not doing the exact same thing on their side as well. So it really does look like they're doing mirror strategies. Perplex also using that bloodlust. But yeah, again, it's these, this 25 seconds difference in favor of mandatory because those initials issue, initial issues the Perplex had on the first boss. Yeah, and I mean, there was also a little bit more efficiency of, of routing, I think, pulling things together. Mandatory seemed to be a little bit more comfortable or quick about how they moved up towards Herja. I wonder if because they had that death, there was some patrol they had to wait a couple seconds for just to, to catch up to mandatory. A little unfortunate, but yeah, it looks like most of the problems in this dungeon have come just from that first death on the very first boss here. Of course, we are heading up to one of the last trash pulls in the dungeon here, the Four Kings. The trash count is looking good for both teams. Actually, it's perplexed. Short count? I'm pretty sure 83.7 is what you need. Do they pull a Guardian? Mm. Oh, they were just Maybe killing off some neutral bull? mobs in the back. No, no, they just, they just finished off oh, two Oh, yeah, there we back. go. Okay, I see. they've got their yeah. count. That was weird. Okay. It's all going to oh. come down to mandatory being able to do this um, quadra mini boss pull here, right? Because if they don't manage that, then uh, it would be the thing that puts Perplex back in the lead. So looking at mandatory, see how they throw their beer and see how uh, if they manage to speak to the... Um, to the kings in time because you only have a short window to actually talk to them to activate them after Skylark carries all of the mini bosses through and activates them. It's looking really good. They got the first one. We'll see if they manage to catch up the third. I'm not sure if they did they miss one. It looked like they maybe missed uh, one. There are only three in here. Yeah. Also, game plates are bamboozling us. That would not be good if they do end up missing one. That could be the thing that Perplex needs to come back into this. Of course, it's not the hugest... Yeah, they missed one. You're right. There it is. You can see him right there on the right whenever the, the camera angle changes. There is that missing missing fourth king. Perplex could definitely come back here. Of course, now once Perplex got four. This, this changes... It changes how mandatory has to pull this, right? They had to burn one of the kings down in order to get that last king active. Hmm... 
think this is it, honestly. It was, only it was only 25 seconds in favor of mandatory, and now Perplex has all four. So the fact that they had to single one down, and now they still have a full HP um, guard to spawn later, I do think might actually made up the, make up the difference. We'll see in just a second once they finish off these um, kings. But yeah, you can see Perplex definitely caught up a lot. You can Looking at the HP of these kings, Perplex looking really good. If they manage to finish these off, this is going to be so close. We see Bubble come Wait. out by the Minefield, though, trying to survive oh, these uh, kings. First. And there it is. Perplex did finish off the kings first. Wow. One small mistake near the end of the dungeon. The entire 25-second lead that they had accrued throughout the dungeon, gone. Perplex now. Roughly, I would say about a 10-second lead now. But that still can be made up just by pure better single target damage. And of course, with just two bosses left in the dungeon, it is only going to be single target damage that matters. The class comps are the same across the board. It's all going to come down to just pure damage button skill from the players. And, you know, maybe a couple procs would be nice too. Would love to see some pyroclasms from the mages. Mage talk. Wait, I already did that yesterday. That's already checked off the bingo board. But here we go. On to <laughs> God King Skovald. Pulling the boss at roughly the same time. This is going to be so close. All right, so I looked at the timer when they engaged God King Skovald, and it was six seconds in favor of Perplex. So Perplex pulled the boss six seconds early, which is not a guaranteed win at all, right? Even though they are playing the same comp, six seconds difference is not a lot. So we'll see. It's all going to come down to signal target damage for both of these teams and how well they execute the Odin burn as well after the King Skovalt here. Taking a look at the cooldowns here, the offensive cooldowns for both of these teams, we can see a shine is actually holding on to Incarn because Ashine thinks that if he, if he uses Incarn here, he will not have it for the Odin burst. So he's holding on to it. While Maestin uh, did use it at the very start of God King Skovald. Right. So that means that they might have a little bit more uh, boss damage for mandatory side. But because Perplex, of course, pulled the boss earlier, they're still ahead here. I, I feel like there's no Grims. way that's right, right? Yeah, yeah, this, this is totally right. So for the mage, you definitely pop the combust on cooldown here for a couple of different reasons. Number one, you have Firestarter on Odin for the, the for the first 45 seconds of the boss, right? Which means you'll get your combust back off cooldown. You can see even Wolf Disco pops it just now, even later, because he knows he'll get it back up. You have 100% crit anyways, and you, and you want to save the combust for the first damage amp, which comes about 45 to 50 seconds into the fight. I feel like if Shine popped the Incarn right when it came off cooldown, he would have gotten it back up. That could be a big mistake, and it could cost them here, as Mandatory pulled the boss, had about a 6% disadvantage coming into the boss, and it's roughly the same at the end of the boss. But man, again, it's just going to come so down minutes. to the DPS burst race. Here's the difference, though. Look at the PI timers for both teams. Mode modes Oof. is going to be up right at the start of the buff here. Ryzen's going to be up a little bit later. Let's see how long this Odin RP actually takes here. Remember, about 45 to 50 seconds into the boss is when that buff comes up. If it's just if it just ends up being a PI diff, oh boy, this could be really close. This is just so incredibly close. So it's going to be perplexed. It does engage the boss a little bit earlier, but as you said, maybe they're not going to have the PI as soon as uh, the buff happens for them. 50 seconds on the PI right now. It It'll might actually work out. Yeah, it actually will work out because of the RP that takes a little bit of time here. So it looks like Perplex will have all cooldowns available except Bloodlust. Neither of the teams will have Bloodlust available for the damage phase, but they have everything else. They're going to have Incarnation. They're going to have, have Combust. They have Army from the Unholy DK, and they have the PI too. This is just so close between those two teams. Eight seconds of an advantage for Perplex coming into Odin here. And remember, this boss dies at 80.5%. So that health bar, a little bit, you know, you have to make sure, you have to remember, 80% death timer time here for the boss. It's going to be very, very close. Mandatory have to pull out a ton of extra damage to make this work. Neither of the teams are going to be focusing down these obliterators whatsoever. They just need to get as much boss damage out as possible. The health bars are so insanely close together, but it's all going to come down to this buff timer and how much burst damage they can get out here. The buffs are out for Perplexed. They get to their markers in their now angels with a damage increase for the next 30 seconds. Is that enough for them to burn the boss down? The buff's out for Mandatory as well. It's going to be a pure DPS race to the finish. 
There we go, with both teams using absolutely everything to blast the boss. And you can see Perplex actually quite a lot ahead on the boss already because they got that buff earlier. And we do know Odin dies at 80%, so 4 more percent for Perplex to go, 3%, 2%. This boss is just dropping so quickly for Perplex, and I think it might be Perplex that is finishing off Odin in just a second here. And oh my god, I mean, this was just so incredibly close as Perplex does finish off the boss here. 18 minutes, 42 seconds clear. Uh, even tie, uh, I mean, tying up the series here against Mandatory, and wow, all of these games are just so incredibly close. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. This is exactly what we want. We want the teams to play this close. Perplex getting the win in map number two and uh, handing Mandatory their first map loss of the MDI Global Finals here this weekend. So we have got a series on our hands, as they uh, like to say, I suppose. And uh, there was a lot to talk about with that, uh, that last one. It was so tight from start to finish, but uh, we've got some replays that uh, Dranos will be able to enlighten us about what stood out to him. Yeah, I mean, this was one of the closer maps we've seen here, although Mandatory actually were moderately ahead for most of this dungeon. Uh, starting with this death coming in for Perplexed and uh, taxing their battle res, slowing down their first pull. That was something that was, uh, was definitely not great at the beginning of the dungeon, uh, but credit to them for being able to, s to stick with it, right? To keep it going through the rest of the dungeon. The Herja pull, we saw neither team utilizing the inversion tech, right? Uh, having the boss cast the wrong mechanics on each side. Uh, and instead they were just doing the boss uh, as it does, right? Sanctify on the holy side, keeping, keeping the mechanics uh, on the sides that they're supposed to be on. Uh, and then thundering timing was something that was a little bit awkward here. You could see for mandatory... They kept getting these thunderings right at the end of these pulls, and that was something that I think let Perplexed stay within that 25, 30 seconds. There kept being just these awkward, awkward thundering timings for them that, uh, for, for mandatory, that let Perplexed stay nice and close, uh, getting these big pulls working. You could see just the, the amount of value they were able to get there, a full thundering onto the boss rather than having it right at the end of, of cleaning up the trash, right? Uh, but, of course, the big thing that, that ended up costing Mandatory in this one was failing to get the three kings, or failing to get the four kings, right? Just doing the three kings, that was the whole reason that they ended up losing this one. If it hadn't been for that, I think they probably win by 30 seconds, maybe maybe 45. Uh, they gained these incremental advantages in the rest of the dungeon. They maybe would have gained even more if Thundering had worked out just a tiny bit better for them also. Uh, but... The kings, it's just so costly if you if you have to do, you have to nuke one down, then activate the last one, you're losing so much value. So, uh, yeah, this is, that's the reason they lost this one. But, you know, if you're, if you're a mandatory fan, I think you've still got to feel pretty good about them in this series, because other than that, I think they looked solidly ahead in this dungeon overall. Yeah, it was a little bit slower time than uh, they showed us yesterday when they won this map over Legendary, uh, mandatory that is. Um, both teams a little bit slower than that 18-21 uh, time we saw in uh, day number one, but still a solid time. Uh, Numbers-wise, looks like things, yep, even-ish across the board, kind of what you'd <laughs> excuse me, expect to see. Yeah, absolutely right. We see the, uh, <laughs> the damage meters here. Pretty much everybody's is, is is competing with their counterparts. A little bit of, of, of gaps there uh, between a few of them, but sometimes that's just a case of like, oh, this person is uh, assigned some more responsibilities here, or oh, this person's uh, cooldowns just lined up a little bit better, ended up uh, you know being being busy with more kicks and stuff. So the overall damage definitely very very close right between the two teams, of course, as you'd expect because they killed all the same mobs by the end of the dungeon. Yeah. Well, let's talk about our next uh, map. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about Shadowmoon Burial Grounds. This is where we're going for map number three between these two teams. Now, yesterday, Perplex did win this map against Sloth with a time of twelve fourteen. So, pretty speedy timer for uh, mandatory to have to deal with. And uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I guess it could be another close one. It could be Perplex possibly moving on to face Echo. And I don't know. I mean. It'd be kind of surprising to see Mandatory get knocked down to the lower bracket. But then again, it's kind of surprising when anybody gets knocked down to the lower bracket uh, this weekend. But it's it's got to happen. It's just the nature of the beast, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Again, we were talking about it earlier already. All eight teams 
insane in their own right, and we're seeing it once again today. Of course, already both of our upper bracket matchups going to a game three here. This one ending on the Shadow and Barrel Grounds. Like we already talked about, Perplex does have a pretty quick time, but they had some weird strategies we were talking about yesterday where they do very different pulls into Knowledge compared to other teams and then end up in Vizpotting after the boss, which is definitely a little on the weird side where you're seeing teams double pull the trash right yeah. behind Knowledge instead. So they have the fastest run, right? We've seen SPG be mm -hmm. uh, played yesterday and today um, multiple times by teams. And Perplex does have the fastest clear with their 12 minutes 14, even though they had two deaths against Sloth. Mm -hmm. So they can probably go a little bit quicker even. So yeah, as you said, the strategy is a little bit weird, but it does seem to be working out when we look at the timers at the end. Yeah, it was a solid time but put up yesterday. And uh, Mandatory didn't have a chance to play that one, obviously. I don't believe, yeah, it was not banned either, so first time we'll be seeing it. Obviously, they probably have a good plan going into it, but it's all coming down to execution today. I think we've seen good plans from every team in every dungeon, but the question is, you know, who is able to ex execute theirs as crisply as possible? We're going to find out in just a moment as the dungeon gets starts, who moves on, who gets knocked down to the lower bracket. Let's find out. So it does we're look back like to not uh, having mirror comps. Yeah, exactly. We, I think the SVGs in general, we've seen almost all teams that played against each other in SVG just completely disagree with their, uh, with their comp. So we see the Prod Warrior and Mandatory side in combination with the Disc Priest and the Fire Mage, while Perplex is running the Shadow Priest instead, but they are playing the Prod Paladin and um, they are playing the Evoker. So this is very interesting, right? Because they already have the Bloodlust on Perplex side from the Fire Mage. So they technically could play the Disc Priest if they wanted to and bring another damage dealer, but they don't want to. They want to have that oppressive roar from uh, the Evoker and the extra interrupt that the Evoker is bringing us as well. And I think they are specifically running this comp so they can do the five spider pull onto the bridge that we're going to see after the second boss because they have those extra interrupts on their side. But first, we have to keep an eye on this initial pull that both the teams are doing where they pull a lot of trash onto the first boss here. The other thing I've heard as well from people who actually play tanks, so, you know, not us, is that prop paladins technically have a better time with this first pull in terms of how much damage they can do and how, how much more easily they can live it. We've seen so many times prop warriors just instantly go down too many just too many of those void slashes coming out you know right at one after another of course they can't happen at the same time due to the way the mobs work but it's just very very dangerous for them but looks like it's not an issue for either of the tanks regardless of the tank they play here now the big thing to look out for which is something that has killed a lot of players is that bone mender does a shadow word frailty go off at the bad time they do not get one during the dark eclipse for either team so they don't have to worry too much about a player just getting one shot by that and it looks like they're mainly through the boss here. Any frailties at the last second going to go out for either team? Doesn't look like it, but a slight lead for Perplex after the first boss here. But this is where things are going to differ for the strategies. We know Mandatory likes to go straight through to Knowledge, but Perplexed is going to be rooting, mass rooting these mobs at the top. They also throw an avalanche out just for safety as well. Just stack up those roots. And now... Pulling all four Exhumed Spirits, plus a couple at the bottom here with the Exhumers, and they're pulling these into Nalish, going to burn these down, get a little bit of free cleave on them, and then of course, once they get into the Soul Split phase, those mass rooted mobs at the top will, will make their way down towards the boss, so they don't have to worry too much about the casts on them, they don't have to worry about not having that interrupting AoE shout that the Warrior brings, that they don't have because they have a prop paladin, and they'll be able to cleave the, the, the adds down just like Mandatory will be able to do on their side. A little bit of an interesting idea, making the prop paladin a little bit more viable in this dungeon. I just saw uh, Ryzen put a time dilation on Swack for Perplex, and he ended up being in wrecked stagger. So <laughs> taking so much damage on the Shadow Priest there. Did manage to survive though, and using Vampiric Embrace to assist a little bit with the healing that was required before they got this um, downstairs space. And now you can see all of these mobs are just standing there for a little while, but they have to finish them off before they start casting again. You can see Mandatory now in a similar phase. Uh, everyone popping their cooldowns now, Combust um, and Incarnation being used by the Feral and the Fire Mages. And then we also see PI being used by the Disc Priest and the Shadow Priest for each team. But yeah, Perplex, because they dealt, or because they did this pull a little bit quicker, because they did not skip, 
the trash, they actually managed to engage Nalash a little bit earlier, and that meant that they actually got a little bit more damage onto the boss. But it looks like Mandatory is actually catching up. They might actually be finishing the boss first. Yeah, it looks like the difference in comp is helping out a little bit here. Of course, that in Holy DK bringing a little bit more single target damage compared to the comp on Perplex side. That has been the advantage of bringing the Unholy DK in this dungeon that we've seen from past weekends as well. So, yeah, not surprising. Mandatory able to just eke out a little bit of an advantage here, but it's not much here. About a 10 second swing from the end of the first boss to the end of the second boss here. Now, of course, the other thing is that Perplex does need to make up a little bit of trash count here because they did a differing pull from Mandatory. It just gives them a tiny, tiny bit less trash, so they're going to have to pull... You know, one extra thing here near the end of the dungeon here compared to Mandatory. It might just end up being the Spiderlings behind Bone Maw. If Mandatory doesn't end up doing that, it might be the two monstrous core spiders at the bottom, which would be a lot of extra trash count. We'll have to see what the plan is here. However, both teams still very close together as they make their way towards Bone Maw. Yeah, all eyes and perplex to see if they can pull this off because we know the perplex is pulling five spiders here uh, into this worm. It looks like Mandatory, though, is doing. Pretty much the same thing as they also also engage the spiders on the right side. So lots of interrupts that are required here. Because these spiders cannot be disrupted. You can use AoE stuns or knocks or disorients. You have to use interrupts to deal with those. And mandatory does have less interrupts on their group. They do have a priest without an interrupt, and they don't have the advantage of having this prod paladin. And that's why they actually had a cast going off there. But it looks like oh, they managed Lord. to survive it by using okay. dwarf racials and by just healing through it. So that one looked a little bit sketchy for mandatory there, but they did manage to survive. They cannot have any more casts going off though, because it can be incredibly dangerous. Perplex, though, looking a little bit better as they had no cast going off so far, at least. Yeah, there was a little bit of a change coming into this pull for mandatory. They had to change the way they pulled this at the very start. They they focused down that very first corpse spider very, very quickly so that they would have enough interrupts to get the remaining four corpse spiders down with no necrotic burst, and that means that their focus damage on the worm was definitely lower than Perplex, and you can see Perplex on that pull was able to actually kill the worm faster. The prop paladin just making that pull a little bit safer or perplexed here, and they've once again slingshotted a little bit ahead coming into the second carrion worm. This is just a neck and neck race from both teams. The strategies are similar, but it's just tiny little things from pole to pole that are making the difference. Yeah, this is just so incredibly close. We do see some of the debuffs go off onto the players, which is not ideal. We can see Perplexed uh, having a debuff go off on Wolf Disco, not being able to dispel. That means you have um, that reduction and that slow, plus the damage that the debuff does as well on top of that. But it looks like Perplex did finish off the trash a little bit quicker, but they still have to finish off the worm. And that's the only thing that really matters, because those bats, you can just move them with you onto the boss if they're low HP. So not too big of a problem. Perplex now did pull the extra trash, and they're going to be engaging Bone Mine in just a second. We see Mandatory doing the same thing. Oh, Both of the druids um, just jumping over there and pulling them back. Skylark, unfortunately, standing to the side of that wall. That wall does provide line of sight. He did get hit by both of the Necrotic Bursts, so he had to commit his Dwarf Racial there. Not sure if that was on purpose. It definitely looked like a mistake. He won't have the Dwarf Racial if another Burst does happen to go off during the fight here. That'd be a massive blunder from him if that did happen, but it is one safety tool gone for them as they head into Bone Maw. Both teams on Bone Maw, but still, again, from the previous pull, tiny advantage for Perplexed here. About a 5-6% to 6 HP advantage on the boss here, so not a lot between the two teams yet again. It's like a mirror match from that Halls of Valor. It's just DPS races off to the races here on Bone Maw here. So, so close together. A shine actually does go down because there's multiple casts going oh no. off on a shine and a spider cast went off as well. He did shape shift off of the bat um, debuffs, but there were just that more is, and more unlucky. casts going onto a shine. Uh, they have a battle rest available and they did get him back up, but they didn't have a class that can actually battle rest. Actually, wait, it was divine at battle rest, but of course the tank has to commit a lot of holy power to actually surviving, so it took for uh, them a while to get him back up, but now he is back. And yeah, that cost them a little bit of time. They were ahead in boss damage. Bone Maw was lower for Perplex until a shine went down. And now Mandatory did catch up a little bit. They're still behind for Mandatory. But yeah, it's looking a lot better for their side now with the five seconds death, uh, death penalty in favor of Mandatory. That's probably... I mean, that could definitely come into play here if Mandatory is able to keep it safe shine. and keep it clean. A shine dead again! 
Once again, a shine goes down. What is going on on the side of Perplexed here? Mandatory now running away on Bone Ma here. The gap has opened up. They were similar on HP pools until just now. Mandatory Bone Maws does go down, and we'll see what the damage is going to be here. Perplex still have 15% of that HP pool to burn through, but Mandatory is off. They're on to the blueberries already. Perplexed, they're so far behind now. Looking at the trash percentage, Perplex does have enough trash, right? I still don't... I know the count, but I'm not sure on the percentage, because Mandatory is, al is already at 97%, but Perplex only at 93.67. Do you know if that's enough or if they maybe had a mob snap or fall into the water or something because we've seen that happen before sometimes if you do this backwards pull some of the bats or spiders can fall into the water and then it's hard to get them back up but uh yeah mandatory so far ahead now they definitely do have enough trash on mandatory side they are finishing off the void spawns back to back because they have raging and they only have one sooth on their team they do not have the evoker with um the oppressive roar so they have to really focus down one of them so they can soothe the void spawn because it is a 10 second cooldown but they did it perfectly perfect execution by mandatory here not getting any raging casts off by those void spawns mandatory already on to nerzul, nerzul just this boss between them and an upper finals berth tomorrow in a top guaranteed top three finish perplexed doing their best to finish off these void spawns as much as possible but i do not think their fate is in their own hands anymore it's all going to come down to mandatory can they play this boss clean we've seen plenty of mistakes happen on this boss it's not tyrannical but it's a high key level things could still go wrong here you do need to make sure you have good baits on the void zones you have good baits on the frontals you do need to Make sure you burn the Rituals of Bones as well. And you can see where the difference is now. A 20% boss HP difference opened up for Mandatory. Can they hold on? Yeah, it's looking so good for Mandatory. You can see Bloodlust coming up in just a second. They have all cooldowns available. We have the PI. We have the Combustion. We have Incarn coming up in 16 seconds for Maystein. They're not waiting for it. They're just popping that Bloodlust. Maystein can just uh, use the Incarn in just a second. They have the army ready as well for RX. You can see the PI is on Crims. And you can see Crims is even standing in the Omen because his rune is on the floor there so just healing through the damage there so we can get some more boss damage in and it's just looking so incredibly good by mandatory executing this dungeon so cleanly perplex trying to save their bloodlust for the best possible moment but mandatory is running away with it that gap that 20 percent gap has now opened up to almost 50 percent on the boss and with the boss now below 10 percent mandatory has punched their ticket into the upper finals they'll be playing against echo for a chance to get to the grand finals tomorrow, mandatory. What a series from them. Played so well. Be moving on. Seriously. It was the slimmest of margins. Just a couple deaths from perplexed, uh, unlucky, as you might have heard, for a shine to get targeted by a bunch of things at once. But that happens every once in a while, and it takes you by surprise, and it costs you those valuable seconds, and sometimes it costs you a spot in the upper bracket finals against Echo. But that said, Perplex moving down to the lower bracket is uh, far from the end of the road for them. We're going to move to that over lower bracket a little bit later today. For now, though, mandatory taking the win. Yeah, this was actually, I, th I think, how I expected this series to go, although I was surprised by just how it went. It, I mean, the teams are just both so, so very good. I did love this, uh, again, the, the strategic difference that we're seeing between these teams, right? The stuff that the Paladin's enabling, the interrupts that you're setting up on pulls like this, right? Uh, the way that you can kind of get these pulls together, bring in those extra exhumers and, uh, and casters and stuff. It's all, it's all allowed because you've got Divine Toll and you've got... You've got your you've got your Avengers shield, right? Uh, whereas on the side of, of mandatory, you instead have this. You, you know, you're you're still doing something massive here, but you got to time it out a little bit differently. You've got to have a couple more people using their stuff to be able to get everything grouped up. You do still have that very powerful AOE silence as well, but that can only be used once every minute and a half. So here you can see that there's just so many casts involved in this pull, right? You have these bats, you have these spiders, you have this void bolting exhumer in the back, right? And all these casts are just going off. Now, somehow, 
uh, they were able to heal through this, right? This is this is something they were able to live. They were able to, to get through, but you could see just the health just getting chunked by all these different mechanics for them. Whereas over on this side, right, you can see all of these spiders, all these casts, even with a cast going off, you've just got these dwarf racials as well. You've got dwarf racials, disease dispels, and everything is just gone, even with a spider cast going off. They just have so many interrupts and so many <laughs> tools to use if an interrupt uh, gets missed that they'll be able to just, uh, to just get through there. Of course, though, the series really did pivot. Again, these teams, we're, we're seeing them come to these dungeons with different comps, different strategies, different ideas, and both be so, so close. And then it just comes down to, you know, one team has a, a couple deaths here or there, or one team fails the four king thing. And because these two teams are within a few seconds of each other, uh, that minus 20 second event is all that it takes for uh, for one team to take a lead there and to take a victory. So... I think that means, you know, if you if you replayed this series 10 times, I think you'd probably have these teams splitting the series probably 5-5 five and five or something like that. Some It wouldn't be much much more lopsided than that. These two teams were both so very close. Ended up being 45 seconds apart here off of those two deaths, but uh, really the whole series just just unbelievably close. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the execution zone, right? Like, we're in the... We're at the point where it really does come down to those individual deaths, you know, which is great. I love that we're at this point already this early in the yeah. MDI Global Finals, you know? It, it reminds me of something you'd see when two really good teams were playing each other in previous MDIs, but the difference is that this time they're playing different comps, right? Like this is, this is that sort of yeah. feel of like, oh, they've, they've perfected the strat, and now it's just coming down to execution. Except unlike before, it's they've they've perfected different strats than each other, right? They've got different teams, different routes, uh, multiple different different specs involved in these runs, uh, which is just so cool. It's so cool that that there's still just disagreement about what the best thing to be doing is in these dungeons. Yeah, absolutely, and and even the results don't necessarily like settle those disputes too, right? Because you see very equivalent times with different compositions, so the arguments that each uh, side are making seem pretty legit, don't they, Nagura? Yeah, it definitely. I mean, all of those teams have played just so incredibly well, and seeing even teams that none of us really chose as like the favorites to win this tournament, tournament just winning dungeons against you know teams like echo uh, and not just by you know echo making mistakes just completely just winning them right like the court of stars we've seen earlier with the four damage dealers no healers in there just completely like having a better route having a better strategy it's so cool to see i just absolutely love this global final so far just so close between those two between all of the teams and also seeing so many like absolutely new strategies coming out from everyone that's right so our bracket at the moment is as follows. As you can see, it's Echo versus Mandatory in the semi-final in the upper bracket, or you could call it the winner's final, whatever you want to do. Meanwhile, down in the elimination bracket, that's where we're going next. Thundered versus Donuts, Legendary versus Sloth. The winners of those two matches will move on to face either Perplexed or Cheese, depending on kind of where they're at in the bracket. So at least Perplex and Cheese get to skip around in the elimination bracket, but it is scary for anybody down there but I think we're in for some really great matches, Ironic. Oh, dude, this is the best part of the weekend. When we've got so many good teams, it's elimination time. Our next four matchups, four teams going home back to back to back to back. And looking at the bracket, it's hard to imagine we're going to send four of those six teams home, but it has to be done. I mean, I don't know. I, I have no idea who's going to come out of that lower bracket. Yeah, in the next few hours, we cut the number of teams in the global finals in half so should be a pretty great time but uh i believe that means it's time for us to take a quick break and when we come back we'll get things kicked off with the elimination bracket so do not go anywhere the pressure gets real when we come back here at the dragonflight Gro uh, global finals here on the mdi we'll see you in just a few
Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals. I'm your host, Double along with Dratnos Makes and Zyronic, and it's time. It's time to move in to the elimination bracket, and here's where things get real. Here's where we send teams home. They made it this far, and that's a great accomplishment, but now they have to fight for their lives. We're going to start things off with Thundered versus Donuts. Interestingly enough, Thundered taking a game off of Echo. What map did they win? Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. Donuts taking a map off of Cheese. What map did they win? Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. I don't know if we're going to have that one in the series or not, but both teams finding a little bit of uh, success on it this weekend. So who knows? Either way, I think uh, all these matches at this point are fairly unpredictable. What do you think, Max? Uh, I think so. I mean, we could have that Shadow Moon Barrel Grounds in there. It is one of the five maps that we have. We don't know if anyone is going to ban it. A guaranteed map that we have is going to be that Knock It. Ooh. And looks like, yeah, that second dungeon will be Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. So we'll see who's going to reign supreme there. But first, we're going to go into that Knock It. And then the 20 Azure Vault as a third option for us. Saru, you look like I you like don't agree with the bans? No, I love okay. this map lineup. I uh, I hope we get a game why three is because that? a game three a game three Azure Vault to see who goes home. Oh, that could be a good one, especially if they have differing strategies. One team goes frogs last, one team goes boss last. That would be so sick. But of course, we have to get there first. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we have the knock it first. We've been seeing a couple ways to approach that Azure Vault, so I'm sure we'll talk about that if we get that far. Just to, to give you a quick Shadow and Burial Grounds update, because we will be seeing that one. Uh, it was a little bit quicker time for Thundered, actually. They uh, managed to finish in 1227 versus the 1250 from Donuts. So there you go. Take that as it will. May not matter today, but that's where things are numbers wide. But Dratnos is Naku defensive starting things off. Um, this is one where, you know, again, we're looking for kind of like, what's the deviation? What's the innovation? And yesterday it seemed to be trying to bring a lot more onto the bosses than before. Yeah, this is a map where with bolstering active, you have some somewhat nasty trash pulls, but one of the nice things about bolstering is that it doesn't affect bosses, right? So one thing you can always do that, especially when we had like Sanguine was the, that you couldn't do as much, uh, was safely pull a bunch of trash onto bosses. So... I think we're going to see teams absolutely looking for different or good ways to kill a totem, activate the Raging Tempest, take one or two trash packs onto the Raging Tempest, uh, take trash packs onto Tira and Maruk, activate Granith early by killing those three Lance Master pulls that need to be killed before it spawns, and then take one or multiple pulls into Granith as well. And so far, we've seen a lot of divergence from our teams in terms of just how many pulls total are you doing? Like, are you just starting with those three Lance Master pulls, or are you doing two plus another pull, and then the last one plus another stuff, and getting a little bit more count, but spending a little bit more time in that area? Uh, I think Knockit is it's very unsolved, and it's very important to have a good strategy there, and also, of course, important to execute it well, important to just manage your bolstering well, uh, and avoid dying to any of the many different abilities that can kill you on those pulls. Now, compositionally, there's also something to talk about there, too, because you talked about the dungeon being unsolved. That's not only the route we're talking about. That's also talking about the compositions, too. So, Makes, I'm going to ask you, um, compositionally, what do you think has been working so far uh, in the patch, in the dungeons we've seen, in Nakud, maybe specifically? Yeah, so I think something we've seen so far is that the best Nakud was 17 minutes, 36 seconds coming out of mandatory, and they basically played the comp that we've been seeing for the entire MDI this season, which is the Prot Warrior, the Preservation Evoker, the Shadow Priest, the Feral, and the Unholy DK. And I think that's probably what we're going to see. Now, some teams, notably teams like Sloth, prefer going for that Resto Shaman here, so I still think that's an option. I'm not hmm. sure if we're going to see the Prot Paladin. I think Dratnos knows more about the intrigues of of tank things, yeah. so maybe we're going to get a surprise, <laughs> but it doesn't look like oh, it. No paladin so far. Two warriors as we get things started between uh, Thundered and Donuts. Yeah, the, the warrior is just so good in this dungeon because you've got Spell Reflect for the, the the Raging Tempest and for Balakar Khan, so two bosses, you just do so much damage with that. Very hard to get away from that as your tank pick. Looks like we're going to see Donuts actually... Are they angling to get that 7-pack? No, okay, no, that's not the 7-pack. They're, they're going to be getting the triple Lance Master pull going. Thundered also setting up there. You can see Bazook using Rescue to bring Maskin up on top of the 
hole there. That's going to prevent mm -hmm. these war spears from charging, which is a very powerful little bit of tech that I think both teams, yeah, you can see Stove uh, yeah. using it for Donut's similar strategy here. Now what you need to keep in mind, we're seeing it on the side of Thunder right now, is in the left corner is if Thundering comes up during that time, which it normally does because it's a very first pull, then you need to clear it. You can't just let your shadow be up there. I mean, technically, maybe, depending on how they spawn. But how they deal with it is the Shadow Priest actually grips whoever they want to clear with up there. In that case, I believe oh. it was the Preservation Evoker. And in that way, both of them clear that buff, make sure it's all safe and sound, and the team can continue. It's really, really cool to see it. I'm, I get excited every time it happens. Look at this. So Thunder actually had mass rooted almost all of one of these ballista pulls over to the side because the thing that spawns the boss is the, the Lance Master dying. The other trash actually I don't think is required to be killed. Uh, and so they just had that mass rooted over to the side. I think Donuts were doing the same thing as well. Uh, so they're going to be now taking these massive pulls. And yeah, the team's on very similar strategies here. You can see exact same trash count, exact same enemies mass rooted. Uh, and they're going to be taking those four mobs plus that patrolling middle five pack into Granith here. This is a scary fight uh, with these extra mobs involved as well. If anybody gets hit by any of those like arrow swirlies or, or even just the arrow frontal here uh, at the same time as one of Granith's shards of stone, that could be pretty lethal. Looks like they're doing a good job, though, of keeping this alive. Vampiric Embrace and Nature's Vigil, though, is falling off now for both teams. Yeah, exactly. The damage continues, though, as the packs have not died up yet. Thundered dealing with it a little bit quicker from what I could tell there for a second. Both teams using the root from the Druid from the Feral, making sure that these saboteurs don't go anywhere. They don't really want to deal with them too much, don't want to sacrifice any, any damage that could go into another target. And now for Donuts, the trash is also slowly dying off. There's a lot of damage going out. Timber needs to fear for his life there for a couple of seconds, but I think he can sa save himself, get back to full HP in a couple seconds. Hopefully Thundering going to come in and assist Donuts here on the same side. Thundered also having Thundering and looks like they're just a teeny tiny bit faster, 4% boss HP in the lead. Yeah, they are going to get a couple of seconds off of this boss one split. Donuts not only have the boss to finish off here, they actually do have a plane stomper they still need to kill as well. So once they kill that, all right, yeah, it's, it is about, uh, about an eight second advantage here for Thundered. So not a huge lead, not the kind of lead we expect will... I mean, we, usually we see teams make at least a, a 10 second mistake somewhere in the run, right? But if the, if, I mean, if they're perfectly we're clean only from here. three minutes in, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let's, let's, let's wait a little bit on, on whether or not that happens. But I do want to say that so far in the global finals, competition has been so tight that sometimes throughout the entire run, you don't really see any major mistakes or differences and teams just speed through it and, and close it in within a couple of seconds of each other. But now we're on to the next big pull and you can see it once more in the overlay. The defensive cooldowns from the DPS players are lighting up, which means Nature's Vigil and that Empiric Embrace are currently helping trying to get these pulls cleanly done. While of course the healer also wants to do a little bit of damage, not doing too much here in these packs because of the nature of them. You also need to do a bunch of healing, but Thunder's still in the lead for what it looks like. Yeah, this is a very scary pull. It does look like they're going to be able to clean it up, though. So are Donuts. Donuts actually having a little bit higher DPS numbers, at least on their Death Knight. Although the rest of the group pretty equal, actually. And Thunder do indeed still finish off first here. It looks like that eight second lead is about how much they still have here. So both teams equally fast on that pull. But now we have a deviation. Thundered have gone left after that. They've gone uh, up further away from the entrance of this area, whereas Donuts have instead gone to the entrance. They're going to be taking this Kodo pull into this first totem. Now, this is something we've seen a lot of teams do and then kill the totem and then take the remnants onto the boss. Donuts, because they're doing it now, aren't going to have that option. So we'll see what they do later. Whereas Thundered might still be planning to do the same pull that Donuts are doing, but take the end of it into the boss after they finish off the Storm Surge totem. Yeah, exactly. That's something I really, oh. really like and I hope we're going to see. Well, let's see. 
they're walking okay. over to this totem and taking the Kodo pack into it, from what I can tell. They still need to do the other totem, though, right? They have one more totem after this. Yeah, so this is the same pull that Donuts are doing right now, except Thundered have gotten that pull behind Raging Tempest now taken care of. But this is an interesting yeah. strategy. They're kind of zigzagging across the boss, right? Uh, they, they went all the way through the middle of the boss room, which... In terms of travel time in this dungeon, it's not a big deal because you're dragon riding around anyways, so you're pretty quick to get wherever you're trying to go, but it is a little bit slower than just going around. Oh, what, <laughs> but Donuts are doing the same thing in reverse here. Now Donuts are going to the back pull first, so both teams are probably planning to pull that right-hand side pull into the boss once they finish off the totem. They've just disagreed about the sequencing of the two previous pulls. Thundered's certainly in the lead right now, though. Thundered seems to have opened up a little bit more of a time advantage than they were were having previously here. Maybe their cooldowns lined up a little bit better against the pulls because of the sequencing they did. Yeah, maybe they did. We're going to see whether or not they can take this trash into boss. Of course, they're focusing the totem here to actually make the Raging Tempest spawn. After that, they can just grab that trash and carry it over. But there's not much HP left on these. <laughs> the, by the time they have walked over, they're already dead. I think it's only the Squall and maybe the Arcplate that is going to remain alive to actually get there to do with the boss. And they now have procced Thundering, which to me screams, pull that boss, because you do want that extra damage whenever you can get it. So that's really, really nice to use it here, even though they have to clear in just a couple of seconds seeing it here on the Souk. Donuts still dealing with that totem pack, and while the totem is melting, they're a little bit behind Thunder now, and I would say it's it's not a tiny lead anymore. It's still a little lead, but not a tiny lead. Yeah, it's tough because you can't really point to anything that that visibly went wrong for Donuts, right? Like they they didn't have any deaths, they didn't have any mobs do any any weird stuff, anything anything different going on, but somehow they are just falling behind here as they are going to get this boss pulled. But they are now more than 20% of a boss's health bar behind. And that has got to be something that they will not be happy about watching this back later. In terms of count, I think they're going to end up at about the same count here. Maybe they're actually going to come out of this area with a tiny bit more count. Maybe they grab one more side pack. So maybe that's the advantage that they're going to be getting here. So if they can convert that into some advantage in the Tira and Maruk area, maybe this will end up being worth it. But... I feel like Thundered have definitely gotten a, a little bit of an edge in the first few minutes of this dungeon. Yeah, definitely right. I've been watching the buffs on the side of Thunder. You know how teams try to min-max these and try to keep them rolling without losing any. And for Thunder, that was only possible for Baby, their unholy DK. Mm. We're going to see whether or not Donuts can get them up there. Timber has six, Cryptics has ten. If you can find an orb instantly, but it is going to run out stove. However, managing to keep this buff up at least for the site of Donuts. So pretty even here, both only have one DPS that is going to keep that rolling. And Thundered, they're speeding through this. The Raging Tempest down to 5%. They're going to keep on rolling with that and then move on to the Ahana area. Now the question is how big do you go on those mounds, right? We've seen double mounds before. Is there any chance, and I'm asking this for me and Twitch chat, where we are going to see a triple mound pull? I don't think it's realistic to, to go for that here on 21 Fortified Bullstring. It's Maybe not impossible, not. but it, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, the, one of the problems is you just have so many casters coming from so far away from each other. And with a comp like this, you don't actually have a great way to get a bunch of casters that are all over the place grouped up. If you were playing the Prop Paladin and you actually you actually kind of do with Divine Tool, uh, if you use it well, you, you can maybe get that sort of pull actually gathered, but... Here, I, I think it makes more sense to, yeah, minimize the amount of, of pulls you're doing all at the same time from, you know, different parts of the map and try and just grab enemies that start close to each other so you can just get them grouped up quickly and start doing damage. Avoid getting a bunch of bolstering stacks onto some of these dangerous enemies because another problem with this pull from the tank perspective is the enemies that naturally get bolstered here actually tend to be the ones that do a lot of tank damage, the ones that just blast your tank with either Death Bolt or Mortal Strike. Uh, so that is it, it's something that you got to be really careful of, especially on that warrior. Those death bolts can really catch you off guard if you've you got your spell block down. You can die pretty quickly here. So Thundered, 
Does look like about one pull in the lead here, but they did do a, a reasonably small first a pull, and now they're doing again round, yeah. another reasonably small pull here. So if Donuts can go bigger here, maybe they can catch back up. They did. So Donuts actually pulled both mounts, if I saw that correctly. They got the, the first one and the one behind that pulled together, which isn't as easy as you might think because of what you just explained. There's a lot going on. There's front bolts. Your tank is eating a lot of damage. There's interrupts. These death bolt volleys need to be kept under control. And then on top of that, the death speakers, they, they just don't want to move a lot. You can see it right now. They stand somewhere else. They lose out on all of the cleave damage that specifically the Unholy DK and the Feral are so good at. So it, it is a lot of managing that needs to be done. And it looks like that pull did bring Donuts back up there they're finishing nearly at the same time as thunder does yeah look at count right these two teams are now on equal count so i mean it's back to a tied game now now looking at cooldowns both teams have pretty similar access to cooldowns bloodlust is going to be available for both teams as well so usually we see the lust onto tira and maruk with some trash we'll see if either team deviates from that but at this point it's anybody's game. Donuts have actually caught back up off of a bigger pull here. Yips in a little bit of danger. Does fire off the spell block, though, and is going to be fine there. You can see those death bolts just blasting into him. Something he, uh, once that spell block is down, they're going to really want to make sure they don't let all of those cast at the same time. Thundered also working on this pull, but Thundered actually have the mobs a little bit spread apart from each other here. So damage a little bit inefficient. And actually, look at that death speaker. That thing has got a lot of bolstering, sp bolstering stacks now. And Thundered may just have to wait for oh yeah i mean alex is just getting beat up here as well because those warriors have bolstering stacks too those were the mortal striking look mobs at, that i was mentioning earlier look at the difference between those unholy dk's cryptics actually sent his army at the very beginning of this oh. poll and i believe he sent it to down that soul harvester which has a little bit more hp than the rest of them without having pi available so right now that pi is probably going to to smack i would assume um, to just not have to sit on it until they go to boss, or maybe they're going to hold it, whereas Thunder, maybe deciding to actually hold back on that massive single target cooldown and probably going to save it for boss, I think, which might make one less army use overall, which could be big between those two DKs. Yeah, definitely uh, something to look out for. You know, I, I, I've, t I've done a quick look through the gear thing and it seems like the teams are on pretty similar plans with with gearing with talents with all that sort of a stuff itself a few a few slight differences of uh of amulet choices of, of gem choices but definitely something where they're mostly on the same plan but if they're using their army at slightly different times that's going to be something to to see if that affects things yeah absolutely let's see how they go they are moving towards that Tira and Maruk area. I was looking at the pathing a little bit as well because I think it was Legendary who kind of did the mounds backwards starting at the one that's next to boss. This time around both teams seem to be on a similar angle. So you can see Bazook walking over here triggering that roleplay coming back to his team while they try and drag this extra trash into the bosses that are now going to spawn they are very much on track to do that but is donuts going to do the same it looks like it the trash is moving to the bosses the bosses are in their rp for both of those teams and neck and neck they're probably going to start the bosses on the same time with all of this trash on top of it and these bakar you know sometimes they can be a little bit mean right yeah, absolutely. They <laughs> they can be nasty, especially if you get some extras spawning. The biggest threat actually is if you if you let that desecrating roar cast go off, you get extra Bacar that spawn, and your tank won't have threat on them, and they'll often spawn kind of far away and just go and beat up your healer or whichever ranged DPS you know hits them with a dot or something like that. So uh, here you can see some Bacar walking <gasps> in. Actually, it's gonna be thundered. Oh! Having a wipe here. Uh, well, a healer down actually. Okay, two B res is available. They can rest. We could they potentially can. recover this. Yeah. Subchris needs to Sub get out is gonna of land those Feral there it is. form. That's exactly what's going to happen. 
picking back up the team, but Alex in the meantime needs to survive. Sucker is taking a lot of damage during Bloodlust, all of that, losing two of their players very, very painful right after cooldowns. We're gonna see whether or not they can get this back and running. But in the meantime, Donuts, they speed past Thundered. Mm. They did not have any of the issues. Stove taking some of those uh, swirly damages didn't go down, however, so they had full uptime and they're nearly finished with all of these death speakers and Maruk and Tira are also down to 20%. Credit to Thunder for recovering that. You know, they had two players dead. They Which found thing? a safe time to res. Alex was able to live for a while there. Bazook took the res, instantly hit Alex with a time dilation, kept him alive as he then was able to help stabilize the rest of the group. And so Thunder are going to be able to avoid this being a catastrophe, but they are now down 10 seconds of death timer and they've lost all of that advantage they had at the start of this dungeon and then some. Donuts are now solidly in the lead here. 93.85%, that is the magic number. They are ready to take the last two mini bosses onto the boss. And as long as they can execute that reasonably well, as long as they don't need more than their two battle reses, they should be okay here. Look at this from Stove as well. Gets this beautiful, beautiful dismount, keep the momentum going, hit the levitate, come into the boss room, get nice and far up, and maybe even going to land a life grip here. Yep, Rip, life grip's yeah. the, the DK. Now, the DK is yeah, they, usually they, whenever they you that. have a priest and a DK in the same group, it is the, the DK <laughs> that receives those life grips. Uh, somewhat <laughs> mobility challenged is the spec. <laughs> We have little legs, okay? Sometimes we need help from others, and that is okay to accept. But yeah, Donuts Absolutely. are on to the mini bosses here with Balakar Khan, and there is still a little bit of trouble that could happen with that second phase, but it is a 21 for the fight, so the boss shouldn't be as scary as we've seen it in previous weekends. And the Donuts on the back of that, oopsie from Thundered, and I also believe that double mount pull. I really like that from Donuts. I wish Thunder would have done the same. Uh, getting back up here and actually overtaking Thunder. Yeah, this is uh, huge here for Donuts. They now enter the intermission at the same time that Thunder pulls the boss as well. So they are well in the lead. They've just got to hold on, but this is the scariest part of the fight now. You have these four casters that just needs to get grouped up. But they've done such a good job there. Cryptix's death grips into a shockwave, into a deep breath stun. Potentially a blinding sleet coming here. No, it's going to be a disorienting roar. What do we have next? There's the blinding sleet. Stormbolt lands as a single interrupt on the last one. And silence is going to be what Donuts use. They get through those ads and now they're just dealing with the last bit here. And this is where it starts to get nice and quick if you have the Prot Warrior. Yip's going to hit that spell reflect and you can just see him start to climb on the damage done meter there. <laughs> just doing huge amounts of damage with that reflected conductive strike dot. Yeah, and on the left side, I mean, just shouting it out, Thundered, after recovering that issue during the boss, they're also at the intermission, despite the trouble that they had. They're really fast here in this dungeon. I don't think it will be enough in the end, as they still need to get through all of those ads and then back onto Balakar Khan. But definitely shout out to them for recovering the situation, as it was not easy to do that. And it's something that teams specifically also need to practice in some way. Uh, and, and gain that experience on how to recover these pulls and so uh, very very nice to see that here out of her first game in this best of three donuts now downing Balar Karkan. it seems like Balara might stand after the boss has been killed but they go down at the same time and it's a one to zero for donuts that's right donuts managing to take map number one here on the coup defensive uh, but it was close. It was uh, the same comps. It was largely, uh, as, as Ironic and I were talking about it during the game, the same pulls. Uh, but in the end, just a, a couple deaths huh? that made the difference. Yeah, I mean, Thundered was actually playing just a little bit cleaner throughout the first couple of sections of the dungeon. Opened up about a 20 second lead on the second boss over Donuts, but all of that just taken away by the one mistake here. I believe their Raging Tempest was extremely clean, very good. At refreshing the debuffs on the boss here got a very very quick look at the damage meters coming into the boss here two players over 120k shadow priest still doing 100k very very solid damage but it all comes down to what happened on that third boss here and you know i'm not a tank so i'm not a hundred percent familiar with the exact range the bosses need to be apart for them to start getting their buff but as we look at that third boss pull in a bit here 
as they're kiting these mobs around with that big trash pull on top of the boss here, you can see there's a couple of really weird overlaps here. There's a Chant of the Dead that ends up going out that forces everyone to kind of scatter a little bit before this Gale Arrow that comes out. Zook tries his hardest to get Maskin away, is oh, able to get no. him out of harm's way, gets out of all those frontals, but I believe, while Alex was kiting around, the boss might have gained a couple of those damage stacks that it gains if the bosses get too far apart. In the Gale win, just straight up one shots, two players, the healer and baby end up going down. In those 10 seconds of death timer, plus not having those two players alive forces them to play so defensively for the rest of that boss that any advantage they'd gained in the rest of the dungeon just gets eaten up by that one simple mistake from the kiting there on the third boss here. And Donut's able to bring it home in the intermission on Belakar Khan, playing incredibly safe. Just honestly, very, very clean play from Donuts. Much better than what we saw from them yesterday. Yeah, yesterday they still managed to make the match a little bit close. They did take a map, but uh, everything still had a death or two here and there. Today, though, zero deaths to start things off on Naku Defensive. The numbers look good. Can they keep the momentum going uh, in our next map? Shadow and Burial Grounds, that's the one that Thundered had the little bit faster time on yesterday compared to Donuts. So, you know, again, small sample size of one, but still, something to think about going to this next one. Yeah, you can see there actually, you know, normally I don't want to point to the gaff, but you, 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 you can see on that graph there was a huge dip in damage when the players ended up going down there, the peak for peak for donuts stayed high whereas donuts whereas thunder had actually a pretty bad dip when the two players went down so a little unfortunate for them there but yeah looking ahead at the shadow moon i mean all of the shadow moons we've seen so far have been very very tough to predict again extremely volatile dungeon highest key level tough affixes especially with players trying to play different classes compared to what we saw in the cup swapping from the prop warrior to the prop paladin has been a problem for a couple of the teams but it's been really good for other teams you know based on what we saw you said you mentioned it earlier donuts does have a slightly faster time in this dungeon but oh, slightly slower, slower, slower right? it's, you never yeah. know yeah what was it slow? slightly Sorry. slower slightly but with slower zero but deaths, again, though. yeah within the margin which is bad very it very close the together fastest <laughs> true right not the fastest so the, but the fastest yes. svg was mandatory just like 30 minutes ago or, or 20 minutes mm -hmm. ago with 11 right. minutes 45 so that's kind of the time that ultimately they're looking to beat right because you you want to win this tournament so that's what you're looking at and and trying to beat out but between those two teams thunder had 1227 and donuts had 1250 so around 30 ish seconds between those two teams 20 ish seconds well especially bad news for Donuts is that their 1250 was on zero deaths, whereas Thunder's yeah. 1227 was on one death, right? So that indicates to me that the, the Donuts plan, I don't remember if there was anything that went wrong that wasn't causing deaths in their run, but if not, it may, it may just be that they actually are on a 30 second or one minute slower plan, right? Which is, it's kind of a lot. Sometimes we have these things where it's like, oh, this team lost here, but then you look and it was like 10 deaths. And it's like, okay, well, they can avoid that pretty easily, right? But if you're slower on a zero death run, that's often a lot harder to make up that time. Definitely something that uh, Donuts have got to be a little bit worried about, but they've had a day since then to potentially make some adaptations to Shadow Moon. And it's also possible that just that run had other things that slowed it down that didn't cause deaths. Yeah, that could be too. I, I uh, don't recall all the details of why they ended up going at that speed, but could be the route, but to be to be realistic, like how easy is it to remake a route in under 24 hours? Because essentially that's what they had, you know? I feel like at that point you can maybe make little efficiency kind of things, but it's hard to change up a whole section or something like that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah sure. especially because especially you've also got, you know, seven other dungeons you've got to be looking at that uh, right. may have much more glaring weaknesses uh, than, than the Shadow Moon where it's probably at a point where, yeah, you're optimizing for, you know, a few seconds somewhere, whereas maybe you see something where there's a whole new strategy uh, that's a minute faster in another dungeon because all of these teams are so good and they've shown us so much cool stuff so far, but we are going to get to see another set of cool stuff here. We do have, of course, the Prop Warrior, Prop Paladin, Strategic Disagreement uh, on display <laughs> in this matchup. Once again, I, I feel like every Shadowman we've I seen, it's been Prop Warrior one, versus yeah. Prop Paladin, yeah, which is uh, Absolutely. pretty cool. Pretty cool indeed. Our fastest time in this dungeon is off of a uh, 
a warrior, right? So maybe that's good news for Thunder. Maybe the warrior is a little bit faster, but we will see. Yeah, and we had some disagreements in the winds as well, so it's not like... It was always the prot worry that won the map. Uh, it was, I think, half and half so far. But right now, teams are going to fess up for what could be the first game breaking pole in this dungeon. And if you maybe haven't been following the MDI as much, we're going to run down what exactly goes on here. On the right side, you see Smacked, who's bringing one of the sides. And then on the other side, the rest of the team is coming with the other side. So they're taking both of these skeleton armies that are all going to run onto Sadana. Blood Fury thundered, of course, doing exactly the same. This is tried and true for the MDI teams. We now figured this out, and all of them are doing it, and they're completely yeeting their cooldowns into this boss. This is sending everything that they have. If you're looking across our UI, there is probably not anything that will not be on cooldown once this poll is over. Of course, these defiled spirits have to be your priority target here. You cannot have them go through that dark communion. It needs to be interrupted. But so far, both of these teams are doing a great job. Yeah, sometimes with, with this boss, when you have your mage combusting, you can actually grip the spirit under the boss, you know, chains of ice it a couple of feet away, and then let it get that ignite spread onto it and just die to that, which uh, is pretty nice for some of these early sets. But now we're going to get to see if these teams are going to be able to skip the next spirit. It looks like both teams are comfortably ahead of the DPS check here on this 22 Fortified. They are going to get to that Dark Communion, but they're going to be able to just tunnel boss here and move forward. Yeah, as Dark Communion does start for Donuts. Thundered, once again, are going to be killing their first boss a little bit ahead of Donuts, but it's only by three seconds, four seconds this time. Uh, and Donuts actually were pre-positioned further ahead, so they're actually going to be able to get in combat faster afterwards. This is a nice pull for the Prop Paladin as well. Divine Toll just helping you grip all of these mobs together. But Thundered say, you know what? We're not interested in any we of these mobs. <laughs> yeah, we are skipping this whole thing. So uh, they're going to just go all the way through and they're going to be doing probably double onto the boss here. Yeah, yeah it looks like what uh, that's up. exactly what I think we're going to see. And maybe they're even going to grab what they just skipped before we had Mask in be a little bit delayed. And I think he was grabbing it, but I'm not sure if we're going to see that here uh, in this poll. For now, Alex going to charge into both of these packs here, make sure they actually get in motion and come walking out. Because if these get blocked be behind the walls, you actually can have a problem pretty quickly. One of these exhumers was looking out for Mask in there for a second. They need to get everything under this boss and grouped up so that oh. they can see, see it, make sure it's not giving them too many problems. Bazook and Subchris both taking a little bit of damage here, but the boss should cast his soul face in just a little bit. Here we are. And then all of these mobs, they just, you know, they they, they don't want to play anymore. They, they stand there. You're going to have a little bit of time to breathe. You can use that buff that you're getting from that soul phase to completely blast. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be such an important phase here for both teams. Got to make sure that they get these ads oh, dealt with smacked. before they start recasting. But Smacked is going to go down for Donuts. Stove pops the ice block to survive here. They land the battle res. So it's not the end of the world just yet. They get into this soul steel phase as barrier was used there by Timbabaw. Keeping the group alive. <laughs> and Nips comes back up. Paladin, one benefit of Paladin. Okay, so one, one little known one fact about Malish is that the spirits downstairs take bonus damage from either holy or nature and if you're a prop paladin most of your damage is actually holy so uh, you can kill that spirit in one or two globals pretty reliably and get back up and start blasting a little bit sooner a lot of healers also benefit from that and are able to escape nice and quickly using uh, taking advantage of that it's going to be thundered though getting the boss killed first now it's not the end of the world for Donuts. They have more count, right? They did an extra pull. So uh, if they can save some time with that count advantage later, they might still be in this one. But it does look like it is a thundered lead right now. Yeah, I think especially those five seconds from Smack's death there have to be something that pains you now. But let's see how Thunder does. If I'm not mistaken, we're going to see a lot of spiders in the upcoming poll. One is already with them as they're keeping on running and they're going to go down here. We're already seeing the marks on the left side of the spiders as well. And Alex now moving on to the worm. So that's three spiders 
and a bunch of bats that are now also going to come in here on the left side. This pole requires so much cooperation and coordination when it comes to interrupting cast. It is insane. We have seen it yesterday. I believe it was Echo where three of the bat casts went onto the same player. They just didn't have an interrupt and it eventually killed them. So that is something that you need to keep out for. But you can see the damage coming through here from the team. They are ready for this. Nature's Vigil is on. Empiric Embrace is on. They are helping trying to get through this here. And the worm has already been deleted here. And they move on to the next one. Beautiful. Stove actually went down for Donuts on the right-hand side, ended up having to release and is now running back. So Donuts Ooh. further in uh, uh, in pain here, actually are delaying their pull onto the worm potentially because Stove is not here. This is really, really rough for the Donuts. Thundered on the other hand, just chugging away here, working on this worm in a position to equalize this map if they can just hold on for a little bit longer as they have those bats now coming in to the second worm. Which, uh, it's, okay, it's bats and spiders, so I suspect this is the bats and spiders from after? Uh, from, from like, the area after the boss, and somebody ran ahead and grabbed those? I was, I was looking over at Donut's side, so uh, not mm. sure. Yeah, I think that yeah, is exactly maybe. what was happening, but, oh no, maybe that's what Sub Chris I, is going to do I right now. I think it was so maybe the they right just... side going down, right? They, they went back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, going so here, through here that they go, cave, yeah. there are spiders on the left side and there are spiders on the right side and they grabbed the ones that were on the left side, uh, right side still, because the left side they grabbed first. But now they're getting that stair uh, pull here that is going to give them a little bit of extra count if they do it now. And oh. taking this into boss is exactly what they're going to do. And I was going to say that is the most scariest thing that they could do at this point. You can see Bazooka has popped Rapture, trying to get extra shields onto the team, trying to keep them alive and protect it with all of that ASIC spit going out here. You need to keep it under control, though. One of the spiders still has a little bit of extra health, so they need to get that one uh, for a longer amount of time while the bats are also an issue soon enough. The copies from Boma are going to spawn, and they will also add additional damage. It looks like one of the spider casts oh, went through. Maybe oh. going down. They they do have Alex. enough arrest. They can pick him back up. Alex has got to live. As long as Alex lives, this is okay. We get the battle res, but Alex is now painfully low on cooldowns oh. here. Nothing available. Just needs to get healed by Bazook here. And somehow it looks like he's going to be able to stabilize, but that was really nasty. You could see just no defensives were left there for their warrior. Baby ends up getting consumed Inhale. by the worm here as well. That's okay, though. It's actually not the end of the world at this point. They just have the two spiders left. They are going to be able to stabilize here incredibly close there for Thundered. Now they just have 50% of Bone Ma's health to deal with. And this is going to be nice and easy. Look at this as well. So the four members of the team that aren't the tank are all going on the left of the worm here. And the tank is actually going over on the right. That grip. They're baiting out this, uh, this, this pool so that their melee can still hit. But actually, the corpse breath on this boss, it's, it's a frontal, so you can have your tank go on the opposite side as the other four players and avoid some extra damage there, which was what they were doing at the start of that phase. Really nice little uh, micro from Thundered. Yeah, they also had one of the players dodging far away from them before this inhale came through because of all of the body slams. And they found themselves in a position where they probably could get back to the team in a reasonable amount of time to get into that safety zone. So Bazook, once more using that uh, leap of faith, gripping them back into the team right before quaking was super, super cool to see. But Donuts, they're also on Bona and they're trying to blast this boss as quickly as they can. I think they still need to do the stair pull, if I see that correctly there in the background. Yeah. But they are chewing through that boss's HP quite nicely, I want to say. So we know that Donuts likes to take those spiders and bats into the double blueberry pull. It's an extremely dangerous pull, but uh, it's something that it, it has worked out for them so far. That being said, they're at a point in this dungeon now where their fate is not in their own hands. They need something to go wrong for Thundered, but... There's a dangerous pull, and it's followed by a dangerous boss, so there is certainly still room for error on Thundered's side. Bad news for Donuts is that a battle res has just been recovered for Thundered, so a little bit less of a chance of disaster. Thunder just need to hold on for a little bit longer as they work on this double void spawn. No evoker for either team, so only a single soothe available from their druid. 
Yeah, and that means they do have to focus one of the void spawns, exactly what they're doing. The Sooth has already gone out, so they want to focus this one down first, use that Sooth, kill it off, and then focus the other one until that Sooth is back up. And that's exactly how it's going to go down here for Thundered. Top of that, we're going to get the Disc Bubble here. And Bazook trying everything to keep this team alive. He's been running low on mana for like the past 10 minutes, it feels like. But they're very much on track for potentially a very, very good time. We're 11 minutes in in this dungeon for Thundered, and they are arriving at Nurzul now. I believe Bazook might want to sit down, but the team is like, nah. We're, we, we're just going to pull it, you know, you use your mind bender or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got you've got nature's vigil. You've got, uh, well, you've got nature's vigil. So you can use that to, to get yeah, some off healing yeah, done. Nature's vigil. <laughs> yeah. also got Vampiric uh, Embrace. <laughs> that's true, but it's your own Vampiric Embrace. It's a little bit less exciting that's than when true. you have a Shadow Priest with it to help support you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's going to be something where Thunder, I mean, the, the thing is, right, it's a fortified boss. They don't have Grievous or anything active here. So I think they're probably pretty confident that this is going to be enough of a mana bar to get through this one. And yeah, you can see Bazooka's yeah. mana kind of even going up rather than down at this point. Uh, something where, you know, sitting down to drink, that, that sort of time investment is not something that they are interested in doing. And even if Bazook was out of combat, I think he'd rather be casting smites than drinking uh, at the start of this fight. <laughs> they just want to end this dungeon as fast all. as possible because... You know, even even though they had, a lot has gone wrong for Donuts, Donuts are on the same boss now. Donuts are only 30% of the boss behind, but Thundered are going to hit the Lust here to try and close this one out. And if they can do this boss cleanly, 30% is just going to be way too much for Donuts to overcome. Yeah, and then you also have to keep in mind that there is going to be five seconds against Donuts on top of that due to the extra death that they have more than Thundered. And Thundered was holding on to everything for that Bloodlust. We saw the army waiting for the PI, the Bloodlust waiting for the PI, and all of the other cooldowns are going out here with that Bloodlust. And Nerzul is just melting in front of our eyes. This is looking really, really good here. Not their fastest time, but definitely a fast time nonetheless. 5% remaining on their Zul for Thundered, and then they're going to claw out that 1-1, one and, one, and we're going to go yet into another third game. That's right, our yeah. third game three of the day. Uh, this time, between Thundered and Donuts, and it's like we said coming into this one, Dratnos, it's like, it's been so close, hasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Just an incredible, incredible series between these teams. The margins are just razor thin. It is one mistake territory. Uh, and then the, the other today. team is just not yeah. going to let you claw it back. Yeah, it's crazy. Yep. Yeah, it continues to be a, a tight race with all those teams. And again, like the biggest thing on the line ever right now for these teams, right? The, the possibility of being knocked out of the tournament. Whoever loses the next map is out of the MDI Global Finals, ironic. Oh, we're waiting for Zyron to, like to get back, I guess. Crash. So, Unfortunate. Yeah, exactly. Well, Mix, the, the drama is rising not only in the game, but uh, in the anticipation of Zyronic's return. But let's talk about World <laughs> of Warcraft anyway right now. Um, it's When we look ahead, let's look ahead to map number three, the Azure Vault. This is one we talked about kind of going into this series where there's been a lot of different approaches. There's been a lot of like success, failure on it, and... and uh, I'm very curious about what we're going to see from these two teams. I actually didn't go back and see if they ran it yesterday. I should have checked that. Do you know off the top of your head? I'm looking now. Let's uh, see. There was an Azure Vault run by Thundered against Echo. They lost it. Yes. And there was right. an Azure Vault by Perplex and Sloth. But we haven't seen Donuts in that dungeon yet. So yeah, we it was actually see another route. Them. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. One ban. Absolutely. Banned against Donuts as well. So uh, it is definitely going to be interesting. I, I think Azure Vault's got to be my favorite MDI map uh, to, to, well, maybe Court of Stars now, but uh, Azure Vault <laughs> is really cool to see the see the different ways that teams plan this one out. And there's just, there's been like 30 different sequences of trash and bosses that we've seen teams use so far across our four, you know, cup weekends plus the last stand. So, uh, I'm excited to see what donuts have in store for us in this dungeon and how it's going to line up with the Thundered Azure Vault as well. I mean, it is a quick dungeon. It is, it's like a 12, 13 minute dungeon if everything goes well. So uh, maybe even yeah. faster if somebody has a, a new idea that's even better. 
twelve twenty eight for Echo yesterday when they uh, took down Thundered on that map. And I mean, Thundered didn't have any deaths at the end of that one. They just straight up went a lot slower. So that makes me wonder too. I mean, obviously Echo is Echo, but it makes me wonder too if maybe they they looked at that yesterday and they've retooled things a little bit. <laughs> they've maybe made a couple changes to see if they can come back and increase the speed because it seems like they just weren't going fast enough yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot comes down to how Echo approached that dungeon, right? They sure. did a lot of snapping on things where we previously haven't really seen the snaps. So a lot onto Lush. Previously, we've seen some snaps onto Umbral Skull. And I think the way that they handled it with clicks going into Bear, pulling that boss, allowing the rest of the team to actually do damage, while now is up and running and grabbing the rest of the mobs as Tang. Is, is extremely time efficient and one of the things why Echo is Echo. So I, I think there's no blame against you if that's not an idea you had, but maybe after seeing it yesterday against you, you adapt it to it, right? Other than in the last dance, teams can practice and they are reviewing dungeons after each day, trying to see if, if there's anything that they can clean up. So maybe we're going to see a little bit of innovation. Yeah, well, we'll have absolutely. to probably see something, right? Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I just think that it's so cool as well that there's the off-tanking innovation, right? Like, usually in MDI, we, we see the spots where it's like, oh, the healer goes and does stuff, and everybody lives for a while, right? But uh, seeing, like, oh, the tank goes and does stuff, and our druid, you know, pops Heart of the Wild and goes bear for him, right? Like, that's, <laughs> that is that uh, is wild and something that... I am excited to see maybe either these teams use or maybe show up in other dungeons at some point in the future as well. It's one of the exciting parts of the new talent tree is, is like options for doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, it worked extremely well. Well, this is it. Game number three between Thundered and Donuts. The winner moves on to face, uh, I believe it is Perplexed in the uh, next lower bracket match, but the loser of this map is out of the MDI Global Finals. You don't want to go out like that you don't want to lose in the upper bracket then lose right away in the lower bracket but you have to keep in mind too that whoever gets eliminated here it's a significant accomplishment to make it this far right so while i'm sure the teams are both happy about being here neither one wants to go home so we'll see who has it in them to win this next dungeon yeah absolutely i'm really curious uh if teams are going to go all out and do that first poll where they snap everything down onto the tenders that I think is one of my favorite parts other than the snapping and the frog pole in this dungeon. It's like the three things I, I always get excited for. So hopefully both of them are brave enough to, to get it all down there into that boss arena. Yeah, I think yeah, it's very question, likely right? to be something. I, I think both teams are going to do it. That's my prediction. We'll see, though. I mean, I, I feel like you can't, you cannot let off on your, your speed when you're when you know just how close the series is, right? You know that, you know, it's it's one mistake territory, but if you do a smaller pull than the other team, then you you could lose even, even with no mistakes. And that's going to be something that neither team wants to happen. That's one of the worst ways to go out of MDI is, is just wait, having a clean wait, run that was not wait, ambitious wait. enough. Hello? Is this my what? MDI? What's that? <laughs> Stuff is on a hunter? Indeed he is. He's playing a Beast Mastery Hunter, showing us another new spec here. Donuts going to be deploying this, and I wonder what the... Okay, so actually the Power Infusion recipient on this pull is Stove on this BM Hunter as well, just <laughs> pumping up that Beast Cleave, saying, Cryptix, you know what? You can do your unholy stuff. You can do it without that extra haste. You're powerful enough already. Not something that's that needed, so but look, toxic. Donuts are not taking this on to Boss. <laughs> they are just doing this pull upstairs instead, whereas Thundered have already got Boss active and pulled now. They were downstairs and doing all this extra trash, so I think it's going to be Thundered doing this area a lot faster if they can get this pull successfully done, because Donuts did this in two pulls and Thundered have done it in one. The question is, is the BM yeah. Hunter going to be able to carry the damage and, you know maybe uh maybe help them catch back up as a result okay first of all a shout out to stove for that name because honestly we all know it right <laughs> the hunter is a little bit a little bit weak on the surviving part of their kid but 
I am so excited to see that class again. We did see a hunter in that Court of Stars from Empyrean a couple weeks back, and I've been promised some hunter plays. I thought we were going to see it in the Algathar Academy, but seeing it here in the Azure Vault is really, really interesting, and we know that the hunter is able to, to do some snapping, so maybe that's what, what we're going to use it for, perhaps more snaps? Yeah, exactly. I, I suspect that's got to be the plan, right? Because misdirection lets you snap, and you also can sometimes set up some snaps using your pets uh, and and so do, doing some weird stuff like that. You've got feign death as well to drop combat as you need to, so Hunter is as good, if not better, than Rogue at setting up some of these snaps because you also have the ability to do it from farther range as well. So we'll see what donuts have later in the dungeon, but Thunder definitely have gotten the better of this opening in the dungeon. Well, sort of. They pulled a little bit less trash, right? They did one big pull instead of two medium pulls. So they're actually behind by 10% count. So maybe Donuts are okay here. I, I was maybe a little bit prematurely critical of what Donuts are up to here because, you know, getting extra count, that, that is actually really nice, right? That means that maybe later in this dungeon they can, they can drop a pull later. And if that happens, then they absolutely are still fully competitive in this run. They have their Lust rolling right now as well that they are using to just nuke single target damage into Laymore here, whereas Thundered had to Lust their first pull. So it shouldn't affect the amount of Lust they get in the dungeon. They should be able to get one more Lust right at the very end of Umbral Skull either way. So yeah, just going to come down or to what they the have frogs? for the rest of the dungeon. Yeah, or for the frog pull, if they do the frog pull at the end. We'll see what they yeah, decide to do with that. I mean, the, seen. there's so much differences. Right now, Thundered is activating the crystals here, though. So Sloth yesterday, I believe, decided to just run past them and then uh, snap them later on. Thundered opting to play this crystal pull here. I'm curious what Donuts are going to do. Actually, a lot of damage going out here onto Maskin and Bazook, both dropping really, really low, but it is not going to be the end of everything. It is a 20 Tyrannical, so these mobs shouldn't be too scary. Donuts now also finishing off their pull, but like you said, they're roughly 10% trash ahead while being a little bit behind in the overall dungeon progression. Let's see if they do the crystals as well. Yeah, there is that 10% now made up for Thundered. And it looks like Donuts are walking through, although this would be the two players that are just walking through if they weren't going to pull this. It does look like they are going to maybe pull it here. Oh, and maybe Stove is going to let them sneak through here. Okay, Stove himself. Oh, wow. This looks cool. So Stove is going across now, and it actually looks like... It looks like it was Smacked that's let them skip those elementals. So they're just going to be avoiding that entire area. Maybe dealing with it later. And Stove now heading downstairs? What is happening? Stove is heading downstairs. This should be the Fain snap death. angle, right? Fain death, making sure you don't don't have aggro on anything. He was a little bit close to these elementals there. Smacked trying oh, to smacked. follow the crew. <laughs> Poor Ooh, Smacked. He, he got the so slowing cool. wild magic. So he, uh, yeah. he was just waddling through there as fast as he could. <laughs> But now they're just going to be going straight saying, into the Agile area. <laughs> that is indeed a flap. Yeah, a but wild charge Thunder, as well. They're already in this area, and they're already in fight with Azure Blade, with the Lieutenant, and with basically half of the room, or 70% of the room, on top of everything. This is a really, really scary pull. There's so much that's going on. You need to be so careful with killing these off. You can see the stacks onto the group. Master Spell is going to come in and help with the affix continuing here. And now they can actually deal with the adds oh. that have spawned. After that, the boss should die. Donuts on the right side doing the same thing. Oh. Let's see how they do. Oh, Stove ends up going down. Stove res me. No. Gets res, though. He's going to be back yep. up. Living up and to the somehow name. Donuts are looking all right. Thunder are taking a lot of damage here. They've got a lot of Grievous ticking on them as well. Bazook, though, not too worried. Fires off the Radiance, and that's going to be able to do a lot of the work to get everybody out of danger. Alex actually still in danger, but gets back to his Sentinel and is going to be just fine here. And yeah, every single defensive cooldown from both tanks was used to make this pull work out. Alex's bubble faded right as the danger expired as well, so really perfectly timed. The kind of thing that makes you think, huh? If this is a 21, maybe this wouldn't be possible, right? The the cooldowns maybe wouldn't last <laughs> long enough. But here on plus 20, it has worked out here uh, for Thundered at least. 
Donut's still working okay. on the boss. Thunderts are moving ahead here. They have finished that room. And the big question is now, how are they going to approach what remains of the rings and the next two bosses? I've been saying I loved what Echo did with snapping mobs onto Talash. Are we going to see the same thing out of Thundered now that they saw it from Echo? Bazook is down here. We don't know if the rest of the team is here as well. Subchris going into bear form and it seems like they took a page out of Echo's book. Subchris tanking this boss here will allow Alex, who's currently not with the group, to grab what is on top oh. of the ring. But he goes down here. That grip looked maybe a little bit too late but with that death he definitely lost aggro to all of the mobs that they were trying to snap so it's not working out in their favor here yeah i didn't even realize this but subchris not not playing heart of the wild either so able to just do it with bear form itself only bear form enough to be able to uh to let you tank yeah. that a couple of other you know a couple of defensive uh talents taken but not really all that much. Very cool that that's able to uh, able to work for Thunder. And unlucky for them though that Alex died. That's probably a huge, huge time loss. We're not going to have really any so idea sure. just how much time is lost. But I mean, look at so, their count, right? They're at fifty-seven percent count. They need to get to hundred percent count. Yeah, but oh, the thing is, they could still snap it onto Umbral Skull, right? So it's not all lost yet. If they just try to do the snap onto Umbral Skull then they could still get efficient count with a boss together. So uh, it wouldn't sound too bad, but yep, actually going down here for donuts as well. I'm not sure if they were also trying to snap or if that they was were just indeed. A, a falling angle. I'm lucky. It, it, it was, it, it was, uh, they were trying to set up the snap and yips just ended up going down upstairs. So donuts now also not going to be able to get their snap going. They had an opportunity to get back into this game if they had been able to make this snap work, I think they would be in the lead over Thundered. But now, as it stands, they are in the same spot count-wise as Thundered. No other advantages working in their favor. Down in Death Timer and also down almost a full boss worth of time here. So, unless another thing goes wrong here for Thundered, Donuts, I, I think, are back in trouble. They, they, were, they were briefly looking good there, though, after Thundered messed up first. Yeah, let's see what Thunder does now. So the question is, they could technically still snap stuff onto Umbral Skull if they wanted. I'm not sure if the tank jumped down with them here. Yeah, there we go. Alex is with them, so they're not going to snap onto Umbral Skull. They're just going to do it like this and then do a ring pull, I assume, after that, and a frog pull after that. That means they're definitely going to have Bloodlust for either one of those. I don't think you use it on Umbral Skull because at the time that you're going to get it, you're probably finished with the boss already. On the other side, Donuts, if they now snap onto Umbral Skull, they could catch back up, I think. Yeah, the, the problem is like, okay, so snapping onto Umbral Skull, how, how are you going to get your tank back upstairs to like go and get all the mobs that you want, right? Like you... It's something where if you've got a plan yeah. developed for that, that that means you must have planned and practiced something that only ever will come up if you mess up part of your earlier plans and something that's probably harder than your earlier plans as well, doing it onto Umbral Skull rather than Telash. So for that reason, I, I don't think we're going to see any teams really have a a backup Some plan teams for did this it snap not working. It, though. So in some right, of the but groups, like we did see plan, snapping right? onto Umbral Skull? Yeah, but maybe, like, you know, if, if they're familiar with how it works and how they can do it, maybe we're going to see it. I think it would be very smart to attempt it, but maybe Donuts are going to play it natty as well and just jump down here. And it seems like that is going to be the case unless someone else, like a hunter, is running to grab. Wait, nope, we're dying. We're dying. Okay, hold are up. Are we doing frogs? So are we snapping? This is, this, is, this is the way to do it. No, this is the way to do the snap, is you, you die. So... If you want to snap, you have to get back up here somehow, and it looks like that's going to be the plan here. here. So, well, maybe this is going to help them tag some of the far ones. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll I can see, see that. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, thought it was just maybe a, a release angle because they were both there, but it, it does make sense now that you say it. Let's see how it goes. They have everything tagged, and now they need to be very careful 
hopefully the path will be available for yip or the yeah there we go both of it worked out for the donuts and they are snapping these mobs onto umbral skull they should appear in just a couple seconds cryptics using his puzzle box using his army everything's going out we have pi we have abon blim to try and get everything under control here as we blast into this boss first crystals will spawn at the 25 mark so 70 percent health will be the first set then 50 then 25 and by that time hopefully the rest of the mobs should be there big issue that you need to look out for has to be the chains of the keeper right that's the one cast you definitely need to interrupt here to make sure that your mallies actually can get to those crystals yeah, this is a very, very scary pull for Donuts. Even if it works out, I think they're still going to end up being a little bit behind Thundered here because Thundered are working on the same pull right now, but without a boss that they need to kill. But maybe, maybe this will be enough for Donuts. Their Lust is almost available here, so they will be able to get a good Lust onto boss, whereas Thundered are instead going to have Lust for Frogs, it looks like is how this is going to work out. I think if Thundered can hold on, I think they'll be able to... Uh, to get the win here, but we'll see how it works out at the end. It's gonna be a close finish as always here when you have teams of this caliber, both teams sitting on one res and one bloodlust. Umbral Skull getting awfully low here for Donuts. Once it dies, they're gonna have to teleport back to the front, teleport to the frog area, and then do the frog area that Thundered are now setting up to do. And the question is, how many pulls are you gonna do the frog area in as well? Can you do all of those enemies all at once? or not. Looks like both teams are saving the lust for exactly that pull. Yeah, I think that's that's a completely correct angle to approach this. You want to you want to do the all breaker all frog pull and thundered like you said are setting up for it. Now, I think on top of the already a little bit delay that donuts have here the extra 20 penalty seconds that they have against them is going to really what would break the camels back here thundered and now going off i can't see sub chris i would assume he's probably already trying to round up what is in front of them as we've seen before from other teams as the rest of the team is running down here trying to group everything at the bottom of these stairs that's where they want this entire pull to go and that's where they will use that bloodlust alex dropping so low there for a second you can see sub chris is with them now the room that is in front of them comes running that's exactly what they had sent the druid away for and now everything together bloodlust is getting pop nature's vigil is running vampiric oh. embraces there all of the cooldowns are going into this pack this is what they need to defeat to claim the series their own alex is out of cooldowns now as soon as those wings fall off he's not going to have anything until that divine shield is back that is going to be a scary moment but it is not going to be anywhere close to a problem as they have this pack already killed off 99.51 no. percent makes that's not 100 percent where is a, there whoa. it is there is Come one on. looter but it's it's okay it's all right thundered are going to be able to still kill this off in time and that is going to send donuts home and send thundered deeper into our bracket here brutal brutal series for donuts and incredibly tenacious performance by thundered gonna let them take home a 2-1 victory yeah impressive stuff from uh thundered coming out of the last stand qualifier now the first team to knock another team out of the mdi global finals they will send donuts packing sadly for donuts fans but hey they got all the way to the global finals so props to them for making it that far but thundered will be the team that moves on to face perplexed and it was it was wild it was crazy but you know they got the job done in three games yeah, it definitely feels bad for Donuts. Had some issues yesterday. Not able to put it together today. I mean, someone has to be the first team to go home, and unfortunately this time around it is them. But let's talk about the dungeon for a quick second here. Both teams trying to adapt to the new strategy in this dungeon that we saw pulled off yesterday, where you snap mobs down from the upper platform onto Talash Greywing. Not making it work on the side of both teams there. Alex dying to fall damage there, didn't get the grip from his priest. And then, of course, the snap reset because it wasn't in combat with anyone else. At least they were able to get the battle res off and pull the boss anyways. 
with that nice little feral druid tank and getting a free extra percentage on the boss here. Also going poorly for Donuts as well. They kind of had a chance to get back into it if they were able to pull off the snap and get this pulled down. They maybe could have found their way back into this dungeon, but it wasn't meant to be. And of course, with the faster routing at the beginning of the dungeon from Thunder, they were able to take it home get that snap pulled down, and then, of course, finish it off with this giant frog pull, which we love seeing. You know, this could get a little tricky near the end. The bursting does tend to stack up, but a nicely timed mass to spell at 10 stacks there helps them out a little bit. And then, of course, Bazook has to help them out here when they get those 11 stacks. Of course, they also have the dwarf racials across the board to help with that, too. Just, you know, making the best of a run where you make small mistakes is what you need to do if you want to progress in this tournament. And this time around, Thundered was the team that was on the winning end. So, like you said, they'll be moving on. And they do... They're not done yet today, though. Again, they have another elimination match later today. Of course, you have one more match before that happens, but they'll have a little bit of time to breathe, practice up, and get ready for the next match. Yeah, that, op that opponent is going to be perplexed for them. So that's, uh, that's not an easy, uh, easy mountain to climb. We'll see if they can uh, do it or not. A little bit later on the day, as we look at some of these graphs here. But... Uh, Donuts, I, I forgot to mention too, uh, you know, the first team knocked out. Also, that makes, I believe, Dratnos the first of the uh, the casters oh. here to have one of his teams knocked out oh, from his picks. No. Not to call you out no. or anything like that, but you know, we like to talk about significant statistics and things like that. Firsts that mm. are happening. The NA Pride just shattered again. You've been around esports a while, you know. You know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh... Oh, oh, you made him sad. So sad. How dare you, Doa? I'm sorry. You, Doa. I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I, I have to call him like I see him. It's Ratnos' fault for not wearing the flag shirt today. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Where was the where was the team spirit? We shouldn't gang up on Dratnos like this. He's he's a uh, he's a very he's a very nice guy. He doesn't deserve this. Donuts, how dare you? No, I'm just kidding. Donuts had a great MDI uh, for Dragonflight Season 1, making it all the way to the Global Finals. Unfortunately, the first team to fall, but still a significantly good performance to get them this far. I'm, I'm sure we're going to see them again down the road later this year. But uh, we are looking ahead to what's down the road for us later today. As you can see, we're going to Legendary versus Sloth next, and this is going to be an awesome series. Now, Legendary did get 2 0 by Mandatory, but that was still a pretty tight series. And then you've got Sloth, one of the only other teams out there to ever take maps off of Echo, and uh, they got knocked out by Perplexed. So now these two, you know, honestly, really good teams. Not the two tight, not two names you'd expect to see in a first match in a lower bracket, uh, w would you? No, absolutely not. And I've been saying that this is probably my least favorite elimination match ever because I want, like, I like both <laughs> of these teams a lot, and one of them has to get eliminated, right? There's no way around it. It'll either be Sloth yeah. or it will be Legendary that will go home after this, and then whoever remains needs to fight one more round after this. There's so much more MDI action today, and so much more teams that eventually we'll have to say goodbye to. So. It's a little bit of a heavy heart, but also looking forward to the action out of so much that we've seen so far. It's incredible what these teams are playing today. Well, you know, just like the 90s song went, it's a bittersweet symphony, this MDI. I'm pretty sure those are the lyrics. I'll go look it up during the break. Do, you don't go anywhere. Legendary vs. Sloth is coming up next. It's going to be awesome. We'll be back in just a moment on the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals.
Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals for Shadowland, Shadowlands, oh my gosh, for Dragonflight Season 1. There's no escape from the maw for me, apparently. I'm your host, Doe, with me are Tettles, Nakura, and uh, Makes, and we're about to jump into Legendary versus Sloth, our second lower bracket match, our second elimination match, and uh, I, I find it very difficult to make any sort of prediction about who's going home in something like this. I think any of the ones you look at today, it's very difficult to make predictions, but this one especially, I feel like... My heart leans sloth slightly, and they do have the results, I think, to back that up. But it's just today, Tettles, who knows? There's there, nothing, no, the past doesn't matter. It's just the day that matters. Today, we're <laughs> yeah. going to Azure Vault first. I mean, if you kind of look at how we got here, sloth got knocked down to the lower bracket by perplexed, where legendary got knocked down to the lower bracket by mandatory. Funnily enough, you say your heart leans sloth. I thought legendary, even though they got 2 0'd by mandatory yesterday, maybe looked a little bit better in their series just by proxy of, you know, less mistakes. Their tank didn't get body slammed by uh, Fair enough. Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that both of these teams are very close, true. though. And it's a situation I was, talk I was talking to people, I was talking to some friends, and they were like, dude, I feel like six teams could win and i think that sloth and legendary are on the list of the six teams that could potentially win this weekend both of these teams are going to be incredibly good and they're going to match up quite close to one another yeah that was a it was a 2-0 yesterday but it was a very close 2-0 sometimes those numbers don't tell the whole story but uh makes what do you what do you make of these bands here that was not a pun that's just kind of how it came out alfgar academy banned by sloth <laughs> nakud banned by legendary yeah, I think uh, that makes sense. The Algathar Academy is, I believe, the hardest dungeon we have this weekend. And there can, there's so much that can go wrong in that one. So taking this one out of the pool is something I understand. Now, the knockout by Legendary, I'm not sure if that's just how how they approach dungeons. I think maybe they want it to, to see that Halls of Valor banking on that Academy ban. I'm really excited, though, for that second game because yesterday... I believe for the first time in MDI history, we had a run that ended at like 9 minutes 16. And I yeah. want to know if either Sloth or Legendary can par up with Perplexed. Yeah, so it's actually very interesting because Legendary actually had banned Ruby Life Pools against Mandatory. And they did not decide to ban Ruby Life Pools against Sloth. And that might have been because of the fact that Sloth was the only team yesterday that did not pull the first trash pull onto the first boss in ruby life pools so maybe legendary saw that and they were like oh actually we can beat sloth in in this dungeon so they decided to ban a different one where they had problems with yesterday against mandatory in no code offensive they had seven deaths so i think this is a pretty smart ban by legendary thinking that they just have the upper hand in ruby do you think it's possible to see a sub nine minute Ruby life pools? We saw sub 10. That was a question yesterday. That got like blown out of the water. 916 is way shorter than 10 minutes. Do we see a sub nine minute Ruby life pools at some point this weekend? Anybody who wants to take that one? So I think it's possible, but I don't think it will be easy. The run out of perplexed yesterday was like 10 out of 10. Tettles, do you, you want to? No, no, no. After, after you, after you. <laughs> okay. It's like, is this urgent? Uh, the yeah. run out of Perplex was 10 out of 10. And I think the only thing that they maybe could have saved some time on was after Melodrosa, where they spend a little bit of time on dealing with one of the mobs and then clearing off that spiteful, which maybe rounded up to like seven seconds. So I think like an eight, eight minutes 59 is probably possible, but not much lower. Tell us, what do you say? I, I think that it is possible. I just don't think it's possible from Sloth in this series. Because whenever we saw their route, like unless they're willing to take all yeah. of the trash into the first boss, it's just it's just not happening for them to be able to actually play a sub 10 minute run. And so we've seen all of the other teams that have played Ruby Life Bowl so far play all of the trash in the first boss. And I actually think that that's a, that map may be a very strong weak point for Sloth across the whole entire weekend. I. It's kind of unfortunate to not see the bandit, whatever other teams look like they're taking all the trash in the first boss, but uh, it might it might be just like have come down to practice where Sloth felt like their strengths and weaknesses really were. Typically, as well, you do like a lot of bracketology and you're looking at like the maps and you're like, oh, what do I need a ban? Um, like, where am I get, getting the most efficient ban out of? And so that means that like Sloth may have to just be comfortable with the Ruby. And, but like, I, I don't think that that is a map that they love to see in the series. 
Now, the first map in our series is going to be this Azure Vault, as you can see. And uh, it's been a really fun one. We've seen all sorts of stuff happening. We've seen all sorts of interesting skips. We've seen a lot of people fall to their death, too. So I'm curious to see how each of these teams are going to approach it. Uh, Sloth did uh, win. Yeah, their Azure Vault versus Perplex yesterday. So that's something as we get things started for our second elimination match of the day. We'll find out who takes the early lead. Aw, Sloth going in with that Rasta Shaman. At this point, I feel like this is this is their image, right? They just love that Rasta Shaman so much. Yeah, Rasta Shaman is uh, obviously. I mean, it, it does. It's a good pick overall. I think it obviously provides bloodlust, which is uh, I think the main reason why um, they are here. Uh, because the damage dealers don't provide it, but they also have a lot of damage. We've seen the Rasta Shamans just do so much damage uh, on bosses as well. Uh, absolutely crazy damage coming out of some of those Shamans in Temple that we've seen earlier too. But yeah, Sloth also liking it here in this Azure Vault. Okay, so Legendary snap down a little bit right on to these Arcane Tenders here, whereas Sloth did one pull up here and is now snapping some of the crystals down. We saw Mickey up there waiting for his team to actually go down, get in fight, and now spawning down here, placing his healing rain, and that should allow these crystals to come up here as well. Here they are, the Crystal Fury is now spawning into this pack together with some of the whelps. That is, I, I'm not sure if we haven't seen it done this way yet. I think the other it's way not... around we've seen, yeah, we've seen a lot of like different kinds of snaps onto this first boss yeah. area. And it's funny because at the start of the MDI, like the first couple of weekends, we've seen so many teams do like a super big pull at the top and then go down. And the further we got into the MDI, the more often we've seen this dungeon, the less they actually started snapping because they just decided, you know what, this trash here is not really worth it. It's not as efficient as the trash pulls we can do later on. So teams actually started pulling less and less uh, at the start of this dungeon. Legendary, for example, only having 25% trash on the board, while Sloth has 38% and they're still gonna be finishing off two of these Furies. So there's gonna be a huge difference in trash after this boss. Yeah, absolutely right, and we'll see where and how Legendary makes up for it. You already said it, there are so many options on how to approach Azure Vault as a dungeon, and with 20 Tyrannical, that just means that all of those doors are open for you. You can go ahead and snap onto Talash, you can go ahead and snap onto Umbral Skull. We just saw it in that very previous game. We saw the Frog Pole once more, which I think has become one of our our Azure Vault favorites as these teams get through here. But like you said, I don't think Sloth are that far away from Legendary here just by how much lead they already have in Trash. Wondering whether or not these teams will now pull the crystals or skip them because I think we've seen Sloth in this dungeon here before, if I'm not mistaken, and they did win it. So they had 13 minutes, 54. Um, and won that dungeon, and they skipped all of the crystals and snapped them later on uh, that are after this boss. So I think they're going to do the same thing, whereas Legendary opts to do this pull and gets back in trash. Yeah, so because Legendary has to do this pull here, if Sloth ends up skipping it, like you mentioned, then they're going to be really even. Um, but still, Sloth has to do 10% on the boss, and Legendary is going to finish off this Thrasher, Fury, and Elemental pull pretty quickly. You can see they are using their all of their AoEs to see, making sure none of those casts go off, and none of those frontals go off as well. Uh, but it's a 20 Tyrannical, so these mobs are not going to be a big challenge for Legendary at, at all, as they're already finishing it off and moving on. First thing, of course, being Master Spelled by the Shadow Priest. And uh, looking at the Bloodlust timing, I kind of assume... Actually, I'm not sure. Do you think it's like maybe a display bug, or did they actually save Bloodlust for maybe a pull onto Usher Blade? Possibly. Then they would miss so, one whole Bloodlust. Yeah, right? We're looking at the dungeon timer, and we think that it's going to be between 12 and 14 minutes. Yeah. So even if they're at that very kind of late end of those 14 minutes, they would have needed to bloodlust now to get two uses for maybe like at the end for a frog pole if that's what they were looking at. The opposite idea is if they think they get a sub 10 minute run, 
and they know mm-hmm. that they only get one blood loss regardless, so they're holding on to it, right? That's that's the two approaches here, but that would be a lot faster than what we've seen so far, and I'm not sure if that's really the case. Yeah, I think they're already not in pace to do that, right? They did those two extra yeah. trash pulls. We've seen a lot of teams just pull stuff onto bosses from here. So I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not sure what happened there. It could be a tilted error, but we'll investigate and get back to you on that one for Legendary. But Sloth did engage Asher Blade now, pulled all of basically the whole room on top of the boss. This is very dangerous. Malek has to use all of his defenses to be able to survive here. You can see Shield Vault is running, but he is running out of CDs very soon. So they have to finish off the uh, Lieutenant before he does uh, more damage to Malik here, but it's looking really good for Sloth. Legendary under their hand, really going a lot slower overall, like doing this one extra pull there in the ring area. But there we go, the a boss also has been pulled on top of the trash for Legendary now as well. And they're lasting here, yeah. so they saved last for this one. Huh? Okay, uh, I'm going to ask about this. But just by gut feeling, I think they might have missed it and now just send it? Uh, I don't know. It feels weird. Lapan actually taking a lot of damage. Maybe this is on purpose. Maybe they just say that this I mean, look how fast is the boss so is dying. Intense. They're one facing it. Yeah. Are they one facing the boss? Wait. Oh, no, I don't think so. Mm -mm. Maybe that maybe, was, maybe the that was idea, their strategy. Oh. oh my god. I think that might have been a strategy that they don't want an intermission at all and they just failed it. Because. Oh, that, perfect. Like if, that would have if been very fast. Aim in the dungeon, skipping the intermission here might be worth. And look at how much boss damage they did in such a short amount of time. I think that might have been their plan, and it just did not work out, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think you might be onto something, but even with that one face here, is it really worth only having one bloodlust? I'm not so sure because. I'm not sure if the frog pole with all of the breakers is doable without that bloodlust. We've seen all the other teams hold on to it for that specific reason towards the end. And if Legendary now is not able to do that pole, maybe it's not worth. But we will wait and see what the timer says. On the right side, Mickey waiting for his team as Malik is currently grabbing some mops. Let's see if the snap works out for them. He's relying on his leap to make it down here and it seems like it worked out for Sloth. They now have the trash from the upper ring spawning onto Talash Grey Wing, which I really, really like. They need to be very careful with all of those frontals here. And the way that Malik handles these is by going behind the um, bubbles that the boss does to protect you and then step in from the side. So make sure that he does not get any hits from these frontals onto his team. Actually, I think he might just be standing here for this one. But before we saw him just inch in towards the end of the bubble, making sure that none of his team get any of these hits and uh, any of these knocks either. And both of the teams doing an, an absolutely amazing job dealing with all of these trash and Telos Grey Wing as well. I mean, this snap is not easy, right? We've just seen in the series before that it's really not that easy to pull it off. And both Legendary and Sloth did an amazing job executing it. Looks like all of the trash is going down for Legendary and Sloth finished it off as well. Uh, three more stacks of bursting that they're just healing on Sloth's side with that Resto Shaman. And Sloth a little bit ahead on boss damage here. Just slightly though, it's not gonna be the biggest difference. Another thing I do want to point out is that Sloth has a little bit more percentage. So that means that maybe do not have to pull all of the breakers at, on the last pull, making that a little bit safer. But Sloth has the Bloodless and Legendary doesn't, right? So Legendary has to somehow do the five breaker pull without Lust, which is definitely very scary because there's just so much damage coming onto the group. Yeah, absolutely. Simkins taking a lot of damage here on the side of Sloth, but Thundering helping out, making sure that all of the damage is being dealt to the boss. And you can see the team side by side now, five seconds in favor of Legendary due to the death on Sloth. But in terms of trash count and dungeon progressions, they look very much neck and neck here, except for that bloodlust difference. So we're going to see how this one works out for the teams for now. 
I think we're just going to see them both move on to Emerald Skull and then do that frock pull after that because that gives you around 30% and I think that will be enough for them to do. Teams are moving on. Maybe Legendary snapping some mobs onto Emerald Skull. Trying to keep that frock pull smaller. Tobo actually going Tobo. down here. Unfortunate. Was probably relying on a grip. They did reset that boss, which is going to cost them a little bit of time. Lipan is now back here with some of the mobs, like we said, but it needs to wait for the boss to spawn and needs to wait for Tobo to get picked up to get in fight with the rest of his team. Yeah, so this is slowing Legendary down quite a bit, right? They have the boss reset here, it looked like. I'm not sure if maybe Tobo pulled the boss while falling down and then he was the only one in combat with the boss and instantly died and that made the boss reset. Something like that. Uh, but there we go, Umbral's Call did spawn now. And yeah, this is their plan, right? So because they are snapping those two breakers down to Umbral Skull, they're not going to have five breakers in the last frog pool and therefore they are not going to need the bloodlust for it. So that was their whole exactly. strategy. But because they didn't actually pull the strategy off, because they did not skip the intermission phase in Azure Blade, they don't seem to be faster than what Sloth is showing on their side. Uh, Sloth is already in 46% on Umbral Skull. They don't have those breakers snapped onto the boss, but they have the Bloodlust. They can just do the five breaker pull with the frogs at the very end. But it's still going to be very close, and there's still things that can go wrong for Sloth, of course. Side now, because five that breaker seconds pull, even with Bloodlust, is very difficult to, the death to on execute. Sloth. But in terms of trash count and yeah, absolutely right. And so progressions. We're going to see how that works. Um, Umbral Skull now down to 30% here, and Legendary has her on 40, deals with both of the breakers. But that frog pull towards the end can be very volatile, so we'll see whether or not Sloth can actually play it down cleanly and get this dungeon in the books. I think if they had managed to, one, do that one phase on Azure Blade, and two, get the Breaker Snap onto Umbral Skull, I think Legendary's route would have won in like a everything went well scenario. I think so too, because looking at how close this still is, that intermission phase cost them easily, I don't know, like 30 seconds or more, and I think that would have made up the time difference for sure for Legendary. So I really like the iteration here, the different strategy uh, from Legendary. I think it's a really cool idea having that Bloodlust on Azure Blade nuking it. But yeah, if it's so close and they don't manage to execute it every time, then of course uh, it's definitely a high risk um, strategy for Legendary. But there we go, Sloth now gathering up all of the breakers from this side, while Simkins, you can see Simkins is not there, it's in, he's in bear form, uh, gathering up the breakers and the frogs from the other side, and they're going to be meeting in the middle here, and they're going to bloodlust, and they're going to nuke this trash pull down as fast as they can, and they have to be fast because there's just so much damage, unavoidable damage coming out of these breakers, plus all of those shoulder slam combos, so they have to use all defensives and offensives to execute this pull. Yeah, exactly. Let's see how it goes. Bloodlust is getting popped here. Nature's Vigil is running. Vampiric Embrace already out. We still have that SLT from Mickey to potentially save some of his mates here. They don't have that Disc Freeze, but they do have the Shatter Priest to potentially get a mass to spell out. SLT now also being deployed. IVF coming out of Marky trying to stay alive here as the Breakers slowly but surely fall to their death. It is one Breaker alive that still has a lot of HP. Simpkins going down, giving Legendary another 5 seconds to maybe claim this one as their own they need to single target damage that breaker down 13 43 is what the clock says five seconds later will be over for legendary i don't think they can do it but look at how close this one was that's like two seconds difference wow. between those two teams incredible yeah, Sloth takes the win on that map, but it really could not have been much closer. It's just that little issue with the boss that a Legendary had. It looks like it reset. It was a rough moment. If that hadn't happened, you'd kind of think this map might have gone the other way, but it is what it is. Sloth is going to take the early lead in the series. Uh, what else did you see in that one, Tuttles? I mean, dude, that that ended up being a lot closer than i thought like i i, I actually yeah. thought that sloth's route was really good here um so they did have, you know there, there was a, a minor thundering mishap at the very beginning there was a, a bit of a thundering stun but i thought that coming out of the boss area at 45 percent 
enemy forces as opposed to like legendary is 25 percent and some of the pulls that sloth did as opposed to legendary i i, I really was thinking that sloth was a, in a bit of in a bit of a more commanding position especially whenever legendary did like this pull whenever i saw this pull i was like i didn't think that this was a super efficient i thought that legendary may have been losing the this map just due to like this routing decision like this is a pull that you do on live like i, I don't know whenever i see pulls that i do on live i it, it's it's interesting to see legendary was actually able to keep it very close through the whole entire thing and, and if there wasn't just that um reset with the final boss then we would have been in a better position for Legendary. They would have been able to take this map. And so we can talk about what happened with that reset. We actually, we don't have like a perfect POV of it, but I generally know what happened. So basically with an Unholy Death Knight, if they jump off the railing, um, their ghoul will snap all the way down to Umbral Skull. And if they jump down at a bad angle, then their ghoul can pull Umbral Skull. <laughs> and uh, then Tobo died after his ghoul pulled the boss. And the boss immediately reset. And so we'll see that in just a couple seconds. I mean, this is this is just like the craziest part of the dungeon for me. Basically, every single team in the MDI has been doing this. Uh, snap into Taylash. I think that's so sick. Um, I, I can't believe that teams are able to get that dealt with. And then this is that tragedy for Legendary. You see, like, we only have the POV of Lapan for the replay. But you can kind of see it off to the side. Like, we're going to slow down. You see the ghoul. Like, Umbral Skull is chasing the ghoul. And right as Tobo dies, Umbral Skull resets because he was combated by that um by that mob like you generally don't want to be combating the boss is is the big variable here because lapan also wasn't there nobody was tagged in combat once that reset happens you know they were standing around waiting for 30 seconds before they were able to repull that would have been the difference i mean look at the times legendary was only seven seconds behind they would have been able to make it up if uh they didn't have that slight mishap but i think that that just proves how close these teams truly are yeah absolutely and I think to add to that too, you know, now we look ahead and we're looking at Ruby Life Pools, and that's a dungeon that's been done so quickly, sub 10 minutes already this weekend. So with the teams doing the dungeons at this level, at this, uh, you know, at, at this level of perfection specifically, uh, it is going to be those minute, minute things like, uh, like we talked about. And I was trying to remember too, there was something on Azure Blade, if I recall correctly, in that last map with Legendary, or maybe I'm thinking of the last series yet, where they ended up getting an extra phase, and that cost them a little bit of time as well. Do you remember that, or am I thinking of a, a different match? Uh, I'm not sure. I, it, I believe it was. I believe it was, uh, but uh, I'm sure Twitch chat is already correcting me. It's fine. Taking your Either way. Doa. Yeah, trust me. I'm the expert. Sloth taking the lead in the series 1-0 and we are going to that ruby life pools uh, i would love to see another sub 10 minute time i mean we kind of have the blueprint laid out as far as what you need to do but there's so many little execution things in that map that can kill you if you're not extremely careful right mix yeah absolutely true we're going to have a look whether or not teams can actually get that sub 10 minute route i think that has to be the biggest uh, point or maybe even the sub nine minute route right it is a fortified spiteful grievous which can be a little bit annoying but it's only plus 20 so ideally what we're expecting from teams is to pull everything that is in front of Melodrosa and pull it on top of her with bloodlust and that is your bloodlust for the key and then after that you play the dungeon like we've seen before with the double destroyers into kokia into the big pull on to rivali into the final boss and if you're very good and very fast, you can get around that nine minute mark as we've seen from Perplex yesterday. I'm feeling like this is, I'm, way, I'm leaning like 75, 25, maybe 80, 20 in favor of Legendary on this map. Obviously, Ruby Life Pools is so volatile, but I, I think that Legendary should be able to kind of keep up or outpace Sloth Stratton here. I think it's interesting, right? Because Sloth definitely had a slower strat, but they had time between yesterday and today to actually uh, mm -hmm. practice that pull. And one thing with Legendary is that in their group phase, they wiped multiple times in Ruby Life Pools, and I think they lost all of their rubies because they just did not perform well in this specific dungeon here. And they also banned Ruby against Mandatory. So I think this might not be their favorite dungeon to play, but we'll see how this is going to end up uh, for both Legendary and Sloth, and it looks like Legendary right. is gathering up all of that trash and pulling it into the boss as soon as it spawns. 
Yeah, and so is Sloth. They looked back at yesterday and said, I guess we cannot do this. I guess we have to go all in, but it's not working out. Tundra going down here during Bloodlust. That one has to hurt, picking him back up to get him here into this fight. You can see the tank trying to stay safe there in that corner, but Simkins now also going down. They don't have a battle rest, Malak dies, Marky dies. It's a full team wipe for Sloth. They're already down and in trouble looking at that key, but it all on legendary, whether or not they're gonna be able to clean this one up. Bloodless still pumping, legendary still taking substantial amounts of damage. The horde is coming for them. All of those spitefuls looking to get some melee smashes onto the group. The Wexie taking so much damage from these whelps here is going to use ice block very nicely done. And they are trying to get that juggernaut out of the way together with these chill weavers looking really really good from legendary yes splat going down actually for legendary they do have a battle rest that they immediately use here as the aoe is coming out of melodrosa eagle dropping really low as well they don't have a battle rest if eagle goes down here and they get so many ticks from the shield tobo does go down as well splat goes down too there's just so many things happening simultaneously for legendary here and they have such a hard time to recover as waxy goes down too only eagle and lapin alive i don't think they can finish this off it's gonna be a full wipe for legendary as well and because sloth had the wipe earlier they might actually have a way of getting into this key but the good thing for legendary is that they dealt with most of the trash they're at 35 yeah. percent already exactly so as you can see right now legendary they only have the juggernaut alive and i think maybe the mini boss yeah there we go so the defier is still there the juggernaut is still there and everything else they have taken care of so eagle trying to get really close here past the mass rest to get his teammates back up whereas sloth died super early into this pull so they still have to deal with all of that trash and get through it first before they can get back at that boss uh, I'm not sure if that's an over. I think it's an overlay bug, right? They did use Bloodlust prior. It's just not tracking right now. Yeah, there we go. Eight minutes cooldown on that Bloodlust from Legendary. So now they're going to do the fire into Melodrusa. I think maybe even get that Juggernaut back up. I'm not sure. So Can I get Tobo? the problem is the problem is Eagle did mass rest but did not reach Tobo. But they couldn't get closer because this mob here has um, stealth detection and Igloo does not have Shadow Melt ready. So, but Splat has. Okay, so Splat Shadow Melted and is using Revive out of combat to get Toba back up and now they can engage Melidrosa. So, good job um, thinking of that Shadow Melt and getting the rest off on that Feral Druid there. And yeah, because Legendary dealt with all of that trash already, they only had the mini boss left. And the boss, of course. Well, Sloth, look at them. They had all of their offensive cooldowns committed to that pool. Uh, they had Bloodlust, everything, defensive uh, utility being used too. So now they just had to do like three trash pulls before they can go into the boss here, which is just such a big time loss for Sloth in comparison to Legendary. Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show how difficult that pull actually is, right? That's, I believe, the way it's set up is probably the most difficult pull in the entire MDI that we are seeing in total. So maybe the, the Echo of Thoragosa comes close if you have all of the Echo Knights and Restorers and so on on top of it. But definitely a big, big challenge, especially with those two mini bosses, the Juggernaut and the Defier, they are in the way as well. So both teams trying to, to go as big as possible, right? It is an elimination bracket. They need to they need to really shoot their shot, go as big as possible, and then if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But you've tried at least, so that's what's happening. Tundra going down here once more for Sloth, as Legendary is chewing through that boss. 20% remaining on Melodrosa, and the Defire is also slowly ticking down. But they left that Juggernaut up, so now they have to play, I think, the Bridge Trash to make up for it, or maybe one of the Dragons. Yeah, I mean, it really cannot be overstated enough just how difficult this pull is, really. Like, I don't know if you guys ever did this dungeon and you accidentally pulled, like, some trash on top of the mini boss with, like, a juggernaut and the mini boss or something like that. And that is already so difficult, in my opinion, because seeing where the charge goes is really hard when there's so much going on, right? You have the boss, you have 
all of these spiteful shades. You have a chill storm going off at the same time. And then you're somehow supposed to see where the mini boss is charging to. It's super hard to see. And if you get a hit by that charge, you will get one shot if you don't have a cheat death or something like that. And on top of that, of course, there's all of these other mechanics. You have to interrupt the casters. You have to interrupt um, the AOE or disrupt the AOE as well. So yeah, just very, very difficult to execute. This is why Sloth did not attempt this pull yesterday. But yeah, deciding they want to do it this time and it just did not work out, unfortunately. Legendary, though, are now done and they are moving on. And they're gathering another huge pool. You can see some of the destroyers plus patrol plus a second destroyer pack being gathered by Legendary. Yeah, and there is a lot that's going on in these double destroyer pools. You can see they're using the abilities to make sure that everything gets knocked up and a little bit more controlled, not needing to use their own CCs. Wexy inching in there trying to get that all up there and getting those flame dancers and cinder weavers down as Lapan falls to the floor. They're trying to get him back up, but they don't have a battle rest. They have to walk all of the way. The question is, can the rest of the team somehow survive this pull, kite it out and keep it in fight until their tank is back? Is there a way for Sloth to come back? into this considering that legendary just had a full wipe here everyone's dead uh, these destroyers definitely reset i believe unless wexy is somehow alive in an ice block still because that's the only uh no they all reset so they might not be able to do this big pull again it looks like they have to go slowly now they don't have those defensives or offensive cooldowns available anymore so they have to do destroyer pack by pack sloth on the other hand they're now also in the ring area if they can execute the Devil Destroyer pull on their side, they might actually have a chance to be back in this dungeon. They also have four less deaths on the board, which means there's a 20 seconds uh, death penalty timer in favor of Sloth. Yeah, absolutely right. We can see them try and get back their time. The Destroyer pull for Sloth now in motion. Will it go well for them has to be the big question. After what we just saw from Legendary, they do have Nature's Vigil running. They do have Empiric Embrace available, but it is Mickey's own. So a little bit of a less extensive matter than they would have with a Shadow Priest. And they're dealing with them really, really well. First Destroyer is about to die. Second one is really low. A bunch of these casters are going to die in a couple of seconds. So looking really good here out of Sloth. You might be right. I think back on, on, on the back of these extra deaths, they could probably get this dungeon back under control. Yeah, this is Sloth in the lead for sure now. You can see there's 61% trash. They already dealt with two destroyers. Moving on to the next uh, destroyer pack here as well. Bloodlust will be up in two minutes. I'm not sure if they're going to be committing it. Oh, they actually pulled the flame gullet. I don't think they wanted to do this. It does have Mind Sooth on it. I think they might have... Maybe they thought they're so far behind they have to like risk running <laughs> through to the destroyer and then accidentally pull the Malik Dose down. They don't have a battle rest. No. This is going to be a full wipe for Sloth too. Oh my god, it was looking so good for Sloth again. But this full wipe and the accidental uh, pull on Flame Gullet means that Legendary is in the lead again. <laughs> Let's take a look at them. I mean, you know, I've been to like uh, holiday parks and they had rides that were less less turn turning than this. <laughs> There's so much going on in this series here. And to be honest, even though so much has happened for both of those teams, it could still be anybody's key. It's really, really crazy. Blood loss will be ready in a couple of seconds for them as well. So maybe if they can capitalize on that, I think it's probably going to be used for the Revali poll. So the mini boss before the last boss with all of the extra casters there i think that's where i would want to have it maybe these teams disagree maybe they want to have it on another dragon maybe you don't only do the the flamme goulet maybe you also do the other dragon yeah just pull them both i mean at this point pull all of the dragons into the boss, just, just nuke it down see what happens either way sloth does finish off this destroyer now so I mean, it's still really close, right? There's only one, there's only five seconds death penalty in favor of Legendary at this point, and trash-wise, it does look they're very, does look like they're definitely very even. Sloth uh, still has to do a 
Actually, do they have to do one destroyer still? Yeah, I think so. So they have one more destroyer to do. Well, Legendary did finish up their last one now, I believe. So Legendary is going to be able to pull the boss here. So I wonder if they can use Bloodlust here, if they want to save it for the mini boss pool, because I would assume that both of these teams want to do a really big mini boss pool. And having Bloodlust for that seems to be the safest. So I think maybe holding on for that one does make sense. Um, but yeah, actually, never mind. Legendary is popping that bloodlust as they pull the boss onto this patrol here. Yeah, and make no mistake, that is actually a very scary pull because you have to keep those flame dancers interrupted. Cinder Weaver, I think there was one in there as well, so gotta get an extra interrupt out with the elemental set the boss spawns. That requires a lot of coordination, so shout out to Legendary for pulling that off. Kokia now slowly but surely dropping, looking at the trash count sloth and Legendary are even, I think think they're also on their way to boss or do they have one more destroyer no here we go kokia also now engaged for sloth but it looks like pulled the are they in fight again no. yes no. that's another full vibe for sloth unfortunately they are not going to be able to deal with that so they're gonna have to go again and try to not pull that flame gallet this time around as a legendary now though is <laughs> invising through the trash and we'll see what the deal is. Now, I don't think they have the information just yet that Sloth wiped on the boss, right? So they technically think that this is still really close and they have to do this pull. But they don't have Bloodlust, so this pull is actually pretty dangerous. You have the mini boss, you have the channelers, so many interrupts have to go off, so much AoE is happening too. So they have to stay alive here on Legendary side. And it's looking good so far. Some of the mobs are dying and there's a lot of cooldowns being used as well. But this mini boss still has a lot of HP. Eh? Yeah, and slowly but surely there will be Spitefold spawning, which sent your Feral and the Unholy DK for some extra slappy slaps. The Flame Channel is now dying off as one more Lightning Storm comes out of Ravali. He wants it, he gets it. Beautiful knock into the Frost Ring from Wexy, making sure that they stay where they are. Igloo and Wexy both can dodge out of range here, making sure that they don't have anything to deal with with these spiteful shades and now slowly but surely Rivali is going to go down and so will that Tempest Chandler there. The legendary has made it through what I believe was the last very scary position in this dungeon. They're on to Karaka and Stormvane and that will probably be their dungeon looking across the board. Soth has a couple more seconds on the death penalty than Legendary and they're still at Kokia needing that entire pull that we just saw out of Legendary. So uh, knock on wood, Legendary will make it through this boss fight here. Yeah, all eyes on Legendary now. I mean, they must be feeling so much pressure because both these teams know they messed up. But maybe like on the delay, they'll, they'll see, oh, the other team also made a mistake. We still have a chance of winning. So some somehow they're still in this dungeon here for legendary and remember this is an elimination match and sloth is already one game ahead so for legendary legendary this must be incredibly stressful because if they don't win this they are going to be eliminated but of course we know that they are really far ahead because sloth did vibe on kokia earlier and it's looking really good for legendary to tie this up as they now face the boss into the second phase and they want to finish off kiraka as fast as possible to not get too many inferno bolts too many um aoe debuffs on to the group but it's looking really good and the boss is dropping really fast yeah i mean listen it, it is still a 15 minute run in a plus 20 key and even though plus 20 is the lowest we have in the mbi that's still an incredibly fast run given that they had 11 devs legendary managing to get another win here in this series tying the standings and sending us into a third map once again they're sending us the third map like you said I'm a little bit worried though, after, you know, we saw so many really clean, tight maps tonight. I'm a little bit concerned that we have kind of like a Space Jam scenario happening here where like somebody gave these teams like a mouse or a keyboard to touch and it just like absorbed all their WoW talent for that map. Like uh, who took it and how can we get it back? Because uh, that was not the type of performance we're used to seeing from these teams, was it? 
Legend has it it was Makes. Um, <laughs> what do you so. mean? <laughs> I'm You're just saying on with this the desk. You take the blame. I was not casting. I was the I am but the analyst, and I have brought the people what they wanted. Great clips and highlights of the match. And so as we can see, right off the bat, I was like, wow, uh -huh. Sloth, they're pulling all the trash into the boss. This is spectacular. They've adapted their route. They wiped immediately. And then I was like, oh, Legendary's going to win. How could they possibly lose this from here? And they wiped. But their wipe was less bad. And their wipe was less bad because they had 35% enemy forces as opposed to Sloth's. I don't think Sloth killed one mob. <laughs> um, so, And then it was, uh, okay, so... Legendary's gonna repull the boss. And you know, we're we're at a weird spot where Legendary repulls the boss with like, you know, one mob and, and, and it was fine. And then we had a thundering mishap where everybody got stunned and died and wiped for Legendary. And I was like, is there a way that Sloth comes back? And the answer was no. And uh Flame Gullet had something to say about that, as uh he has been pulled into this pack for Sloth and decided and Sloth has decided that they were going to wipe to this pull, and it was a it was, uh, you know, not the best map for either team. And I think that the moral of the story here is that you got to be able to shake off the nerves. Um, you got to be able to just make sure you're focusing on the next map. <laughs> because yeah, Ruby Life yeah, has happened. Sure. We were all there for it. We don't need to worry about it anymore. <laughs> it's fine. We got a map three. We, we saw it. We can put it behind us now. It's in the past. It's water under the bridge. It's, it's just another key that you'll you know you'll tell your grandkids about someday but we're moving on to our next uh, map it's going to be the halls of valor between these two teams and it's it's like you said tettles you know even the best teams in the world and these are two of the best teams in the world we can't forget that um they have bad you know they have bad games once in a while they have those maps that don't work out some stuff kills you that you never normally never die to multiple times and here we are a tie series at least the only thing worse would have been if, if that's how you get knocked out you know that would feel way worse now we can go to this third map now we can see things hopefully tightened up a little bit and then we can see who emerges victorious i know we said we're going to put tettles in but maybe you know makes his cat could uh could take a Whoa, take a spin of things too it's so cute <laughs> yeah, it's always it's an option cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I felt like, like after that, we all deserved a little bit of cat, you know? I love cats. I agree. <laughs> there you go. Well, let's check out our uh, maps again for this series. Of course, uh, like I said, we're going to that 22 Halls of Valor bursting explosive fortified Halls of Valor. It's, uh, it's no pushover like uh, none of the maps are in the uh, MDI, but uh, it's one where, I mean... Nagura, we, we need to see things to be be a little bit cleaner from at least one of these teams. Yeah, so in Legendary already played Halls of Valor and they had an 18 minutes 39 clear with zero deaths. So very, very clean run. It was um, 18 seconds slower than the fastest run in Halls of Valor that we've seen from Mandatory. So Legendary mm -hmm. definitely has a really, really good shot here. Sloth, we have not seen in Halls of Valor just yet. So we don't know what they mm -hmm. um, have up their sleeves for that dungeon. But I, if I would have to um, take a pick here, I would say it would Go in favor of Legendary just because we've seen them do this dungeon already and very cleanly too. Typically, whenever I see like a map mm -hmm. that was in their, f whenever you see a team play the map that was in their first series or a, or a map that they would have had to have played in their first series, you normally know that that team is going to have good practice on it. Now, it just comes down to like, how much has Sloth really prepared for Halls of Valor? Are they able to put up something close to like the weekend best run? Because we know <laughs> Legendary's time in that HOV is, is very, very competitive, even with like the weekend best that we're going to see in there. Now, there's obviously opportunities for mistakes. This is a dungeon that, you know, the first pull in particular is one that you're going to need to watch out for because we've seen many of players get sniped by that dragon. But out, barring any catastrophe, I, I think that this is, like Nagura said, maybe Legendary's map to lose here. Well, we're about to find out. The teams are in the map. The map is underway. Time to see who takes a dungeon, takes a series. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we're going straight in here. Everything on to boss, tried and true technique out of our MDI teams. A little bit of difference in the healers. This time around, it's legendary opting for that Rasto Shaman on the side of Sloth. We're seeing that Disc Priest in combination with the Fire Mage. Something I really, really like seeing together with the Unholy DK and the Feral. I think this might be my favorite combination so far. Let's see how they do this pull is crazy difficult yeah there's just so much going on and tundra does go down they'd have to commit a battle rest immediately tundra did i think use most of the combustion already so it's not too big of a damage loss possibly but it's definitely not ideal to have your mage go down there um but the all of the trash was that already except the storm drake so maybe not the most horrible loss for sloth but legendary doing a much better job on their side doing this pull a little bit cleaner they do not have the fire mage um so they don't have this high single target plus cleave kind of damage profile from that mage there but they still have the unholy dk of course with the pi from the shadow priest so they still have um a lot of damage of course and yeah let them drop really low there for a second did manage to recover though yeah and legendary a little bit in the lead here especially with those five seconds on the side of sloth legendary getting that boss down uh, what seems like 10 15 seconds uh, sloth kind of slowing down here before sloth and they're going to move on now the question is we've seen some teams just skip this skip the entire hallway go all the way up to herja and then pull everything onto Solston. And it seems like Legendary is out to do exactly that. They're grabbing some of the trash here and they're gonna run up and do one very, very big pull at the top of the stairs with one of the mini bosses trying to get that boss RP started right away. Whereas Sloth has a bigger pull here in that hallway, but are not going to move towards that upper staircase. Yeah, so Sloth definitely, um, I, I want to say this is probably a bit slower just because they're not engaging the mini bosses fast, uh, which in my opinion is always the one thing that slows you down the most on this initial uh, Hersha area because these mini bosses have so much HP on a 22 fortified and in addition you have such a hard time dealing with the mini bosses simultaneously and with trash on top of it so seeing them be pulled like this and just cleave the trash down efficiently while you deal with them in my opinion is a very very efficient strategy and we can see it being done by legendary on the left side of the screen right now yeah but there is so much damning damage going out on to the team with all of this extra trash attached sometimes teams start pulling the other mini boss as well after solson has cast his eye of the storm is not going to be the case for legendary i think they will get him in just a second Almir still standing there in the background now they're also grabbing one of the shield maidens that's actually being controlled i believe by wexy It's a thunder caller. Yeah, Wixie has a, a thunder caller minion. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Do you have less um, less interrupts? So usually, when you use that uh, mind control or control mind uh, from the shadow priest, you can dominate use it to mind. Yeah. dominate mind. Yeah, so you can use it to get some sort of buff, like the restorers in academy. But you can also just use it to delay having to deal with it, which makes a lot of sense when you deal with the eye of the storm from the mini boss plus the aspirant constantly casting uh, a very important ability to, to interrupt otherwise you get all of these swirlies on the ground that he cannot dodge if you have to stand inside the bubble right so dealing with the thunder caller with that with Olmir does make sense and they're not going to be losing any time either in fact they might actually be gaining time because they have an extra target to um, get some resources maybe get some funnel damage onto Olmir yeah and they are done with the mini bosses now looking at the trash percentage we are at 38.15 and sloth looking to be a little bit over that they still have the shield maiden standing and they're now also finished with all mirrors so let's see what they do are they going to pull these into boss i would assume yes and if that's the case i really like this yeah, yeah, here we go. It does look like that is what they're doing, and that is... I mean, it's pretty risky, to be fair, because you have that Aspirant uh, constantly cast a frontal and a jump. 
So oh, and Simkis. Simkis actually does go down. It looked like to one of those frontal casts. So they have no battle rest. Do they? Yeah, they finish don't. They have to play as players. four. I think so. So they could most teams the are, boss, but I don't think they want to. Doesn't look like they want to. Both teams, however, did uh, invert Herja, so they are making sure that the buffs that both of the dead mini-bosses give her don't stack up for their respective abilities. That's not as important for Sanctify, which is all of the orbs coming out, as it is for the Eye of the Storm that you're seeing right now. Herja only has stacks on the holy side, so from Olmir, uh, which means that this Eye of the Storm is not going to do as much damage as it would otherwise also means that the beginning of this pull is very hard, so surprised that they would pull all of those shield maidens before having that first extra AoE go out at the Golden Circle. But uh, yeah, they did lose Simpkins to it and they will need to format it, which is just going to cost them so much more time. It definitely does, and there's so much damage on Malik as well, having to use Bubble to stay alive because they have one less damage dealer. These shield maidens and this Aspirant uh, being alive for so long, he actually had to tank both the Aspirant Frontal and the Hersha tank hit here and somehow managed to survive. That was really clean by Malek being able to survive that. But Legendary, they're done with Hersha and they're moving on. They're pulling a lot of trash onto the right side here, cleaning up those tables so they can pick up the beer later on that they will need to do the Kings uh, for at the time. Yeah, Legendary is on to the next big pull. There's a Rune of Healing underneath these Marksmen here. The Death Grip from Tobo coming in clutch, trying to get them out of there. CCs being used and Capitator Totem out of Eglu, trying to help here. It's, I think, one of the major choices why you, why you bring it as that extra stun. That's just so helpful sometimes on top of SLT as they're getting through these Volachar here in Lepan. Once again, he is always so low, it's giving me anxiety, but Eglu is protecting his tank, making sure that they can get through this. One more explosives, and then they go on. That's just a little bit of extra ticks that they still need to heal, and then they can get into that wolf area. Now, Sloth have also made it through that boss fight with a little bit of extra delay. Question is, how does the rest of their dungeon look? Simpkins back with the team now. And they have to do the same pull that Legendary already executed. Legendary are now making their way towards Hersha, uh, towards Fenrir, sorry, and they're going to be possibly pulling a, a Hunter pack on top. That is something we've seen a lot from these teams. Can be dangerous because they're throwing around these traps that you have to dodge and you have these uh, snapshots going off uh, onto random people just doing a little bit of damage on top of the Fenrir damage as well. So we'll see how to deal with it. They actually did not skip the first leap so we see a bleed on tobo and on splat yeah that is going to hurt a little bit but it is not tyrannical so it shouldn't be too much of a problem here these village are they put down traps now in previous keys we might have seen players die to those traps so the team really needs to look out for where they land it make sure to avoid that area as they get through this fight here and slowly these mobs are dying off. Sloth now also on the way to Fenrir. Are they also going to pull these marksmen? Or does their route have something different planned? Malik looks like he wants bulls instead. Interesting, yeah. So Malik is grabbing two bulls at least that we can see so far. Uh, maybe getting the trash instead of the trappers. Or they're also pulling the trappers. We'll see in just a second. Um, it's like, like that there's four bulls. So this is actually a little bit dangerous because you have all of these AoEs that the bulls are casting. And simultaneously, you would also want to be close to the boss to stand in a claw frenzy. So this can actually be pretty dangerous if the bulls cast an AoE and you do not have a disrupt for it while the claw is going off. But you can see they're actually using a lot of disrupts to have the bulls not Get that, let that cast go through to be able to stand in a claw frenzy and they're doing a really good job. Yeah, absolutely. They are also getting Fenrir down. And Legendary, 
is on their way to get a big wolf pole running. Lepan picks up everything and more that is here in this area and now also engages Fenrir. We saw the grip from the priest there in a second. Eaglu and Wexi are well and safe protected on that stone behind all of the models that you're seeing right now on the left side as the rest of the team tries to get through this trash here. They need to be very careful when the time to feed comes in. That will be the big issue for them, but they do have that paladin that can give a pop and just protect and make sure that that's not going to be a big chase with a lot of wargans jumping around. One more time, the totem coming out, Iglu taking a hit from one of those wolves as they are finishing off. Really, really beautifully done. And Sloth do the same thing as Wexi goes down. And they have to use a battle rest here to get Waxy back up. A little bit of an issue here at the very end, but they should be able to finish off the boss still. All of the wolves are dead. They have to deal with a few claw frenzies still, but they are looking to be fine from here on out. As Sloth is bloodlasting this Fenrir pool with the wolves, you can already see Tundra and uh, their healer being on that stone, on that a rock as you can see so none of the leaps are coming out they have to finish off those wolves as fast as they can though so malik does not go down just so much tank damage coming in whenever they do this insane pull but there we go they actually lose all three damage dealers no! plus their healer this is a full wipe for sloth and they didn't finish off the wolves either Oh no, they committed bloodlust for this as well. This is just a disaster for Sloth. Again, just losing so much time. Yeah, I mean, obviously the key isn't over just yet. There still needs to be one big pull for Legendary, then the Kings, and then two more bosses. But it is going to be so hard to get that time back, to get the resources back. They won't be able to do this uh, this wolf pull without the bloodlust that they used previously. So they now have to break it up or hope and pray to get through it. Essentially, going to see what they opt to do. Definitely very, very painful if you're a sloth man to see this happen right here. Yeah, so sad for Sloth, but Legendary on the other hand, still only one death on the board, having an absolute clean Pulse of Valor run here on their side. They are dealing with this last bull and bear pull, which can be pretty dangerous, especially in the tank, because you just did a wolf pull onto Fenrir, and now you have to do all of these bears plus the bulls. But Lepan doing a good job surviving. It looked a little bit sketchy there at the very end, but he's fine as he does use the dwarf racial to get rid of all of those bursting stacks, and now they have to get past this storm drake and percentage wise they are fine they're going to be grabbing those three beers and they're going to try or attempt to get all of the kings at the same time which is something that we've seen teams fail um before so we'll see if legendary can execute that yeah and honestly that would be a big time loss if they would lose one of the kings so we're gonna keep our eyes open and see how they do they do have enough trash percent you can see the mind sooth going out here allowing the team to actually make it through and get onto the bridge i would assume all of them have their ales ready to throw onto these kings and they will make their way up now on the right side sloth is back at it this time i think with less wolves but with Fenrir, of course, no bloodlust, no big CDs as they were used previously. So they just have to make it through and oh, everything hurts so much for them right now. Yeah, everything's so difficult for them because whenever they have these huge wipes, they just lose all of their offensive and defensive cooldowns and it makes everything else just so much harder. But there we go, Legendary now attempting the Quadra King pull. Let's see if it works out as Lepan is pulling the first king onto Bjorn. Bjorn has to attack King Tor here, there we go. And as soon as the uh, other king attacks, you can move on. So now they're at King Halder. Let's see if that one, there we go. And now they have, just have to drag it to the last one. It looks like they did manage. If they managed to speak to all of them as well, yeah, there, we, there go. we go. Legendary did manage to execute. Very, very good. On the other side, Mickey went down for Sloth once more. They're still missing a lot of count to make it back to the Kings. And with Legendary being able to get those four Kings in order, I don't want to be a Dobby Doctor, but I think it's looking pretty rough for Sloth. 
Yeah, I think I have to agree. I mean, this is of course the... We are in the lower bracket here, so if Legendary wins this one, they're gonna be the ones that move on. They actually have to play against Cheese in their next elimination match later on. And yeah, just not looking good for Sloth at all. In the Ruby Lifeholds earlier as well. I mean, I think it might also be a little bit of a problem when it comes to your motivation too, right? So your mental. If you have a Ruby Life Falls run like that where oh, you have yes. a full wipe and then you almost manage to come back, but you wipe again, right? Like that must be so hard on your mental when you are in the global finals and you just have these mistakes. So very unfortunate for Sloth. But yeah, Legendary, they're now about to uh, go, go out to King Skull Vault and they have Bloodlust, which I assume they're saving for Odin though. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Sloth has basically the entire Spanish-speaking community behind them, so at least that has to keep them going, has to keep them their motivation up, right? I think there's like several thousand people watching the, the Spanish version of the MDI right now uh, at our local pastor, and uh, it's been a good run. They made it to the finals once again. I'm not sure if that is where they want it to end. I think they had higher goals and I would have wished for higher goals for them, but doesn't seem to be in the cards today. Legendary now on to God King Scoville. They're going to burn through this boss here. They do have that bloodlust available. They will have army once Odin comes up for that specific burn phase when they get the rune buff. They can just send everything that they have. Oh, or even bloodlusting here. Fine. It's fine by me. <laughs> they have so much time to play back on. Yeah, and I mean, even though this series didn't really look too good for, you know, Legendary and Sloth, in this Ruby Life, well, I mean, Legendary did a really good job in this dungeon here as well. But yeah, I think all of these teams in the in the global final just performed incredibly well and they're just like the best teams in the world and i don't think sloth has to feel bad to lose against legendary such a high caliber team and all of the teams as i said in the globals are just so so good so i think uh that was just an incredibly good effort by sloth um and yeah i mean it doesn't work out all the time they played really well in their other series this series just unfortunately did not work out for them in that ruby and in that hulls as legendary did finish off King Skull Vault, and now the only thing that is stopping them from moving on in this lower bracket here is Odin. Yeah, and we all love when it takes a little while for a boss to spawn, so <laughs> Legendary probably is stretching right now, making sure that uh, all of their fingers are warmed up to, to press those buttons that they're now going to press in a couple of seconds. Odin wants to talk a little bit more before he goes into fight and Sloth now rolling up on the right side for the Kings as well. They're trying to claw back time. They're not giving up here. They do want this back. Both teams have one battle rest available and Sloth will get another bloodlust in three minutes if that boss fight on the left should take that long. Yeah, just to get a little bit of a comparison here, if you look at Legendary's time. So the fastest Halls of Valor we've seen so far was by Mandatory, and it was an 18 minutes and 21 second clear. So Legendary, uh, not too far off. This Odin is not going to take too much longer. Uh, they just have to wait for that uh, rune to come out so they can let, get the buff and finish off this boss. So yeah, a pretty good run by Legendary. They At this point, they know what happens to Sloth, they know they're really far ahead. So they could probably do this dungeon a little bit quicker, like we've seen them do already, uh, where they had the 18 minutes and 39 seconds run. But yeah, there we go, the runes are coming out, and let's see if they can nuke this boss with this buff. Yeah, that's exactly what they will try to see. Army of the Dead now being used by Turbo PI has also gone out. They're blasting as much as they can. Look at Eatlu being up there with Splat. That is crazy amounts of damage that this healer is doing here. That's a Resto Shaman, just making sure for anybody that was maybe confused if that's a 4 DPS comp that we're seeing right now. But it is over 19 minutes and 29 seconds in a 2 to 1 claiming legendary the, the victory here against Sloth. And uh, that's exciting for for many reasons. Not you know not only because Legendary played well this weekend, but this also sets up a battle in uh, two matches from now. Excuse me.
between Cheese and Legendary, our two last stand tournament teams. So that's going to be something to look forward to. But for now, Tettles, take us to that game. Dude, I, I mean, Legendary, they played basically their game whenever they map this out in practice and I, I bet like some of their better runs this is what they look like whenever they're whenever whenever they're able to do these keys um now it wasn't perfect but i mean in reality halls of valor is just such a difficult dungeon to consistently have a perfect run in that legendary has to always be happy with what's going on here for sloth though it, it, i think it just proves like how difficult some of these pulls are in halls of valor so they were taking the shield maidens and the aspirant into this boss it's actually such a dangerous pull and, and Simkins goes down, and then eventually this just kind of turns into a wipe for Sloth just due to the uh, losing a player, and then it just ended up dragging out for an extended period of time, and it was just a really drawn-out wipe. Legendary looked good, though. Like, a lot of the pulls that they're doing in this area are, are quite scary. Doing the wargs into the boss is never something you would see on live, and so the teams looking to be able to do this at such a high key level is just, inc like, incredible. They were able to also get their four kings. I actually I thought they weren't going to be able to get this done. So big shout out to Lapan being able to kind of salvage this. It looked like their second king, Bjorn, was being a bit slow to activate, but Lapan keeping it cool, able to get both of the other two kings activated at the absolute last second. And so legendary 1929, maybe maybe not their fastest run. But you can only be so upset with a one death. Uh in her a one death situation. It was it was really good from Legendary, and we're going to see them move on. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, again, thinking about their opponent down the line, it's it's cheese. I feel like we're we're going to need to see a, a higher level of Legendary play later in the day for them to avoid going home because cheese looked good in our first match of the day against Echo. So there's a, it's it's not going to be easy for Legendary, but they've managed to get that far at least. I think uh, last stand yeah. teams always come into the global finals with some weird voodoo, and they just end up blasting. Like they, they <laughs> for whatever reason, always come in hot. Yeah. Toba sure was enough, saying well, there that it's is good practice for bracket. them. Okay. Sure. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, this means, <laughs> excuse me, we're moving on to our next elimination matches shortly after the break. It's going to be perplexed versus thundered. And uh, Thundered, actually, the team that play Echo earlier in the day, managed to take a map off of them. And then Perplexed, of course, uh, going up against Mandatory. It was close, but uh, they got sent down. That should be a pretty pretty high-powered one, too. Nagura, what are you expecting to see out of that one? Hmm, I mean, so looking at Perplexed versus Thundered, I think the, the obvious thing to say is that Perplexed would win. But Thundered played really well. I mean, they played really well against Echo, yeah. uh, winning a game against them, and then also just beat Donuts. So, yeah, I mean, at this point, I think they could win against Perplex. I think it is going to be really close. I got a tinfoil hat theory. Thunder's always got voodoo <laughs> against other teams, and they just, yeah. I'd rather be lucky than good, and they make them wipe. Wow. <laughs> I believe. That's the second time in five minutes you claim the team has voodoo. Tells, I think I mean, we're going to need I, a, I a caster card on what exactly that means. Either you got it or you don't, Makes, and if you know, you know. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Maybe maybe we can figure it out during the break. We'll, we'll try our best, but uh, when we come back, Perplex versus Thunder, don't go anywhere. MDI Dragonfly Global Finals returns in just a few.
World of Warcraft Dragonflight Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals. Your host, Doey, here along with Dratnos, Ironic, and Tettles. And the elimination bracket continues. Perplexed versus Thundered coming up next. Uh, I, I don't even know. I don't even know what we're going to see anymore. We saw such amazing, tight, clean play in our first few matches. Then it got messy. Then it got gnarly. It got wild. Um, what in the world are we going to see out of Perplexed and Thunder? Dratnos, you were, you were observing. You were watching what was going on in the last couple. Uh, what, what's your take on that? And then what do you expect in this one? Well, yeah, the last few were definitely... Definitely something was happening there. A couple of dungeons went went a little sideways. I suspect that was the only scuffed dungeon runs we're going to see this whole weekend, though. I think from here on out, wow. uh, it's going to be clean. Although, okay... Now, one thing that would one counterpoint against that is we're starting off in twenty three sanguine explosive tyrannical Algathar Academy. <laughs> this is a okay. a volatile dungeon, volatile to the extent that Echo versus Cheese earlier was was not clean runs from either team uh, in this map. So uh, this is something that I think is going to be very likely to to pose serious risk to both Perplexed and Thundered. What's your uh, what's your read on Perplexed actually banning that in their series versus mandatory earlier? Is, is that is that worrisome for perplexed then at that point because thunder was willing to play it versus echo now it wasn't the cleanest it wasn't the cleanest series for thunder versus uh, echo whenever they went to Algathar Academy um, but I, I I guess I'm a bit more worried with perplexed banning it yeah you know this is it's a map where the meta is kind of very unsolved right are you playing warlock right. are you playing are you playing Fragments' you know, Havoc DH? Are you, you coming, coming in here with some really cool tech? Or uh, what, what is the way to get this dungeon done as quickly as possible? And how does the Sanguine Explosive factor throw a wrench into what you might have done in the Cup weekends? I don't know what the answer is. And yeah, I, I think it is probably not great news for Perplex that the map they banned earlier this weekend is not bannable in this series. Usually whenever that happens, that's... Uh, Either really good news because it means you saved secret tech for it, or more likely, slightly bad news. Ooh, it's right. time to find out who takes the early lead, at least, as the map has begun. No Warlock. I don't like that. But we got like Rogue for snapping? Well, so, yeah, but the thing is you don't need to snap anymore, right? Because you can take those wind sure. tunnels in combat, so the snapping tech is, like, pretty unimportant. Mm -hmm more consistent with the Roga thing, but yeah. I'm looking on the right side of the screen, we already see Thundered. Um, in instead of going left to the Veximus route like we see a lot of other teams, we know that they are the team that was running this overgrown ancient side first, and we already see them getting that big lash or pull uh, grouped up. This is actually an incredibly dangerous pull, but it's more akin to something that you would actually see on live, uh, but still dangerous nonetheless. On the left side of your screen, though, the most dangerous pull, one of the most dangerous pulls of the dungeon is happening for Perplexed right here, as they have this Ravager into all of these manifestations, and you need to make sure that you have a perfect CC chain on these uh, mana, uh, mana fiends. If you also allow them to Sanguine heal even just a little bit, it can become problematic. But I am down for approximately 2 million Sanguine healing, and most of it's only on that Battle Axe for Perplexed, as Vex is going to be a summoned here. Hey, that was a great... I'm yeah. down for that. Only 2.87 million for a pull of that size? Hey. Both teams keep right. the Sanguine healing a little on the low side. A little bit of extra healing on the Skitter flies at the last second here for Thunder, but that's not the worst case in the world, right? In order to spawn yeah, the fine. Overgrown Ancient, you just need to kill the Lashers, and you can finish off the Skitter flies later. There's extra group damage. But of course, the reason that Thunder do come over here is to get the mind control on that Restorer, right? It'll give that haste buff out to their team, which is incredibly useful. You can see Zook already has taken control of that, and they will keep that mind controlled for as much of the dungeon as they can. And here we go, pulling trash down onto the Overgrown Agent. This is what they're saving their lust for. Doesn't seem to be something that's caused them so, too many issues, but this boss is pretty difficult. Highest key level tyrannical. So, uh... So he's, he's mind controlling with Dominate Mind, right? Bazookas, the Restorer. What is, what is Ryson doing? Just standing in a puddle. We're perplexed. By being, or he's DC'd. One or the other. That or he's DC'd. That is unfortunate if he's oh, DC'd. I think he's DC'd, man. No because healer. He got, because he got laid, right? Like, he, he got laid in the puddle. Yeah. So they're trying to keep him alive, but now he's dead. And Dude, Perplex is wiping. You can't do oh, this. There's no way. My gosh. It looks like Ryson's maybe back. Does look like that is a huge time loss for them. Cooldown's committed to the boss. 
I mean, they, get, they have their cooldowns back up again, but that was a solid minute of time that they just lost, and of course they're not going to have that buff provided by the mind-controlled mob that Thunder do have access to, so it's going to be a tough yeah. battle, battle for them if that is the case. There's also a vibe Thundered. to it. Because yeah, it also like kills things like, such as your thundering, you know, it also maybe desyncs your cooldowns in a really weird way, uh, just for the remainder of the run, and it, it's just something that, if this happened in practice, you would immediately zone out and start again. Or perplexed with this being the the MDI attempt run, they have to play through, and it's going to be tough. Let's see how they're going to be able to recover. I think at this point, you're kind of hoping that Thunder has a, a solid mishap with uh, either like Sanguine healing or some of their pulls. Um, all they need is like some potential deaths, and we know with that Algathar Academy on this 23, it is possible. Definitely is possible. We've seen many mistakes made by the best teams, including Echo in this dungeon. Again, you know, highest key level. Many, many things can go wrong here. Let's see how Thunder choose to deal with the trash in this area. They do a little bit of a backward strat, like we've been talking about, going to Ogre Nation first. Normally, what people tend to snap with Proth are those mobs in the Ogre Nation's room. However, they have to pull some Ravagers. Instead, we see Baby heading over towards the Ravagers. Probably wound up pulling a couple of them and then joining back up with the group. Sending his pet, actually, to attack them. I like that. Keeps him very safe. They will still snap to him whenever they come up, but Zook will be keeping a very close eye on him to make sure he doesn't go down, even committing both the wall and the dark pack just to make sure he doesn't accidentally go down to aggro as they do snap up and they're still untargetable. Alex able to get aggro on them. Only one mana fiend so far. There we go. There's a battle axe and another mana fiend in the back there. This uh, this pull is really weird with snapping. Sometimes, sometimes not everything comes that you're trying to uh, actually get snapped. Had some had some weird experiences with uh, the snapping on this pull. Okay, so let's Plus let's talk about the in differences general, right? in. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the differences in route a little bit. How do you feel about keeping that restorer and, and wielding it around and just uh, dragging it around like Thunder is doing with uh, Bazook and Dominate Mine? Do you think that this is like a faster strategy generally? Or do you think that this going Vex route with uh, a minimal amount of backtracking, that kind of thing, is uh, something that's a little bit superior? How are you feeling about this, Zyra? I think that the perplex strategy of going Vexamus first is definitely the faster strategy, but it's definitely more volatile. Yeah in that you aren't giving yourself access to that extra buff to make these bosses and pulls a little bit extra easier, right? It, uh -huh, it sounds a little tired, but you know the more damage you do, the shorter the pull lasts, which means there's less things that you have a potential chance to die to. Now, of course, there is the added difficulty of making sure you have to redominate mine the mob every now and then, but you can redo that out of combat, right, in between pulls. So there's a little bit of safety play to it. I mean, I had some experience that with, uh, with Arcway back in the day when you had to mind control mm -hmm. the, uh, the demon that gave you the haste buff too. It's just an extra thing to keep your keep your mind on, but with enough practice, I feel like it's probably the safer strategy to go through with. Okay, so now Thun I, I think that Thunder are like in a pretty easy part of the dungeon here. They just need to make sure that their sanguine management, especially on these small birds, is uh, solid. But they're with uh, not snapping any mobs to this area, or actually having dealt with the manifestation snap that they were doing um, on this platform. They're they're playing mm -hmm. mostly what is some like akin to like a live route for this right here. Now. The rest of the dungeon is going to be hard for Thunder, and, and that's where the difficulty is going to ramp up. For Perplexed, I don't want to say they're through with the difficult part of the dungeon, but I think that they only have like one one to two more difficult pulls uh, left for them, depending on like what's going to be going on with some of their snapping. I think I think they're going to have one difficult snap pull, and then one final difficult pull into the boss, where Thunder's going to have, I think, like two, two more, or like three more very challenging pulls ahead of them. Yeah, I mean, it's all going to come down to the snap pull and how efficient they are, right? What do they snap? Mm -hmm. Does the snap go well for them? I I don't like Thunder's count right here. I think that that's something I'm looking at. Like, are, are they going to play this, like, super slow and... Do they have three pulls before Vex? Do they, have, do they only have two pulls before they Vex? Have... Is, that what's, is that what this count means? I think so. I think they've got, like, essentially three pulls that they have to do. They have the entire Vexamus room. They have the entire, like... Ravager platform, they can just shroud past the bridge, right? They don't have to worry about that. Well, they can't shroud past, but they can get past with, with Mind Soothe, right? So Priest Shroud, mm -hmm. yeah, of course. <laughs> Priest Shroud. There's there's ways to get past it, right? We saw the Fear Meld tech. Of course, Bazook isn't actually Knight. He's not Knight Elf, so he can't do that, but there are ways of getting yeah. past it that they can that they could do. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah. I, I don't like that. See that that's that's my problem with this strategy. Again, I don't think it's the fastest strat, because 
you're severely limiting what you can actually snap up to these platforms. The so we can see Perplexed is snapping up those three mobs here. Actually, oh, Swag down on this point too. I, I think Swag died off. No, no, he's right there with the group. I thought, I thought he would be the one to go snap. This one, this one. He's, he's well, going to go okay, snap so, after this. Yeah, he's just going to release and go snap anyway. Oh, the Guardian Sentry is healing. Deal. Oh my god, get him out of the Sanguine. No! Oh no, Perplexed, no! more issues. No! Three million health! Get him man. out of there, man. Yo, does Sanguine he? Does Sanguine stream? Like, dang, keeping that Guardian Sentry alive for so long. Alright. Beast healer. Only three million. Okay, okay. Can we get a swag check? We, we can jump on over to where he is. He's going to be snapping some mobs. I... It's interesting. It's interesting to see that Swag is doing this on a rogue, especially since, like you said earlier, we saw it was Cheese, I believe, that used like Stasis and a Havoc Demon Hunter to do it, and then mm -hmm. Echo's been doing some weird stuff with like a Feral Druid and a Disc Priest to be able to get these snaps dealt with. But Swag, the tried and true rogue, with the tricks. It is also important to note that the aggravated Skitterflies do not snap, uh, so you're gonna have to actually utilize Meld or Invisibility or Vanish or something like that. That's why Ryson and Shine are both playing. Well, it's part of the reason why both Ryson and Shine are playing um, Nelf. I wonder what Divine is gonna do though, because I think he's gonna be perma combated with those Skitterflies, isn't he? Ooh, Shine goes Shine down. Shine going down here, too. Still no battle res. 30 seconds. They're probably going to just have to res him in between. But the problem is that they're going to be in combat for a long time. Maybe Ryzen can get a meld res off at some point. But it's going to have to be after these lashers go down. Once the explosives stop spawning from so, all of the eagles. I mean, I don't know if he's going to actually be able to get that off. They just have to wait for the battle res. A little unfortunate. Yeah. It's because like the explosives are gonna fake combat you, right? Even if even if you went for the meld res, the the amount of mobs that they have here, the explosives are just gonna continuously spawn and then put you in combat to the point where you're not able to res. Um, it's gonna be unfortunate. And they're gonna have to commit B res on the right side though. Yo, Thunder, they got the voodoo, man. I'm telling you, every single time we see them, they got voodoo. It's better to be lucky than to be good in some situations, and uh, they're gonna be able to <laughs> well, down they are also, here. They're all also definitely good. And again, the safety of the of the play they're doing here, right? They can do certain things like giving that massive haste buff to the Warlock for the damage up, and he can just pop off on single target burst. Look at how much damage he did there. 105k single target damage. It's pretty so, ridiculous he what said, you can do with that damage amp. P.I. me. I'm wearing a corrupting rage file. Heal me. Give me that restorer buff. I understand. Give me AI. Buff Mark of the Wild. I will carry. It's also important to mention that he's doing that with full AoE talents as well, right? Wow. Okay. He's he's doing a ton that does that just does that gives so much of a damage up to the warlock with your cooldowns. It's ridiculous. Dude, Aff, I mean, Aff does good single target damage in him plus generally. There, there are mm -hmm. a lot of specs that lose a considerable amount of single target damage to play like AoE talents or something like that. Aff is not normally one of them. Aff is just a weird spec where like they're either good at eight plus targets or they're good at single target and they're you know not really much in between um but hey I, this is the this is the aft dungeon i mean this is this is the dungeon that affliction is just very very dominant and dominant in so it's it important to mention as well this is after all of the nerfs and bug fixes that occurred last week right it's it's still a very good spec so it's ironic calling out that aft still broken perhaps <laughs> yeah oh not broken Ooh. enough to just stay alive while burning rushes on permanently, unfortunately, here. They've got two battle reses, so they're going to have to expend one of them to keep him with the group, but a little bit of an unfortunate scenario there. Oh, can't believe the Bazook Ravager just didn't heal him, but Bazook can't win. heal him when he's dead. Oh, the, the, the second the, battle res gone in the same pole. And the Restorer's out What's now. What's going on, uh, 200? Dude, the Restorer's out. We have to dominate mind it. Okay, so we, we committed another B-res, yeah? He's got it. He's got it. Right, we got it, it re-MC. Both battle reses expended. Everything's fine. Got the Restorer back, but this Ravager. Look at that 7 million Sanguine healing. A large portion of that went into this Ravager. They're just going to have to spend time single targeting this down. What a waste of time. I mean, these are the things that's going to allow Perplex to somehow, some way, come back in this, this match. They're still they're still behind. Does Perplex win this? No, are, are they behind? So, so oh, Perplex wait. doesn't have any more trash to, trash pulls, right? No, they have, sorry. They have one more trash pull, but it's into the final boss. I think that I think that Perplexed has Skitterflies into Overgrown Ancient and the remaining like Echo Knights and stuff like that into uh, Echo Dorgosa. Thundered has all of this trash pull plus Vex. 
plus. Uh, oh the no, a shine going order. down. Oh, it all goes out I the window. Think, I don't think perplexed no battle res. that death. That is Absolutely very bad not. for perplexed. And that was they, they haven't done their damage amp yet either. So that's one player down for both of their goals. This is this is the worst case scenario for them. All right, let's look on the right side I mean, of the screen here. As Thunder is like in one of the final few hard parts of the dungeon, they need to make sure that the Sanguine management here is perfect. And they get a nice knock, a, a nice Typhoon early on. Maybe that was a Blast Wave knock as well. Couldn't really tell, but it separated the mobs, made sure that Sanguine healing was to a minimum, and the Ravager does go down for Thunder. Now, Bazooka has to redominate, mind you. You see him get clocked a little bit. Their count is really high, by the way, for the side of Thunder. So I they're think gonna... they're going to be skipping like everything. Yeah, I'm uh, we've seen how difficult Echo Adoragosa is with a lot of trash, um, particularly like the 25 to 30, uh, the 20 to 25 percent count range on the Echo Adoragosa pull is very, very mm -hmm. dangerous. And so I think that Thundered playing something a little bit smaller, fewer invokers, it should it should be pretty advantageous for them. Lowers the ability for them sound... to be able to wipe as well. It's gonna sound really cooked, but I don't remember percentages in this dungeon. I just remember that there's 450 count. And I know the yeah. last pack right before Echo of Dorgos' room is in the mid 30s for how much count it gives. How much are these foragers gonna give? I don't think it's gonna be enough for that pack to be the only one that they'll need. Nah, yeah, no, I think no, they'll no, need to get a couple extra mobs. They gotta, they gotta well, do a two pack. They, 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 do they two have to do like eight yeah. mobs. So I think that they'll do like the Echo. I think they'll do like the Echo Knights and the door pull is what I'm is what I'm thinking like one of the Echo Knight pulls and so they'll just have like two invokers in the pack. Should be chill. Dude on the left side of your screen here perplexed. They're So what what teams have been doing is they've been like double throwing the goals and having all of the buffs spawn and then like with thundering you're able to just like burn the boss. We're perplexed here having a real steep battle with Croth just taking so long because of shine going down early on. But now they're making their way over to Overgrown Ancient. They only have uh, two two pulls left in this dungeon. For Thunder, they have to be able to finish off Veximus. And then they have one pull into the Echo Doragosa. So there's only two pulls that separate them as well. But they have a pretty I significant mean, uh, they have a pretty significant boss HP lead here. Yeah, they're 70% ahead on boss damage. It's, it's in a significant some, lead. And also, time here. And they have access to the damage buff as well. Right? Perplex does not have that right now. That's true. So, yeah. Where's, it's, uh, it's where's an, Divine? Where is Divine Field? See, this is what I was wondering about earlier. So, a lot of tanks have been um, playing Prot Warrior and having to meld off uh, combat. All right, Divine is back. Where did he, where did, where he, did he go? Where did he come from? Hot Night Joe. Okay, hopefully Dratnos has a little bit of uh, information as to what might have occurred there. We'll have I see to him. See. I see him scratching his head. He's trying to figure it out. I, I see him in the in our uh, <laughs> other POV. I think I he's can, on it. I can hear. I can hear his thoughts. What do these two want me to do now? Uh. <laughs> All right, Bazooka. Did Bazooka just die? Or did he get meleeed by his restorer? I can never tell. I have, a, I have a suspicion that he dies and let the, lets the Restorer reset there. No, 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 he, he didn't die because they had two deaths earlier. Yeah, Maskin, I don't picking know. up the blue Dragonflight buff makes me question as to whether or not he had that the whole entire time or if that's new. That or he's swapping to Mastery, which I wouldn't really understand. It's more AoE maybe for this big pull. Maybe they just want to play it safe and get the trash dead as quickly as possible because they know they're so far ahead. But haste is definitely like just as comparable on AOE damage, so I don't really understand okay. the Oh, reason, I see. What, I see what's going on. Here we go. So, so this patrol, by the way, is uh, the mob. The mobs aren't. Oh, okay, never mind. So Sub Chris actually rooted a mob that was off to the right hand side, and so they needed part of that pack plus the pack that's in the doorway. They likely rooted one of the invokers because the invoker is the most dangerous part of the pack, and if you don't have like enough uh, interrupts for them, or say you have multiple. Three plus invokers in a pull, it's going to be difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so Thunder is taking a little bit slow. They're going to have that root expire in 30 seconds, and then that invoker is going to come in. But in the meantime, Thunder is already going to have that pack 
somewhere in the order of like 30% HP. As you see, Maskin is combusting. We have Baby popping all of his offensive CDs. Sub Chris is in that end Karn. And so we're able to actually do just an insane amount of AoE. Now we have to watch out for Sanguine. Another boss. We do. But things are looking great for Thunder tier. Man. The damage from these bosses on 23 Tyrannical is oh, insane. Sanguine. Every sanguine. Time sanguine. One of those ah, upheaval ah, comes ah, out. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Got it out. Beep, beep. Got it out. Beep, beep. Don't worry about Get it. Get him out of there. I don't know. We're good. No problems here. <laughs> Look the other way. Don't you know what I think either. it was, Tettles? I think Divine Field was probably changing his buff. That's the only thing that makes any sense to me. Divine was changing his buff? Potentially. It's a timed event, Zyro. It is a timed event. But if you're in the same situation that Perplex is in right now, where they can only really capitalize on a huge mistake from Thunder, like what just mm. happened to them, Sub Chris going down at 70% on the boss? We don't have a B res. No B res for over a minute now. I mean, they will be able to get a res on him when this dungeon. This boss is not going down in a minute, but this is the kind of opening Perplex needs. One more mistake from Thunder. Perplex could somehow, some way, find a way back in this dungeon after all the mistakes, after the DC on the first boss. There is still a chance. Where did they? Where did they lose their B res? So, so I they were at two deaths coming out of Vexus. I didn't see where they had the third one. Oh, it must have been Bazook. I think the Bazook actually ended up sacking himself, and it was just a late update. Oh, no. No no B-Res for Sub Chris here. I mean, is this... Surely they, they're they able to four-man this before Perplex is able to finish off this dungeon, right, Zyro? I mean, I, I would have potentially thought there was a chance for Perplex to come back if they tried to go for this trash pull into the boss, but they're playing it safe. They're playing... Off of the only possibility being that Thunder wipes on the boss with their trash. That is what Perplex Thunder gets, is playing uh, for. Thunder, if you look at the top right, they get a B res back up in 17 seconds. And so Sub Chris will be able to get res by uh, Baby. Be able to deploy that Soul Stone here in just a moment. For Perplexed, like you were saying, yeah, now they're taking some of this trash from the boss. It's not, it's not all in one pull. But Thunder need to just make sure that they play safe. Big IO is afoot. You want to know something that I think about oh, this? I think other people share this opinion, Tettles. Echo of Doragosa is one of the uh -huh. hardest bosses in the game. And here's I why. I am really bad at I am very bad at this fight. I always get breathed because I like to play too the far from the boss breath, and then I get dude, shot. The astral breath just instantly goes off. My it's bad. like a one second cast and it just goes bang. That's hard to react to if you aren't already pre-moving it. Whereas if you think of a boss like, you know, like Razageth, what does the boss do? It like charges up its big attack, it says die, <laughs> and then it shoots it off after like five seconds. Okay. Come on. This so boss Zyra is harder than Razageth. So Zyra once again proving that Mythic Cluster is infinitely uh, more skilled than Raiders. And it's actually not close because one boss yep. in M plus is harder than the hardest boss of a raid. And so that's only one dungeon as Thundered able to take down Razageth Senior in the Echo of Doragosa, and able to take the first map over Perplexed, they said it couldn't be done. But Thunder said, step aside, we got voodoo. There, there you go, the uh, the Tettle's voodoo striking again. And uh, Perplexed, unfortunate situation earlier, and, and Thunder strikes and uh, takes map number one, and uh, puts themselves one map away from moving on to the lower uh, semifinals and from eliminating Perplex, which would be quite a shock, wouldn't it? But, I mean, again, Dratnos, we just have no idea what to expect when it comes into these dungeons now. Oh, Dratnos is muted. Oh, I think Dratnos may be muted. I can't so, hear him. I'm sure that what he is saying in, is in the meantime, very funny. Hello? Ah. Well, what are your thoughts oh, on this, on these, on these pulls, Tettles Zyron? How are you now? <laughs> Hello. Can you oh, hear me now? Oh, okay. there he is. He's back. All right. That one wasn't my go. fault. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Here's uh, here's some of the replay. We missed that first little bit with the old rice in DC, which uh, is of course very unfortunate whenever whenever anything like that happens. But Perplex did a good job of of still keeping with it and and trying to uh, trying to catch back up. And Thunder certainly were looking a little bit vulnerable in the rest of this run as well, right? Like there were uh, there were definitely some issues there. You can see. You can see how Ryson ended up going down, you know, standing in the Sanguine Puddle. Uh, definitely a disconnection, which you do get a Grief Torch reset, so there's a silver lining, but unfortunately it was not enough for them to be able to beat Veximus. This dungeon also saw quite a few Sanguine Heal incidents, 
We saw this Guardian Sentry getting Sanguine healed by these mobs. It's a really nasty mob because it stands still and casts several times, but that's not even what Sanguine healed it here. It's just the un unwieldy hitbox yeah. of the mob as well, <laughs> keeping it in that Sanguine for ages. Luckily, they were able to get it out before that Expel Intruders, but that was a, a nasty, nasty sequence there. Also, I, I want to talk about the Aflock single target because this isn't even with Lust, right? This is just PI. I guess the boss does get a damage buff and you get a haste buff as well on this fight, but that's a lot of damage. <laughs> that is a lot of, of He's getting a 50% haste buff, man. I'm, it's just, it's a lot. You know, so is Mask and so is Subcris, but, you know, they're not playing Aflox, so it's, uh, that, that spec is kind of built diff in this dungeon. Part of the reason I suspect why this spec's so good in that dungeon as well uh, is how, how nicely it works out on that fight. This was another area of uh, concern, I would say, for Thundered. You can see that Ravager bathing in some Sanguine over there. It does always jump the farthest person, but it can be really hard to bait that. And then that breath that it does is actually really long range. You can see uh, caused them some pr troubles there. Subchris also uh, ended up going down here. You can see gets hit by an orb. That was the third. And, and then the, the arcade missile as well from the boss. Uh, wombo combo taking him out and uh, no battle res available. This could have been costly for them, but uh, perplexed were doing this dungeon. I understand, you know, not wanting to just pull everything into boss. I think in their position, it was probably correct to to say, you know, okay, we're only going to win if they wipe. Let's just make sure we don't wipe. But from what we know now, they may have actually had a chance if they'd gone all the way in, right? If they just pulled it all onto boss. So uh, unfortunate, unfortunate circumstance there for perplexed they are a veteran team though they are going to be good at you know shaking that one off especially because this was a map where they banned it out before right they didn't play the warlock in yeah. here there's a good chance that their plan for if they were going to win the series 2-1 they probably expected it would involve going down uh, in this first map that's right and that points us towards the next map which is going to be shadow moon burial grounds as we take a look at some of the final numbers of that and, uh, you know, if you're perplexed, I feel like you kind of just shrug and you say, all right, well, we had the DC, you know, we did the best we can. We made it pretty competitive even with the DC. So let's just pretend it's, you know, just essentially a, uh, you know, you have to win two in a row to get through. And that's just the situation we're in now and sort of wipe the slate clean as they go into the second map of the series. I'm feeling pretty good about perplexed odds and Shadowman Burial Grounds. Just so we have some stats. Sure. Both of these teams have played Shadowman already. Um, Perplex played it in their series versus Sloth. They put up a time of 12-14, but they had two deaths, and they were able to win that, that map versus Sloth, where Thunder has actually played it twice, and they, both times, one of their runs was a zero-death, 12-minute, 50-second run, and the second death, uh, hmm. second one was a one-death, 12-27 run. And, I mean, while Thunder has won it both times, that they were in this dungeon and, and avoided catastrophe, Perplexed route, I mean, it seems a little bit faster. It seems like they may be able to have the edge time-wise in this dungeon, even with a couple of mistakes. Well, we will see. I mean, this is one of the dungeons that people are still kind of... Teams are still kind of innovating a little bit on it, it seems like. But the dungeon's underway now. Let's see if Perplex can tie it up. And again, every single time we come into this dungeon, I don't think we've seen a single mirror comp in here at all. Mm -hmm. People have been swapping between Prot Palad and Prot Warrior. Whether you're playing the Nudist Priest, you're going back to the old Evoker. Even the DPS comps differing here, again, the Unholy DK we know from experience watching these teams, it brings a better single target profile, so bosses will die a little bit faster. But on a fortified Raging Key, is that what you really need to make sure the pulls go safely? The key point, though, I think is the uh, Fire Mage for both of these teams. That's that's the big, mm -hmm. that's the class that does a lot of the heavy lifting, particularly on this first boss. Um, this first boss is very, very dangerous. And if you don't, if you end up like getting either the ad consumed by the boss or you lose a little bit of damage on Sedana, uh, it can become problematic. So boss damage is by far the most important thing to make sure we, we miss that second ad cast or able to get the boss killed off before that happens. Now 22 fortified, it's not an easy feat. In the meantime, both of these tanks are under a ton of pressure from these double ri uh, animated Ritual of Bones packs. Just the Void Slash, it does so much damage. So Divine and Alex on both their sides are going to have to do a great job of keeping themselves alive. Tattles, look at the burst damage that can still come out of that Preservation Evoker, though. I saw him peaking at a little over 200k DPS. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nuts, helping get this trash down as quickly as possible and letting the team focus more on that boss damage. You can see, even with the Unholy DK that has the PI, that has the Lust for its Army of the Dead, 
the boss is still 10% higher for Thundered. I would be interested, like, I wonder I wonder if we can get some stats on Sedona Blood Fury damage, uh, like, after this map. Because, I, like you were saying, like, just look at how much lower it is for Perplex. And, and Swag, like, individually, if you look at this Spreece, like, his damage doesn't look, like, that high. Um, but then, like, Divine and Ryzen, like you were stating, they're just making up for that. If you, if you look at Divine's damage, 150k DPS on that pull, whereas Ryzen was at, like, 100k DPS. Whereas for Thunder, it's, uh, like, Bazook and Alex. They're, they're quite close on this Dark Communion on the side of Thunder. We're perplexed. Dude, they weren't even close. Yeah, I mean, they, they didn't have to worry about that at all. Let's break down what Perplexed is doing here a little bit, because it's so different from what any other team is doing. That yeah. first set of trash... After the boss, they have a mass route on it to make sure that it stays up there. They don't have to worry about the cast for as long as possible. Ring of Peace on the Exhumed Spirits, spawned by the Exhumers as well. Divine dropping really, really low, but able to top himself off there. I think that was the Leon Hands committed. It was very he's scary, but he's able now. to keep himself alive. He does have forbearance now, so that is why I think that is. But now, those mass routed mobs are starting to walk on down, and uh, as they funnel into Ryzen. the group, they can use their AoE CC to make sure those two, not too many of those running Void Lashes, go off onto the group, and now they're safe. They're in the Soul Steel phase. This prevents all of the mobs from casting on anything, because there's nothing for them to cast on, and with that damage buff, they can very easily burn this trash down. Now, there is a little bit of a time limit, right? You got, like, what, 20, 25 seconds to burn it down before they start casting again? But usually, they can get most of the dangerous mobs dead by that point. Dude, I actually think that the way that Perplex sets this pull up is so safe relative to how other teams do it. Because it kind of always mm -hmm. feels like... Uh, I'm looking for a non... I'm looking for a PG term here. Um, it's always a bit of a clown show at times whenever <laughs> teams <laughs> look to pull the pack together through the wall because they mm -hmm. get the Void Lash on them. But Perplex with the Mass Root... Like that, there's that wall that's separating Nihilish from the other uh, the other mobs, and so they're not going to get Void Lash, but for like two or three seconds, and you just you know commit Tail Swipe and stuff like that. And, and Perplex, they're doing a great job. Nihilish is really low boss HP-wise, and they're going to be able to get this killed off. Now their count uh, is going to be a little bit lower, typically, than some of the mm -hmm. other teams, especially once Thunder kill off these, uh, these Zoomers. But Perplex are able to make sure that they have a perfect count, and they're just going to Invisibility Potion here, I believe is their plan. Yeah, it always sucks using an Invisibility Potion instead of a, you know, a Damage Potion, but if it really helps yeah. you with your routing that much, and it seems like it really does for Perplexed, it clearly is the right call to make. Dude. And look how far ahead of Thunder they are here. Look at the gap that has opened up here. 12 seconds okay. on the first boss, we've opened that up to 21 seconds by the second boss. Plus the death, they're very far ahead. So there's a count differential, but Perplexed makes up that count differential. A lot of teams don't like to play five spiders into this carrying worm. However, if you look at Divine, he's on the Protection Paladin, and that facilitates the ability to be able to do all five of these corpse spiders into the into this uh, worm. So he's going to be throwing an Avenger Shield at one, and he's going to be rebuking the other. Now, they, you only need one melee kick rotation, so a Shine um, is going to be able to kick one, and then you'll probably have like Wolf Disco and Swag together on another. Ryzen is going to be then on one himself, and so you're like... You're eventually going to have one cast go off if you if you have this pull last for too long. But Divine is going to be doing a lot of work with things such as Avenger Shield. Divine Toll is going to be committed at some point as well to also make sure that interrupts are getting dealt with. And mm -hmm. it's very scary, but Perplexed are able to make it happen. Like a lot of times, whenever you see this five spider thing, you, you have DKs using like pet kick. Like that's pretty popular. But without the yeah. DK, it was more of a question of like, how is it supposed to get done? And it's through Divine. Yeah, and if you look at that damn that interrupt tracker on the top left of the screen there, right underneath the Thundering Timer, you can see every single one of their kicks being used on Necrotic Burst just to make sure one of those debuffs yeah. doesn't go on their group. And if you really want to think about it, one of the things, one of the reasons I like the Evoker pick for them, they have so many ways of AoE stopping these casts just in case they accidentally miss a kick or kick something incorrectly, right? They've got both of the knockups sure. and knockbacks from the Evoker. They've got the Dragon's Breath and the, the Fire Nova as well, the Blast Nova from the Mage, right? They have so many different have, tools uh, that they can use to always stop. They also have whatever you call this, where they're the about to feral? hover around the wall and uh, pull True. the spider. Yeah, uh, it, it actually saves you some time as opposed to having... Like, for Thunder, it's likely going to be sub Chris on that Feral Druid. He's going to have to go into Moonkin form and, like, a wild charge over the wall is what I, what I suspect is going to happen for Thunder here. Whereas for Perplexed, on the, the left side of your screen, you're just going to have... You're just going to send Ryzen across the gap... Uh, and then you're going to be able to pull all, all the spiders into the, into the boss. 
Yep, here we go. Bryson. I'm gonna mosey on around this wall here. Walls don't bother me. Let me, uh, need some spiders. Huh. Don't mind if I do. All right. Grip me. One grip. No don't grip. even need it, actually. Don't grip me. It's fine. Let me just he hover says. back. No problems. Of course, making sure you're actually line of sighted from the spiders, because they are going to cast one of those necrotic burst casts as you pull them. But of course, that wall counts as a line of sight, so as long as you're between... Yeah. As long as you have the wall between you, you're good to go. And they won't cast for another 15 seconds or Ooh. so, right? So, on Dude. to the boss we go. Perplex lost a lot of time. Divine was trying to establish threat on this, this these uh, spiders and this plague bat, where Thunders were able to... I think if the a bit better of this exchange here, they were able to pull the trash pack like almost immediately into the boss, and Bone Maw was pulled at virtually identical times for both of these teams. That is true. Yeah, that that this is actually a lot closer than it should be based off of our boss two timers. Now, of course, one of the things we were mentioning, Thunder didn't have to pull those extra two corpse spiders, right? So they didn't have to worry too much about AOEing them down. They could just move on to the carrying worms a lot earlier on. So that definitely was something that was a factor here. Also, Perplex doing a lot of damage to this trash, while Divine Field was, like you were saying, establishing that aggro. They were able to get a lot of damage on the, on the trash, so it is going to go down early for them. What's happening for Thunder, though? Three people got <laughs> inhaled by the boss! What is going Dude, on? Get, Sub Chris get goes down! No! Uh, re no res? You don't have a res, bro! No res? No res? Bone Maw at 50%? What could oh. have happened? My goodness. This is... I, I thought that Thunder were going to be able to do it. Like, it, it was one of the situations that they, they really tied up perplexed. Um, just coming into Bone Maw, but getting three people inhaled, I think they had a situation where their puddle despawned, is, is what I suspect happened. That's the only way you really get three people in the water at the same time like that, is if somebody goes, oh yeah, this puddle's fine, and it was not fine. Now perplexed heal here are going to be able to down Bone Maw. I think they're going to get one more downstairs. Just, please, spit. Give the spit. No! 1% on Bone Maw for Perplex. He might die to dots, oh, as he does go dots, down he to dots. dots. He, not, not the best thing. They could have saved a few seconds there, but hey, Perplex are looking good. Their best time in here so far was 12.15, I believe. Let's go look again. 12.14. And so, they're in a, they have an opportunity to be able to improve on that, Zyra. They definitely do. This last boss can go down on this key level in about, I'd say, like a minute 45 to two minutes. So we'll have to see what clip they go up at when they do get to the boss here, how much time they have left to try to beat their timer here. Remember, Monka does have the fastest time of the weekend, at, I believe, about at 11.47. Of course, they still have to get through these two blueberries here. But we'll see. They definitely are on track to beat their pace, I think. These are very scary uh, with the raging, but we do have a pressing roar with that overall talented for Ryson on the oh. side of Perplexed, being able to immediately soothe off the mobs. What do you say? I What's believe I, I I looked back at the VOD and I saw what happened. During right. the inhale, their quaking yeah. didn't disappear during the inhale. Now, I think that happened on purpose because they still had the monstrous corpse spiders alive. The quaking is supposed to go away during inhale, but I, I, I imagine having the trash alive during the boss did something to inhibit that, and they had to spread out during the inhale instead of just all dying to being stacked with quaking. So that's why three of three okay. of Thunder ended up dropping into the water there. <laughs> you hate to see that. That's a, uh, that's a terrible situation. Okay. Uh, but now, it, it's a, we're in a great spot for Perplexed. It's uncommon. I would say it's impossible for teams to wipe to this boss. We Infrequently do we see teams uh, wipe to just Ner'zhul. Um, this is something very similar to what you do on live. Perplex does have two battle reses available for them as well. They have Lust coming up in 10 seconds. The Thundering is going to be spawning here. They might just jam this Lust on CD. They might wait for the next Thundering, depending on uh, the state of other offensive CDs. Ryson is uh, using his weapon. and it, Yeah, it looks like we're waiting for Combustion and Incarn with, uh, for, our, for our Bloodlust for Perplexed. Yep, just Here waiting for the exact perfect timer, and there it is. No army to wait for, it's just the power infusion and combust that they're really worried about. I guess the end card as well for the Feral Druid to just give it a little bit of extra juice. But with all of 12, those cooldowns active, was their previous boss best. is not long for this world. Yeah, they're about to completely destroy that timer. 
11.47 again from Mandatory, the fastest time of the weekend. Can they potentially even beat that with a completely I... different strategy? Oh, Swag died. No, they cannot no. with a death from Swag. Yeah, I don't think they're going to do it with the death from Swag, but I think they may be able to get a sub-12 here. Maybe not. It's going to be close. Let's see. Oh, a bit more than 1% a second they Either need. Either way, though... I we are going to be going to a yet another Game 3 today. That was five series played so far today. Every single one of them has gone to a Game 3. If that doesn't tell you about the level of competition I we have in this Global Finals, I don't know what will. Every team is sick, man. Oh, gross. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's uh, definitely the closest Global Finals I've seen, both uh, you know when I was a viewer and since I started hosting. But, man... Perplex manages to get it done. It was very clean up until the end, fairly clean up until the end, a little bit of death here and there, but mostly just kind of capitalizing on the opportunities in Dratnos, uh, they had them. Yeah, again, we have the different strategy, the Paladin-enabled strategy of bringing a bunch of mobs in here and then throwing out your shields to kick them from far away. You can see Divine there on a sliver of health, procs the gift of the golden valkyr and then throws the lay on hands into himself and he's back on full health easy was never worried there but wow that that looked scary to the rest of us of course uh meanwhile of course thundered on on a more i, I guess this is the kind of the more prop warrior pull right of taking these two later packs in uh you're not mm -hmm. having these long range avenger shield kicks needed you can get them nice and easy and the aoe interrupt is big enough to just get everything that you need right under the boss uh, that warrior has of course since Perplex skipped those, uh, and they did that trash earlier instead, they have to use the invis pots here, which you guys mentioned, but yeah, that that is like minus a few seconds worth of value uh, to have five invis pots instead of five damage pots, pots across your group, so a little bit of, uh, of subtle downside to doing it this way, but still potentially, you know, a, a better idea, uh, and... I think potentially it's it's just one of those things where it's like this is this is something that the paladin's good at versus something that the warrior's good at, right? Something that the two different comps make happen, and it's something we've seen in a lot of our burial grounds. Now you guys were correct here. This this is where things uh, got a little bit hairy. Was this boss? It, it wasn't for perplexed, right? It was for thundered. Uh, but the way this boss works with the quaking is quaking doesn't spawn in the inhale phase. Yeah. But I think it can if you have the spiders active. Potent. I'm not. I'm not sure why it did spawn here uh, and caught. Maybe, maybe it was like just at the edge of when it would or wouldn't despawn. Yeah, you oh. can see here like this quake. It's it's not actually the inhale yet, right? So uh, they had to spread for that, and then they have to get under the boss real quick, uh, and then they're under the boss. But then they're dodging the thundering, and there's a thundering swirly, and then because of the way the thundering swirly works, yeah. I mean, looking back at this, I'm not sure how Sub Chris ended up getting uh, inhaled there. I'm still. I guess that was uh, that was normal, but then here it was right into the inhale. So this was actually like the quaking right before the inhale, right? It was it wasn't even a case of one of the ones that despawns during the thing. It was it was literally like 0.1 seconds before, just just an unfortunate timing uh, on the quaking there. So tragedy, tragedy for thundered. It's the sort of thing as well where if you have that happen to you on a live key, right? You can yeah. you can sort of recover it or plan around it because you're not fighting the boss with the spiders and the bats. But if you're fighting with the spiders and the bats, that is just too much to deal with, especially if you only have one puddle and you have to just go stand in it. You it's know, really tough for your tank you to be spread. able to. It's really tough for your tank to be able to like live that pack. I mean, dude, we we see tanks even in MDI all the time just drop incredibly low while tanking the boss plus all those spiders. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yep, it's absolutely. A, very lethal tank fight, and also the rescue group, right? Once those two other worms spawn, uh, those things do a lot of damage on 22. Yes. Like the, the random people that they're spitting at, if, if they pick the same person, you know, if that person also has a bat disease on them, that person is in unbelievable danger and probably needs, like, a defensive <laughs> and several healer globals to live through those few seconds. Ooh. So we also got boss damage as well um, from the first boss... Zyra and I were talking about this whenever it happened. Look at the difference um, in Divine and Ryzen versus uh, the Team for Thunder with Bazook and Alex. So Divine is at 3.35 million damage to Sedana and Ryzen's at 3.15. And if we cut over to that Disc Priest Protection Warrior composition, Alex is only at 2.57, Bazook's only at 2.44. So it's like Divine, Divine and Ryzen were really able to put in a lot of work just at being able to accelerate that boss such a significant amount because we saw Thunder... I think th I think that they were really close to actually getting the letting the cast off and letting the boss heal, but it's just the compositional differences, and it's one of the reasons that like 
we really love the unholy DK in here, but it's not the best at everything, right? And you just end up having to play like a disc priest because of it a lot of the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. At some point, you you need to you know acknowledge. I'm sure these teams do that. Damage equals time. That's uh. <laughs> so if you're not doing as much damage, you're taking more time. Exactly. It's an, you in, in, in an MDA <laughs> sense, MDI sense rather. Damage equals time. Yeah. What, what does you DPS do more stand for? Damage per time. second. Oh. Second. But I was just talking regular damage, not DPS. So DPS is that just is damage obvious. per damage then? Is, oh, if damage, no, just damage. damage. And, just and the, seconds are time. The, uh, just the grand concept of damage in general in the world of Warcraft. Okay. There you go. One well, spell, we're going to map three. Two spell two damage. I don't know. Yeah. I, we don't writing do numbers. Down, writing this down. We're going to Temple of the down. Jade Serpent. Dranos is taking notes. <laughs> I got back a pen. I'm not I sure what he's writing. On my desk. But yeah. There you go. <laughs> Might as well use it for something. Temple. That's right, where so we're going next. Uh, yeah. Spiteful Quaking Tyrant Temple. This one is one that I think it's a little bit less harsh than some of the temples we've had in some of our previous weekends, but still a nasty dungeon. Another one where we've seen the Warrior Paladin difference as well, and actually one where we've seen the Warrior die on third boss due to third boss being really nasty uh, for the tank damage, right, of that Jade phase, that 70 to 30% part of the fight. So curious to see what the teams are going to go with in this dungeon. Really, really uh, dangerous. Dangerous all the way through. And you really get no breathing room in here, right? Because it's just nasty trash. A couple, I guess, maybe the first and second boss are a little bit of a breather, but then you have the third boss, the third boss area, the fourth boss, and potentially the trash into the fourth boss. All of that is just all gas, no breaks supreme danger so uh also curious if we'll maybe see some warlocks zyra are you uh you a fan of the destra lock in this place i'm a fan of the warlock every time i see it in dungeons i think it's a very underplayed class in mdi people are too comfortable sticking with the you know quote unquote meta class comp and i feel like the teams that are more comfortable branching out and trying to find extra responses to some of these keys and some of these affixes is just it's really really great like destruction warlock especially and like spiteful keys give so much control on the pack mm -hmm. all of those aoe blasphemy stuns keeping things nice and stacked together so you don't have to worry too much about spitefuls chasing you down is really really nice and then of course the added utility of the health stones you know the random curse of tongues on certain particular mobs i think it's just a very very solid pick and while it's not necessarily like a master of one particular thing it's just generally very good at everything so I like seeing it when it when it's brought out. There you go. I, well, we're waiting for some of the players to get into the uh, the lobby here. Go ahead, Tuttles. As I say, we saw we saw perplexed in Temple of the Jade Serpent earlier today versus Mandatory, and they had a wipe. Right? Yeah. They wiped it like the last pull of the dungeon, the last boss. Something like that. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. Well, no, because didn't they do the first pull, and then they tried to pull everything else into the boss as well, they and did, then they still ended they did up like wiping three. It. Yeah. Three alone, yeah. and then the remaining back three yeah. packs into boss, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. ended up wiping that. We, we've seen some teams do like the whole thing into boss, and it has worked out. Usually, there's one CC mm. caster that comes in later, but like almost everything into boss is possible. But uh, it is really, really nasty, especially with spiteful going on, because the way it works is you have these spitefuls that are hunting you down at the same time that the boss intermission ads are hunting you down, and you got to right. kill those boss intermission ads quick, or else you lose. Right, so. Yeah, a uh, really harsh contrast of what you, you're trying to do there, tension. So I guess there's a question of like, are you more scared that you watch Perplex wipe earlier in the day in, in Temple of the Jade Serpent versus Mandatory? Are you more worried that Thundered was electing to ban it versus Echo? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, think that I'm, I think I'm typically more scared about the ban than the team wiping at the last pull of the dungeon because that at least proves that they, you know, they were consistent through most of the hard parts. Now they were still had one of the hardest parts left ahead of them um, before they were able to pull it off. I think, uh, like, in general, I'm concerned a little bit that Thunder banned this versus Echo, and now we have to go here. Yeah. I mean, uh, Echo did get to play this dungeon earlier uh, today. It was the first dungeon of the day, in fact, and they uh, managed to do a 12.03, which is our fastest time so far this weekend, I believe, for Temple. Mm -hmm. And so... That is a, that's the time to beat if you're uh, looking beyond this match, right? Obviously, that'll help you win this one if you're able to exceed that. But 
looking ahead, you know, you have to imagine if you're coming out of the lower bracket, you're probably going to be facing Echo. So meeting their time is going to be pretty paramount. I'm looking but, at that uh, yeah, versus that Echo right versus twice. That, that Echo versus Thunder matchup. They did ban out the temple, but their other choices really weren't too great in terms of what to ban. Right, they had the knockout offensive as map five. Yeah, which you could use a ban on as well. But the other maps for sure. Shadow Moon, which I think every dungeon tends, every team tends to have a pretty good grasp on. I mean, going back to like even last stand, every team had a pretty similar time in that dungeon. And Algathar Academy, mm -hmm. which is a long, difficult dungeon. I feel like banning a short map against yeah. Echo is typically a play. So I, I, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and guess that they probably banned that because it was like such a short and volatile dungeon, not because they had zero practice. And even then, they would have oh. known coming into today that they would have had to have a strat in that dungeon for sure. I, I don't think any of these teams have zero practice. Like, uh, sure. I think we're a little bit beyond that. I, I think these, all of these teams <laughs> have an intense amount of practice in the dungeons. It's more like we start. They start banning like what they think that either they are not that great at, or they ban what they think that their opponent will be exceptionally good mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you look at like the shorter dungeons too. I suppose that that's it's a smaller you know margin for error too, right? It's a, a lot more difficult to make a mistake and then come back in a dungeon that's 10 minutes versus mm -hmm. a dungeon that's 15, 16 minutes, you know? So there's a lot of little things that go into it, obviously. But again, we're just waiting for uh, one of the last players to get connected. And uh, as soon as they are, we're going to be able to jump into our third map for the series. And then uh, looking even farther ahead, we've got another series that's probably going to go to three maps. It's going to be Cheese versus Legendary. <laughs> that's going to be a fun one to watch as well. Dude, it's gonna be our two last this, stand, Deeps. Just taking a step back for a second. This weekend and today has just been the competition is ridiculous. Have we only had one two zero this whole yeah. entire weekend? And it was the mandatory versus legendary series. Uh that is correct. Yeah. Oh, that my is gosh. correct. Mandatory legendary yesterday. The only two zero so far. I mean, it's it's awesome, right? Because it's, this is just probably the closest MDI finals we've ever had, as far as like skill parity across most if not all of the teams and even the two ones you know there's a lot of a lot of close ones in there we've we've had a couple messy dungeons to be fair but the majority have been very very fun to watch very good and i think it's important to mention and right if somebody's just looking at those matchups on round one and you see the two a legendary you think wow legendary just didn't play very well that's not the case at all they played really oh, no. well they played like within striking distance of monk yesterday sorry mandatory now but like, for instance, their Halls of Valor run against Mandatory, they only lost by 15 seconds. That's the second fastest Halls of Valor we've had all weekend. I mean, it would have beaten yeah. both of the runs in Halls of Valor from the Mandatory Perplex matchup today. So they played incredibly well, and it's just, I don't know, unfortunate luck of the draw that they end up in the lower bracket here. You really can't count that team out. Like, every single one of these teams is still in the bracket. Uh, all of them could very easily just run the gamut here. Yeah. And I mean, look at the teams that have been eliminated already. We, you know, Donuts and Sloth already out. I mean, two great teams. Uh, not teams you would ever say would be the first to go out in any sort of group. But with a group as stacked as we have for the Global Finals, that is just what happens. How are you guys feeling about the voodoo? R.I.P. Donuts and Sloth. <laughs> Goodness, how are you feeling about the voodoo? Well, it's going to be important here. I... I... My money's on Perplexed on this one. I feel like this map uh, favors Perplexed. I think that the Algathar was definitely a, a weakness for them, but I think the rest of the series, uh, and the Temple especially, th this has got to be their... I think this is their, their map to lose, but I don't know. Thunder obviously really, really strong too. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been like this all weekend. I feel like in past MDI groups, finals, and things... You can say, all right, well, this team is pretty heavily favored to win this matchup, but this weekend is totally different, where even when we thought maybe we had one team having an edge over the other, we were pretty quickly proven wrong. So I think we're just going into a lot of these now, just kind of waiting to see what happens. You know, we can use, we can use the data we have, but it seems like uh, on the day, uh, some teams are playing uh, better than ever. Other teams are making uncharacteristic mistakes. It's, it's been a wild weekend. It typically, typically coming into like cup weekends, you'll have like one team that will post a lot of the best times of the oh, here we uh, go. over the course of the whole entire weekend. But <laughs> with how stacked the global finals are, you just have like you know five different teams have it holding five different best times for dungeons. And right right off the bat, we do see uh, kind of similar comps coming in. Both of these teams running. 
Rot Paladin, both these teams running Wrestler Shaman, both these teams running Destruction Warlock. Thundered, bro! They had a full wipe already, or they had three DPS no guy at least. Maybe they, way. maybe it's not gonna full wipe. I mean, the deluge? you're gonna bleed out. To? Oh, that's your cooldowns gone, right? That's your incarn gone. That's your infernal gone. Now your healer's dead. He can awk, but he's gonna die to the next AOE that goes off, unless he's able to get himself top. They do have the spirit link down. This is not the ideal time to use it. They're just out of cooldowns here. I don't see how oh. they live through this. That's a full wipe. It's like we're watching the last stand once again. Meanwhile, perplexed. They're on to wise Mari already. Oh, I don't know how Thundered is able to come back from this. What do you I mean, think? This what do you think the chat all spamming? reset too? Are they spamming it all reset already? too. What did they die to? Was it Deluge? I didn't even see. Like they had a triple kill see. to something. But like the fact that Bazooka didn't die makes me think it wasn't the title burst. Although it could have been. Hold on. I'll see it in a replay in just a second. Be able to identify what it is, maybe. Man. And here's the yeah, really like tough part about this. Deluge. We know that Perplex strategy in this dungeon is not the fastest strat, right? At the very end of the dungeon, they don't pull everything together, they play it safe. That was definitely a chance for Thunder to make a play. If they go for that pull, they could definitely pass up Perplexed. But now, I mean, Perplex has all the time in the world. They're easily going to be two, three minutes ahead based off this burst, this first boss split alone. They could probably walk it in for the rest of the dungeon and they will still make it through. Oh man, it's rough to watch. Thunder still having issues just with the smaller pull. Bazook goes down, has the Ankh again, but Maskin also drops because the healer wasn't alive. It's just going to keep adding up, I fear, too. Swag does go down for Perplexed. There is okay. no battle res, so that is one of many things that needs to go wrong for Thunder to have a chance, but they need to get their pull together before that can happen. It's not going well for them. Two more deaths. Two more deaths on top of that. The only person oh, who stayed alive for this entire no. pull is Alex. We're in a bad situation here, Tettles. Dude, we are, we are in... Yeah, we were in a bad neighborhood. We got Corrupted Living ro Waters running at us. Alex is the only person that is able to save this pool, continuing to kite it back. Are we going to get corpse camped by the Corrupted Living Waters? I've I've been in a similar situation to this before. Oh, we got triple water speakers still left alive, man. All right, maybe going down? Maybe Thunder's going to be able to finish death. off this pool. But do for Perplexed? It wasn't clean? But they are in a significantly superior position. And for them, at they this just point, need to be able to see the run out. See, here's the roughest part, though. At this point, the stream delay has caught up. Perplex knows that Thundered has wiped. They haven't seen the extent of it yet, right? Because all of these chain deaths have only occurred in the past 30 seconds or so. But very soon now, they will have seen what is occurring over on the side of Thundered. And it's going to be hard for Thundered to come back. Perplex has to wipe at the worst of points in this dungeon for Thunder to even have a thought about coming back. And there's really not a lot that they can do about it. Perplexed. Oh, so dude, far baby ahead here. On. Looks like Baby's not, not releasing. He might be DC'd. Zyro. <sighs> Very unfortunate. Apparently we're getting word that he was the one that was uh, DC'd before the match as well. Quite unfortunate for Thundered, but I mean, perplexed. They, they still have a, a lot of dungeon ahead of them, but I think that, you know, Thundered is somewhere in the order of five minutes behind and a lot of cooldowns behind. It's tough. Yeah, it's just really unfortunate. Thundered was a team that. I don't think they were anyone's particular favorite to win the weekend, but they're definitely one of the teams that performed mm -hmm. when they needed to perform. They played extremely well when the pressure was on them. Ah, and Dude, you see, I mean, this is the way that they go out. It's really unfortunate. You and I were kind of talking about it before uh, before we even came on for this series, and I was like, dude, I don't know what is up with Thunder, but they always play the best teams incredibly close. And that was one of the things yeah. that we, we were going to try to talk about it before the... Um, before the series started, but Thunder genuinely is a team that always just plays the best teams very, very close. For they're just good players, and it's something that this is their second MDI together as like a, a core of three with Alex Bazook and Maskin, I believe. 
Uh, and so it's just like, it takes time for them to be able to continue to grow as a team. And they were, yeah, they eliminated Donuts earlier. And they continue to look good. And uh, it's an unfortunate situation with BBD seeing here. But if they continue to improve, like they were, I don't even know, like the 14th seed last MDI. Now they came into this MDI, like the... 11th seed or whatever they're continuing to just mm -hmm. churn out improvement and uh honestly great really really great job from thundered this is probably gonna be the end of it though i guess it's not the end of it because the temple's not over but you know we've seen this we've seen the situation before we have seen this before perplex business as usual though strife and peril will be going down shortly but again, they really just need to walk it in here. They just need to finish off the dungeon. And we'll see how it goes for them. Okay, so... But you know what we can do with the time that we have? It looks like, yeah, maybe he's still not able to log back in, so it's probably just going to be a perplexed victory here. But I guess we could also take some of this time to preview the next match? Uh... Unless Perplex does something cool that we haven't seen before, but I, I wouldn't I mean, see any reason for them to even try to do that. I think that perplexed here, they're in a spot where like we, we still need to see them do the final pull of the dungeon. That was something that it wiped them in their previous series, and it's like Is that gonna look consistent here? I think that this pull is also something that's pretty dangerous, but since they have the destruction warlock, like destruction warlock stuns with infernal plus blasphemy, that kind of thing, really provides a lot of uh, control. Now we just need to make sure that we're getting kicks on the haunting jaws. We need to make sure that we're um, Divine needs to make sure that he doesn't go down. He does have bubble taunt available for himself, but we get a nice we get a nice link. And Divine still has uh, defensive cooldowns rolling, and, th and this pull is looking solid. Yep, an execution from Perplex. But let's talk about what Perplex needs to do to get further in this tournament. I okay. think th this is this is definitely already I would say a successful tournament for Perplex. Right, thinking back to the last couple of MDI Globals that they've participated in, they dropped out unreasonably early for the caliber of team that they are, right? For the longest time, dating back to the BFA MDIs, and even before that, they were a team that has winning pedigree, right? They won, they won our first ever yeah. MDI Globals. They were always the, you know, the number two or number three team very consistently. They were always the team that we talked about being that one team that could really put Echo through their paces, but they haven't been in form recently. This is the best they've, ever, they've played in probably the past three years. What do they need to do to get back into that form. Thinking about the matchups coming up tomorrow, right? If Perplex sure goes through with this series, which it looks like they will, they'll be playing against the winner of our next matchup between Cheese and Legendary. The Battle of the Last Stand. Depending on who comes out of that, what do we need to see from Perplex? I think I think that Perplex... So one of the biggest issues of Perplex in the... Uh... In Cup B was their consistency. We saw, we saw they were actually really good in some dungeons, but they weren't consistent across all the dungeons. Uh... I think that what we've seen from them this weekend thus far is like their times have been they have consistently like the second to third best time in most situations but they don't have what it seems like that extra gear to be able to post like the best time in any singular dungeon which it seems like a couple of the teams like particularly like even cheese and legendary seem like they have a like one or two dungeons that they will just absolutely smoke everybody else in um I, I think that for me, I need to see something from Perplex where it's like, oh, what is their map? What is the map that for them, if you if you ever play them on that map, you should be looking to ban it versus them because it is just that good. I think that that's what I need to see from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree. And I think I think the time is right for them as well. I, I, I heard, you know, through the grapevine that a few of their players hadn't really been enjoying the game as much in Shadowlands, but with Dragonflight coming out, it seemed like a lot of them had their, their love for the game kind of re reincarnated so to speak, and they've been playing a lot more since then, playing more live keys, and it really shows with the way they've been playing in the MDI. I mean, the general Dude. level has been much higher this time around. Before MDI started, Divine was like number six tank in the world on live or something like that. He was he's been he he, he was on a little bit of a live key break for a while, a bit on hiatus. That guy showed back up like really strong early on in the expansion before MDI got into full force and incredible incredible player that you see on the screen right here in Divine Field. Yeah, yeah. Divine Field and Ashine, the duo that's been together <laughs> for the past what five years now. Ashine, uh, unbreakable. Ashine didn't know if he was going to be playing like this MDI either, right? 
That was one of the things that he stated like pretty early on. He didn't know that he was going to be playing. He's back. It's always great. This guy, like, the Perplex team, like, it's uh, the core of them. Th this was the team that evolved from, like, Shell's Angels, which was one of the very first MDI mm -hmm. championship teams. Um, so they, they have some of the most MDI experience of any players, honestly. Wait a minute. That's the one that I played. How are these guys not washed? <sighs> well... Some would say that you were never actually nasty with it. You've always been washed. <laughs> what? what? Oh, okay, sorry. I'm getting attacked live on stream. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Say that. <laughs> Anyways, perplexed here. Uh, pulling the shambling ah, infester. Five people. Perplexed pulling the shambling infester here. <laughs> They're not pulling it into the Shaw of Doubt. There's no need. They, they, see, they see what's on the other side of the screen. They're like, ah, may as well just finish off this run strong. For them, they'll be able to sleep well knowing that they're able to show back up tomorrow. Dude, I, this has to be nerve-wracking. Honestly, these lower bracket matches versus teams that are of this global finals caliber, every map going to a three-game uh, series, no team looking safe across the whole entire weekend. I, I feel like I would just be so stressed. Yeah. There, there is a certain level of stress coming into the global finals, right? Like... There's the uncertainty of knowing whether or not your strategies that you've cooked up between the cups and the finals are good enough. I remember looking at the, stra the snapping strategies in Dark Heart Thicket that people were doing and just wondering how like all of the other teams had figured that out and we hadn't. That is a very real thing. I think that kind of happened to Donuts this time around too. Donuts had fast strategies, but they just weren't on the on the same level as the other teams that we've seen. A little unfortunate to see, but it's, it's definitely a nerve-wracking experience just going from cup play to global finals play. Yeah, I think I think a big thing we need to see from Perplex here are are they, are they able to be able to are they going to be able to kill this boss before he comes out of his um, intermission phase? That was something that we saw from Echo earlier that they were able to commit Lust and they were able to skip the not this bounds of reality that's about to happen, but the bounds of reality that's like slightly after this that comes up with Lust. It's pretty challenging to be able to break that on a 21 Tyrannical. But I think that Perplex was one of the first teams that was able to do it during their regional weekend. So I wonder if they're going to be able to do that here. Uh, it's It would save you somewhere in the order of like 20 seconds if you're able to do it over a team that's not. And so just like looking ahead into future times that they would be in Temple of the Jade Serpent. This is a good litmus test for what their damage is going to look like. There's also a lot to think about going to tomorrow. After winning this final map here, Perplex will move on to tomorrow, right? There's a yeah. lot of things to think about going into tomorrow. We know that they could definitely gain a little time in this last room by pulling all the trash together instead of splitting it up like they do. They also, if they don't have a good strat in Court of Stars, they need to think about whether they want to figure that out for tomorrow or if they just want to make sure that they permaban that map. Because it isn't the first map in any of our series, unless I'm mistaken. So there's a lot of things that they need to think about. Maybe sure up some strategies. But as Are we look at this? the boss here, the Shaw of Doubt... Will be going down Maybe very, like very shortly left. for Perplexed. Yeah, it's going to be oh, okay. yet another three-game series victory from Perplexed, and unfortunately, we're sending Thundered home. Yep, that is correct. You hate to see it end like that for a great team like Thundered, but at the same time, you're uh, excited to see a team like Perplexed get through and uh, move on to the lower semis. They'll be playing the winner of our next match, our final match of the day, but uh, yeah, perplexed. Uh, my my team that I had as a runner up. So we'll see if I end up being right over the course of the weekend. But uh, it was a very clean uh, boss at the end there. Managed to dodge the second phase. Things are going well. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a rough map to watch uh, just because of the DC at the beginning. But you know what can you do? Props to Thundered for making it this far. Definitely an accomplishment. Again, any team that makes it to the Global Finals is clearly one of the best teams in the world, so they can leave with their heads held high, even if it is a, uh, a bummer of a finish in the lower bracket. Yeah, of course. I mean, we've uh, we talked about it, of course, during the match, but... Uh, yeah. Just, it's a shame whatever happens. It's one of the features of playing an online game, right? Uh, but... It is, of course, a huge credit to Perplex to make it through to the top four. Big congratulations to them. A little bit worrying, you know, getting knocked into the lower bracket from them. That's a team that in the past, in past MDIs, has been often, you know, one of the best 
one or two teams in any given bracket. So anytime they're yeah. in the lower bracket early, it's of course bad news for them and very scary news for the other teams inhabiting the lower bracket. Uh, but now they're making it through to the, the, the deep end of the lower bracket and we'll get to see who their opponent tomorrow is going to be after the next series, which is our last stand grudge match. We've got the yeah. cheese versus legendary. The two teams that came out of the last stand now, in the last stand, you never play directly against another person, right? You are you're running your teams, your your dungeons. Sometimes you're taking strats and adapting based on what other teams in that tournament show is possible. But there were two tickets out of there, so Cheese and Legendary didn't directly clash. They both harmoniously if, uh, escaped the last stand, made it to this tournament. But that's got to end now. They cannot both get out of this lower bracket today. One of these teams has to go home and. I mean, they both looked so good, right? Cheese looked insane yeah. against Echo. That is a, a team that I think is, is just looking phenomenal. But Legendary 2, of course, has also looked great in their series. Do we think we see another three-game yeah. uh, series? Oh, yeah. Of course. I, I would be surprised now? if it was a two-game series, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, why would we come all this way and not have the final match of the day be three games? Of course it's going to be, can't wait to watch each one. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, the final elimination match of the day here on MDI. See you in just a few.
Welcome back to the MDI Global Finals. We're already jumping in the game between the la the two teams in the last last stand tournament, I guess we could say. Stand Chiefs stand. versus Legendary coming out of the last stand. And here they are battling it out on Halls of Valor. Time to get into it. All right. So it's Dratnus and myself uh, casting the series. And uh, right off the rip here, we see a little bit difference in composition for both of these teams. Cheese running that Fire Mage that we see so popular in this dungeon just due to the uh, one large mob, I want good at night cleave value style pulls. We're legendary playing the tried and true Spreest Feral Druid oh. uh, Unholy Death Knight comp. And we see Wexy immediately getting owned by Himdal. My goodness, that's not good. That is not good at all for Legendary. That's going to be their battle res now. Luckily, the Shadow Priest is the least important DPS player in this group, but oh. still not good to lose the damage cooldowns. And now Tobo has died as well for Legendary, and they don't have a battle res for him. Splat is going to follow, and this is going to end up being a full wipe for Legendary. It's just a question of, are they going to try and kill the trash before they wipe to the boss here? But if the boss is above you know, 40% health and you have two DPS dead and no reses, you should wipe uh, is, yeah. is how this works out. So I think they're going to kill all of the non storm drake enemies and then they are going to wipe they're just going to try and live until then and that's going to be their damage control here but no matter how much you try and control this damage if you're legendary this is many minutes of time loss here once this these two champions this die is, i think you're going to see them go down dude this is the third time that we've seen legendary in halls of valor in both the two previous runs it looked good they didn't have really any real mistakes that you can point to and be like, oh yeah this, this is this is actually scary for them but uh, this this is huh. incredibly worrisome. This is going to set them back multiple. They're minutes actually and they're continuing as well. They're deciding not to wipe. So this is going to. I mean, Himdal is going to take ages here for them because they are down two of their damage dealers. Yeah. So it's going to end up being a solid three three minute thirty <laughs> boss kill or something. Something not like that, ideal, yeah. especially not ideal to have your shadow priest be the uh, the surviving player either. Cheese on the other hand flawless so far working now towards this massive pull that they do okay what are we going to see from cheese here how much trash is going to get pulled so it's pretty common that we see like this thunder collar pack with like the uh, rune carver get pulled into the aspirant now is there a question of is it going to get dragged into olamir and solston and it looks like olamir has been engaged for cheese is solston also going to get engaged it looks like maybe it doesn't Olamir's look like it well yet so you would pull Solston now, right? If you're going to pull him? Yeah, usually if you're going to fight both, you pull Solston first and then you pull Olmir later. But yeah. it is possible. It's poss I, I think what they're going to do is they're going to chain on to Solston after Olmir dies here. Or okay. maybe after he starts his next Sanctify cast and they can, they can leave him this. to die out somewhere. We'll see how they want to handle this, though. A couple of explosives I mean. still are needing to get killed here. Femme also looking awfully light on defense here. You can see Bubble has popped, or has already been used, rather. No Sentinel for another little while here. Now, you can see on his unit frame, however, that he doesn't have that Gift of the Golden Valkyr debuff. That's an unbelievably powerful defensive that he actually still has. It's this proc that you get as a prop pally, where when you drop low on health, you enter Guardian of Ancient Kings for like four seconds. You get a you know huge damage reduction. Uh, so that's something that he's that that is a safety net that he still has available, and he's made oh it back to his God, Sentinel Zatsy. as well. So he is chilling, dude. Zatsy, with the aspirant on top of him, oh. while the uh, oh gosh, while the storm is going off, is very dangerous. Now we do have Zatsy go down. He immediately onks. <laughs> he lived. Two I can't HP. believe that he lived that. By the way, uh, Dranaco dies immediately. Gets battle risk by Frag. Kill the Aspirant off, and we're maybe okay through the side of the storm, but Zatsy looks incredibly light on cooldowns, and the Aspirant's going to jump on him again, and Zatsy gets Goomba-stomped by that Aspirant. Wow, credit to Dranako for finding a way to survive that, but Ricky is going to have to go back as his frag here. Dranako keeping his poly, though, on one of those mobs. That is nice out of him. He's going to try and sustain through this. Beautiful play from Dranako there as well. He altered at like 60% which is rarely correct, but he found a really good way to, to chain that altar at 60 into an ice block, and that was how he was able to live there. And now Femme able to actually keep him alive, it looks like, but they are now throwing this one potentially back over to Legendary, as Legendary, even with their three deaths on the board, are now in this Olmir and Solston area. You can see Lapan inching towards Solston first. Oh. They don't have Olmir in combat just yet. We'll see if they decide to pull it in during the first Eye of the Storm, or if they wait for the second. 
Looks like what a legendary. What does a legendary comeback look look like here? Obviously, I mean, just, it looks just like this. Full. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think if they if, if they avoid deaths from here, I'm not even sure they're that far behind. I'm not even sure if they are behind at this point. It is uh, it is really close because look, oh. cheese are still having to run back. They just were in combat there. with an extra mob that that's polyed over there. So Drink looks like Fem game. has eventually soloed this, but you know they can't. Zatsi's gonna have to out of combat res here. Yeah. All right. So it's okay, but I mean, look at this, right? Legendary is definitely not too far behind. Legendary now also, to their credit, have 15 seconds of death timer working in their favor. Neither team has any battle reses either, so if anything goes wrong for anybody here, it's going to be real, real bad. Cheese moving over to the light side, and now Lepan, or Femme rather, going to bring the boss over to the lightning side, setting up for the inversion here. We've seen some, but not all teams do this. If this is done correctly, it's going to mean that Herja is going to cast the wrong abilities on each side now, which is nice, although she didn't really cooperate there. She's still going to have some holy stacks when they get back over here. So in particular, this set of expel lights that you're about to see into the first tick of this upcoming Eye of the Storm are going to be pretty deadly. Look for defensives to be popped so, here by Cheese to try and survive this. In addition to that, uh, watch out for the sack. I think that, like... You typically want to be like stacking or I guess in this case anti-magic zoning on top of the player like if you ever do this on your live keys you want to be throwing an external on a player like right as he's getting that expel like going into this storm uh the beginning of the storm is the most dangerous part but uh, things such as sack or time dilation one minute personals line up perfectly with the guy of the storm every single time and so what a likely situation happened there is like fim is going to sack the last person to get that expel light every single time right as they go into the eye of the storm yeah, looks like Legendary on the same idea here. Also going for this inversion. It's a little bit less, a little bit more damage taken than if you do the original strat that we saw like on the very first Cup Weekend Echo do. Uh, but this one is very reliable. You can see they're going to be able to, to set this one up nicely as well. So Cheese are going to get Herja dead. Something on the order of a minute and a half ahead of Legendary. Maybe a minute ahead of Legendary. But they are 15 seconds worse on deaths. So less okay. than a minute to maybe a minute tops is the lead that Cheese have right now. So that That's absolutely is not safe. They got a count advantage, yeah. but it's not, a, it's not enough of a count advantage to really like change pulls, uh, is, is what I would say about that. So it's. I, I think that both of these teams. Yeah, have not change the, the number pulls. of pulls, right? Yeah, yeah, it yeah, just yeah, means yeah, like, oh, one pulls. extra animal is going to oh, have to come into some pull, right? Yeah, I need an extra shield maiden or something like that. Or the, we gotta get bonus yeah. rune carver, that kind of thing. Now Cheese are grabbing everything they can in this area. This is another one of those pulls that Prop Paladin is really nice for setting oh, up. Just shot. Sending out that Divine Toll, silencing all of those casters, bringing them in. Now they're gonna rely on AoE CCs to keep these mobs under control for a while. Dragon's Breath followed up after the Blinding Sleet there. Now it is the Blinding Light. And Holy Radiance cast though. Oh, it looks like may have gone off there. Oh, it went off. Oh my God, look, the mobs it got did. To healed. Holy That's not we, good for Cheese, uh, because now yeah. they are low on AoE CCs, right? This was a pull that, sort of like riding a bicycle, right? It depended on going fast. If you start going slow, you get a lot less steady, and now you're starting to have more casts go off because you don't have any more AoE CCs, and now they're in this really rough spot here. Fem has that Gift of the Golden Valkyr rolling, but once that expires, he oh, is going to be very etch. in danger. No, 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 no. Kick the go oh, frag going down to the etch cast just being channeled into him permanently. In addition to that, I think that they killed off the Thundercaller, but now they just have those rune carvers and those mystics still free casting as Dranaco also goes down. I think that both frag and Dranaco have released. It looks like Zats is getting channeled on by the etch. Ricky and uh, Ricky, Zatsy and Fem still alive on the side of Cheese. I think they're going to be able to pull this off, but oh man, this is looking. I mean, this is how Legendary get back into it. Look on the right side of your screen. They're on the same pull. It's assuming that they're not able to allow a healing uh, a heal go off, a Gift of Radiance go off. It should be fine. Yeah, it looks like they've done a good job there of making sure that their single target kicks were where they needed to go and their AoE stops are going to be enough to get them over the finish line on this pull here. You can see Legendary is still going to be a little bit behind in count, but they are now ahead in terms of dungeon progression. And they are ahead now by 25 seconds of death timer. So I actually think Legendary have a, a maybe 20 second lead at this point, all things considered. That 5% count, that's definitely something, so, though, in favor of Cheese here. I think that that's... It depends on how many 
of the worgen pulls they do how many wolves they pull into that uh into fenrir we've seen sometimes teams aren't electing to pull all of those packs of wargs just into the boss um instead they're a lot like letting like one or two stay off to the side it really just depends on how many pull like packs cheese are uh looking to do in that fight alternatively like legendary may just have to get some of those ox those bulls in t on top of their bear pole. It just really depends on what the routing difference is going to look like between the two teams. I, I don't think it's going to equate to one one bonus pull or something like that. But something that is actually kind of important is if either of these teams mess up the four kings trap, by the way, we could see the yeah. other team immediately take the lead. That's something that we've seen decide Halls of Valor in the past, right? If you mess up the king strategy and you don't get all four in combat with you at once, you lose... Close to a minute at least off of that. So uh, any advantage that is existing here for either team, which again, I'm not actually, uh, you know, I'm honestly not sure which team I'd rather be here, right? Fenrir is the same health for both okay. teams. Legendary are going to be catching up on count here, but uh, they have an advantage of death timer. So I guess I think Legendary are in the lead here, but it is very narrow, right? Okay, so yeah, yeah, they, they caught up count with that Trapper marksman pack. I mean, it makes sense that that's the, the count differential. Doing it on top of the boss is typically seen as pretty efficient and now both of these teams are going into the second part of Fenrir they're going to be doing all of these wargs on top of the boss this is very dangerous um, it's a situation where if you don't get the wargs killed off before the uh, scent cast goes off where Fenrir fixates a player um, and, and that does happen to fixate a player on the rock they have to come out of the snap spot now both these teams are playing prop paladin and you're able to have a bop on uh, the player that has to come out of the snap spot but if those wargs live much longer than that bop lasts, you're gonna see like a full wipe. Like that, that, oh, that's look at the this. spot where you start to get really scared. Look at this thundering timing for Legendary. It's gonna just be coming out as they're grouping all of this up. Beautiful life grip lands from Wexy to bring Igloo back upstairs before all those wolves jump and murder him. Igloo needed to stay down so he could drop a Windrush totem to help Lapan get back into this pull. And now they have just all of these wargs at once. Lapan somehow health bar just not moving there in that Guardian of Ancient Kings with those cooldowns rolling. But now it has expired, so he's going to have to hit that Divine Shield. Bubble Taunt comes out from him now. Once this bubble expires, it is going to be scary time, though. That bop does land on Wexy as well, and by the time it is over, all the wolves are dead, and Legendary are safe here. But Cheese got this pull going much faster. Yeah, this is the it, difference in count that yeah. they set up. They didn't do anywhere near as many wolves, uh, so they were able to just get into this pull faster. But Legendary actually did basically every single wolf in the dungeon, so they're actually now ahead in count, and Cheese are going to have to find some extra enemies here. It looks like they're maybe going to go over towards the Valor Jar. We'll see... We'll see where they get this extra count from that they're behind. It looks, like, it looks like somebody's grabbing those bulls that are off to the side. I can't see how many they're grabbing. All right. It looks like all of the bulls have been on the table or on the table for cheese. We're on the side of legendary. It looks like uh, they're got to grab a couple. Igloo grabbing two. Yeah, it looks like just two, maybe three for legendary. Oh, cheese are actually pulling the storm drake too. Huh. So the number that you're looking for here is 83.7%, by the way, just for, just for everybody at home. 83.7% is the number that you want coming out of this. Uh, if you have that number, then you are okay. able to just go and do the four kings, and that so, will complete your count. I like this a lot from Cheese. They're playing the Fire Mage, right? What does a Fire Mage want? They want a nice, juicy combustion target, right? They want a target that they can just pump all of their primary damage into and have that Ignite spread. So the Storm Drake makes perfect sense from that perspective if you're Cheese, right, to have a target like that in the middle of this pull. Now, unfortunately, these mobs are now starting to get kited, and they're not all necessarily going to be in the Ignite spread range from that Storm Drake, but still, you can see just how much value Jernako is getting. Whereas Legendary, on the other hand, have a more AoE intensive comp, a little bit less yeah. of that we want a single prior target. So they instead focused on the bigger AoE pull earlier with all the wolves. Uh, and both teams are going to be getting um, to that 83.7%. If. Well, are Legendary going to actually be able to get it here? I think there might not, right? They, Did they miss a mob? Where are the rest of their team? Hmm. Okay, well, we'll see how they oh, do this, because, yeah, you... Uh... Okay, so maybe some, a shield maybe still in the back. I think okay, there it is. is still in the back, and he's summoning the dragon. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's summoning the dragon, and he's just going to wheel that dragon around to kill off a bunch of stags. And Eat he's up some melt stags. It off here in a couple of seconds. Yeah, 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 this makes sense. 
Excellent. Okay, so Legendary are now going to be grabbing their beers. They are at the 83.7 magic number, but so are Cheese. Cheese are actually a little bit ahead here. They're going to have their player hit that light bridge first, but they are behind by 25 seconds of death timer. So when you factor that in, I think it is currently Legendary maybe 15, maybe 20 seconds in the lead. We will see, uh -huh. though, how the four kings work so, out. This is the pivotal moment of this dungeon, is are they going to be able to get in combat with all four of those kings, or will they mess one of them up? So, so the four king strategy is actually something that spawned off of the achievement for uh, Halls of Valor, just the dungeon. And, and the achievement is based around fighting all of the kings um, at once. And so... What you have to do is you have to throw beer on three of them and then just take the first king to the other kings while they have that beer debuff on them. They start like auto attacking for a second. And then uh, after the beer debuff expires, then they become clickable. And so if you have three of them beard, you have to drag, at least in this case, if you look on the left side, you're seeing King Randolph to uh, all four of the kings. And they've done a great job of activating oh. them all, at least getting them uh, started. And I think that they have a click on all of them on the side of cheese. What are you saying? What did you see? Yeah, it looks like they were just barely able to get all the way around in time. So Cheese do have four kings. Now on the side of Legendary, it also looks like they have gotten all four secured. So I think this is going to end up being super duper close here. This is, they, they've both succeeded and you could see how tight that timing was, right? That, that beer expired right as they got in combat with the, those last few. So uh, if they had been just a little bit slower, it wouldn't have worked out. Cheese now have their first king so. dying, and it's all going to come down to just DPS here. Now, I actually think I like Cheese's comp a little bit better for damage, but remember, they actually yeah. need to overtake by 25 seconds. Right? I, they, need to, they need to get ahead because of that death differential. Now, I don't like Cheese's comp 25 seconds uh, boss damage-wise either. I think that we're going to see a situation, and, and I don't think it's... I don't think it's like set in stone, but there is a high chance that we see a situation where Cheese finishes this dungeon first and Legendary is able to take the victory off of that death differential timer that you see at the top of your screen. And so that, that's one of the most pivotal things. If Honestly, if Legendary have any deaths here, th this might be something that that sets them so far behind that they're not able, they're going to complete the dungeon by such a large amount that they're not able to take it. Um, but assuming that both of these teams play God King Skovald and Odin clean, I, I think that Legendary is favored here. Yeah, Chi is getting to send an army here at the start of Scovald, whereas Legendary don't have army available at on pull here. I think that means they're only going to get one more army this dungeon, whereas Cheese might get back to theirs for the runic phase of Odin. So that'll be something to keep track of. That might be just the little advantage Cheese need. Mm -hmm. Again, remember, they need to kill this boss, not just... Well, this boss isn't the important one, right? But they need to kill Odin 25 sure. seconds ahead of Legendary. will also kind of matter what the Thundering timing is, right? Thundering, one of those affixes that rarely can you do much to plan around it, but if possible here, Cheese would really like to have a Thundering lined up with their Runic brand. If they could get that multiplier uh, on top of that other multiplier, then they might be able to just get the extra damage they need to catch up and overtake here. The timing we're looking for is 45 seconds. Um, so if the, if the thundering timing at the top of the screen says 45 seconds whenever combat stops with Scovald, that means that it will line up really well with that runic brand timing. Uh, somewhere between 45 to 55 is mostly okay. Anything that's like before that is really bad because that means you have to like sprint to clear right before uh, the Shatter Spear cast goes off for Odin. So that, that's just something that you have to be looking out for. Dude, on the right side of your screen, though, Legendary kind of putting their foot on the gas on Scofald uh, boss damage-wise. This is uh, You said that you liked Cheese's comp a little bit better for killing bosses, but Legendary doing a great job on this encounter. Absolutely, yeah. They are, uh, they are pumping here. I, I'm not 100% sure how as well, because looking at the damage meters, you know, a cursory look, it looks like the numbers are bigger over on the side of Cheese. I guess... I guess maybe it's the Lapan. Lapan is doing 10k more than Fem, may or maybe it's just what they're doing damage to. Maybe it's the single target instead of padding on those ads. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, All right, so yeah. Legendary I, I have guess... four seconds of advantage plus 25 from deaths is 29 seconds. That is almost insurmountable, I think, for Cheese here. This is, it's gonna be really, really tough for Cheese to get this one back on Odin because the way that Odin works, it very often dies in that runic brand phase. And even if you can kill first, it's really hard to kill 30 seconds first. 
Yeah, you would you would rather have Cheese's thundering timing here, but not by much. Like their their thundering timing is not like very advantageous or anything. They're not even going to get it through the full runic brand buff. Uh, now Cheese's comp is better at Odin just because Fire Mage with Fire Starter uh, dealing damage to targets that are such high HP. Odin of course dies at eighty percent HP, and so like that that is an advantage in this composition for cheese but again like you said i don't think it's 30 seconds enough or whatever they're going to need to be able to overtake this boss by yeah so so close though for cheese i mean especially when you consider they have they have eight deaths on their board and they're going to be able to almost catch up here to legendary but i mean i think that just goes to show that not all deaths are created equal right legendary's three deaths were much more costly on average than Cheese's <laughs> eight, right? Per death. Yes. The two of those three, or all three of those three were on Heimdall, right? And and they only had one res for them, so they just ended up having three players alive during a boss fight. But that's not going to matter if they're able to just kill this boss during this runic brand phase. There's the Algathar puzzle box joining up with the Army of the Dead with every single cooldown with power infusion as well. No bloodlust for either team, but no bloodlust needed here. I think they're going to be able to get this boss dead very quickly just five percent left here now once they drop out of valkyr form they are going to mm -hmm. lose a lot of damage but i think they're going to be able to get this killed either right as or right before they drop out of valkyr form yeah impressive work from legendary cheese are actually so close as well cheese almost able to kill faster but even it's if they did those gift. 25 seconds of death timer yeah yeah yeah, that's the thing. Valiant effort from uh, Cheese, but those deaths just holding them back enough. That legendary getting it done a little bit quicker, and they're going to take the first map in our final series of the day. And uh, that was a bit of a, a bit of a wild and crazy one again, wasn't it? It was absolutely, and honestly, for the most part of the yes, dungeon, player I in thought this group, this but still not was going to be a Cheese a favorite. Dratnos here calling from the void for a second but i think we have it in order now so it all began with these deaths here and i think we were kind of wondering doa is it really worth to keep playing this boss with three players if you have still like 60 percent hp to go through they decided that yes it is because they didn't want those extra deaths and they didn't want that extra timer reset so for them it was the smarter decision to keep on going even though they only had one dps player live now cheese on the other hand went up here i thought it was super interesting that they decided to go for all mirror first because usually we see solston from teams uh which is also what legendary did here gonna see it here and then for uh, oh no that's <laughs> that's cheese when when the terror occurred so salty oh, was yes. jumped multiple times here in a row for a while he was able to survive but then it was just not enough they had to run all the way back here and then this is this is the big the big kicker right they are in this big villager pack you can see the rune of healing so far under control and then frag goes down that's the first death and the pack kind of walks on back to femme Dranico dies and after that they just had so much healing go through that basically all the damage they did already was uh yeah called back out back they were full health nearly full health when the team was back together and even though they were a little bit quicker here with all of the trash done legendary had found fast ways to get that trash count back up with pulling the Valajar into the fenrir first phase which you're seeing uh not here but which they did and then pulling all of the wolves into fenrir second phase and then in order to equal that out again, she's actually pulled the dragon, which first I thought, mm, maybe this was not on, on purpose, but I definitely agree that for the fire mage, it's a very smart thing to have. I don't think they had that PI ready, which they would have liked, but uh, in the end, legendary managing to win on the back of those deaths, I think very, very good for them, but she's not going to go down easy. Yeah, we've still got one, probably two, based on the way the day has been going, maps remaining here. Um, we didn't get to see the maps for the series before the first game. We kind of just jumped right into it. So hopefully we can get a chance to take a look at those and do a little bit of theory crafting. Um, in the meantime, it's, it's a situation where it feels like, you know, Cheese plays a little bit more cleanly. They're the ones who end up taking that dungeon too. It's just, again, you know, those those little minute things, right? A death here, a death there, you know, a... a 
heal that gets through here, which causes a, a pack to take an extra 20 seconds. It's going to be those things that define that. Here oh. are the maps for this series. Ruby oh, Life Pools wow. is banned, so we're going to Court of Stars next. All right. Let's go. I have something to say on, on this matter, because we did see how fast Jesus Run is in Court of Stars, right? They, they kite those two mini bosses. They have a lot, a lot of speed in that dungeon. They beat Echo. Now, I was talking to a player from Legendary, and they said, if the cheese run impressed you, our court is going to be crazy. And so I have oh, the really? highest expectations, mm. and if they lose that dungeon, then it's because they, they were in the impression that their run is so much better. <laughs> um, Tattles. Okay, so I got some stats. So I'm, I'm not surprised that they're super confident because Court of Stars was one of the last stand time trial dungeons. And Legendary was oh, the team that put yes. up the fastest time in the last stand time trials at 12.22. 16 seconds faster than um, Cheese. So like, I, I think that there's a good chance that a Legendary has a similar strategy, maybe even potentially a better strategy than Cheese in this court. I mean, I guess we'll find out soon, but, you know, if Cheese does manage to take it, we do have the uh, Azure Vault to look ahead to for perhaps our last match of the day. But, yeah, I mean, Court of the Stars, I love the gauntlet being thrown by Legendary, where you said you thought Cheese was good. Check us out. Well, now we get to. <laughs> we get to find out. Yeah, I hope we do. Both teams are ready to uh, ban in the Ruby Life Pool. If the Court of Stars does go in the way of cheese, however, we have one more dungeon to look forward to, which is going to be that Azure Vault. Hey, Ruby's cursed for Legendary. Yeah. I'm glad they did. <laughs> it. Well, I mean, I, I think Legendary is cursed either way, right? The three-game series curse is, is just unbeatable. Oh. Here. There's no way. No way Legendary could defy... Well, all of the other matches of our day and and two o cheese here. Hold on, Lapan gets a strong Legion buff anytime he steps into a dungeon. That's true. Older than five years, and so I mean he's just gonna <laughs> true, he's powering true. up. And Is we that do what happened in that in, in that halls? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we do have to keep in mind too that Legendary was at least part of the only other two o we had this weekend. They were the team getting two o, but they were at least part of that ah. match. So that a soul for a soul that, that counts, yeah, okay. right? That is toxic. Well, I don't yeah. think you. I think that counts. Word. It's only fair that they, the they get to be on to both sides now. of it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This we, is we maybe like the last time I can here, yeah. say this. So uh, calm down, guys, and uh, take it cheesy. Wow. <laughs> we shall. Don't worry. I was born and raised in Wisconsin, cheese capital of the universe. I have a bit of an affinity with this team, I guess, you know, based on my ancestry, recent ancestry, not like going back hundreds of years, but maybe about 100 or so. We love cheese. We love to see what cheese what is, can do. What are they talking yeah. about, Dratnos? <laughs> are we here to watch Dungeon? I don't know. I, I, what are they even talking about? I like to just go quiet and not reward this sort of behavior, this sort of tomfoolery. Dude, I just I'm just trying to help people out who had I, I the uh, Doa story time question. on the bingo card. Real question, yeah? What what classes are we going to see from Legendary mm. in that Court I, of Stars? And are they going to go for four DPS as well, which is what we've yeah. seen If they don't, then well. how can they be faster? If they don't, how well, can they be faster? I mean, in most other dungeons, 4 DPS is slower than, than 3 DPS I, 1 healer, right? Because the healer lets you do bigger pulls. So it's just a question of, are there any like massive pulls you can do if and only if you have a healer? Let's see what they have. Let's nope. find it's out. Oh, okay. Sorry, no, no, what? Never mind. <laughs> That's a leak. Yeah. Production is leaking. Well, well that's what we saw from the last... Win rate. Uh, Wait, we did yeah. see it already, though. 100% win rate? Huge burst damage yeah. brings Bloodlust great go. PI target is literally a dragon, and it has. How is that a weakness? Less feathers than a moon king? Well, look at it. It's cringe. Pretty, pretty legit stats. Yeah. <laughs> you play a giant. Bird. I like that an item is a key ability. It's like you better get this item, otherwise you're missing out on one of the key abilities yeah, of the Dracula Evoker. 
It's if true. you play a giant bird, or you can play a, an annoying dragon with wings. Okay, there's no comparison. I, I, I agree whoa, with this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where's okay, where the annoying let's, part come Let's from? not flame this card too much, okay? This was thrown together last minute, a couple hours ago, when <laughs> Devastation Evoker showed up in that card of stars, all right? So <laughs> they had to get oh, these things like in here this quickly. Card, didn't it? It sounds like you made the I didn't make actually. the card, no, but I did respond to the ping of, hey, hey what are the well, key abilities of the Devastation Evoker? <laughs> So it says yeah. it, it says less feathers than a moonkin, which implies it has feathers somewhere. Where are the feathers? Uh, usually in, in either trinket one or trinket two slot. It's the uh, the rage feather. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> this uh, better check in PC. That is that is not normally. It looks very normally to me. My PC always looks like this. Oh. But but going back to the question of like what comp do we think they're going to play, I actually really liked the Echo 4 DPS comp that didn't have that Devastation Evoker. I thought that the Enhancement Shaman, Feral Druid, Unholy Death, no, Unholy Death Knight, Shadow Priest paired with that Prot Paladin was like the comp that I kind of most expected to see whenever you're, whenever you're theory crafting what does a 4 DPS composition look like in the MDI. I, I think that if Legendary are playing it, that is probably the most likely scenario. More often than not, you're not thinking, oh yeah, 4 DPS. What if we played Dev Evoker? <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the class that you're like, oh Maybe. yeah, that's the one for me. Because <laughs> they're new, right? You don't always think of the, of the new additions. You always go to the tried and true ones. But if you also want to see all of those duckies, you can uh, check out our bracket with exclamation mark bracket on Raider.io. Shout out to them. Let me move these ducks. Yeah, I was trying to like look at uh, like a time for various dungeons and things while we were talking about it. And there's a bunch of ducks in the way, and I'm like trying to click the ducks. And I'm like, oh, the time on that dungeon was, and it was tough. It was an extra challenge here today. But we, you mean we entertainment? Yeah, that too. Challenging entertainment. Well. We want to make sure the boats arrive on time because sometimes they don't. So we're just making sure it's all working before we dump the players into the instance. I would imagine. Yeah. Maybe a reminder of what we saw from Cheese earlier today. So they, together with Echo, presented us the four DPS no healer teams in that court of stars. Their time was 13 minutes and 46 seconds, and they played a prop warrior, a feral, a uh, havoc demon hunter, uh, unholy DK, and the the devoker, yeah. Such a weird comp. I believe so. Like, I'm so yeah. surprised they're able to it get It sounds like you're just naming specs, but that was a comp. Yeah. That was a comp. It's just, it doesn't, I'm surprised that they're able to get through Tilixite Flame Wreath like that, but, uh... That's definitely the know. hard part, it, right? Yeah. 23 Echo, we're right using the Paladin, and with the Paladin, it's a lot more believable, right? Because you have that off-healing, but without the Paladin, you know, once that Nature's Vigil expires, you're just relying on everybody else to survive, but I think that's the strength of the other DPS specs, right? You have an Unholy DK who can just Death Strike and never die. You have an Evoker who has two charges of obsidian scales, you've got a Zephyr to help the whole group, and you've got Renewing Blaze as well, which makes you He's unkillable kiting. for... Yeah, I guess I guess that player is not is not one of the ones that's in danger in that spot, but in the other spots in the dungeon oh, where you're go. in pain, that's what you oh, gotta do. It does right. look like the Evoker is gonna be Let's the play go. for both teams, though. Except... so. Okay, so it's a Paladin versus Warrior difference, and the other difference is the Havoc Demon Hunter versus the Shadow Priest. I actually think I prefer the Shadow Priest here because you've got an extra off healer cooldown here, right? You've got a Vampiric Embrace and a Mass Dispel, which uh, both of which can be nice in this dungeon. You also have two excellent power infusion targets. I, I don't know where the PI is necessarily supposed to go in a lot of these spots uh, I think either anymore. It goes on your Evoker's Dragon Rage on single target, although I'm not 100% sure. I suspect that's where it's going to land, though. Yeah, but then it's like, is it Tobo everywhere else? Well, the thing about the Evokers is they can also get a lot of value out of a PI plus Lust because it can mean they get an extra extension of their Dragon Rage. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure, though. In, in AoE, I'm not sure whether that's as important as it is on single target. We'll see how they decide to set this up. Lapan 
Already going now on an adventure here. Different adventure than we've oh, seen wow. out of other teams going down into the docks. What is happening? What? We've got an arcane manifestation There's involved no in this pull. This enemy is this unbelievably is... banned in most cases, and yet Legendary are pulling it. This is going to be huge if they're able to make this work. What have they got? Three constructs in this too? Is it just two constructs? It looks it, like okay, it's, it's just it's... two constructs. Oh is it three? Oh my gosh. No, 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 so it's only two. So, so this is, okay, this is the pally attack, right? Your paladin yeah, yeah, is yeah. letting you land so many extra kicks here because you have those Avengers shields. You also have a priest. If a suppress starts to go off, you can MD it if you need to. Uh, but they're able to just get this done. Oh my goodness, look at this count. Look at wow. how much count Legendary have secured from this pull. That is incredible. Igloo full uptime on that pull as well on his Dragon Rage, just doing an so, absurd amount of damage to it. But Cheese, even though they have less count, they've started the boss already, so this could work out well for them. Legendary are, however, <laughs> pulling into boss. This is going to even further extend their count advantage. Yeah, one of the one of the things that we know about Cheese's route, though, is they actually end up grabbing a lot of bonus mobs that are in this area. They grab that Arcanist plus Guard patrol that's on the stairs. They also send Zatsy up to the top of the stairs to grab that bonus guard with all of those uh, worms. And so that's where Cheese is going to be able to make up a decent amount of count. I, I don't know how I feel about this. I think that on paper, I kind of prefer getting the boss pulled earlier. Like, I, I think in theory, that should be faster. But I mean, Legendary is just going to have so much trash, man. Yeah, I, I think I like Legendary's side of this so far, but it really does depend on what the follow-up yeah, is, right? Because, what? yeah, I mean, they, they've done so much extra trash as well. They've done, like, all the docks, too. So what can they do while the skip is happening, or are they not going to do the skip? Are they just going to go as a group through the building? Is that going to be the idea here for Legendary? You know, do it kind of the, the original way that basically nobody has been doing in MDI. Is that fast? I'm okay, unbelievably so the, the curious. Are, the buffs are hard set on TR. Like the buffs yes. that you get are the exact you same. You always get the like... Arcane Lantern. You get the, the food, right? Uh, yeah, those, yeah, yeah. those effects on that side. Uh, you have some of the ones that spawn ads. But LePan is going to go down. Okay, instantly battle rest. Beautiful B-Res there. It's going to bring LePan back up. So this is only going to cost Legendary five seconds. Very little else, in fact. Maybe some favorable Manic Grief Torch resets as they also continue chain pulling here. 52% trash count now for Legendary. Cheese at 50% off of their rolling chain pull. Their patrol captain now sub-25 is going to go and have a, a drink of that poisoned cup. And now they're going to be splitting up into a team of four and a one-person uh, skip team, which is going to be Zatsy on the Evoker, I believe. So the other four are going to go and do that Dox pull. Zatsy as an evoker, actually, maybe we could even watch him. He's got a, there's a really cool evoker tech you can do to speed up this skip. We'll see if that's something that, uh, you, you can like deep breath from upstairs all the way down. Oh, really? Uh, if you yeah, yeah, land yeah, it from definitely. the right spot. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's something that they are doing though, because it does get you in combat very quickly with those imps. Dude. This pull for cheese is so sus. They're grabbing the construct into the docks pull. And this is a situation where if any kick goes off for the side of cheese, they could have a player go down. They could have guards that are fully fully healed up. So they need to make sure that they get perfect interrupt rotation on the construct while also having a multi-man rotation on the guard or uh, on the Arcanist that's in this pack. Okay, meanwhile, Legendary have finished off their boss, and they're Where's just this doing a pull <laughs> in this area. They went up both staircases and collected some enemies. They now have all of these being fought. But I have a question. Their whole group is here, right? Or where? where is Tobo? Do you know where Tobo is? I see him not on the meters, so he was activating the skip. Okay. Tobo was doing the skip while the rest of the group was doing this. This opens the way for them. And they're gonna okay, have a I lot have, of count here, question, but she's on the same count. What's your question? Is, is there a chance that Legendary is going to triple kite the mini bosses? Maybe. I mean, they have There's so much. Maybe count. the count for it. Yeah, I Tobo is getting them the lantern. He's like, getting them the brew. Yeah, yeah. I think they have to be tripling the mini bosses with how much count they're gonna have here, because otherwise you, you're like forced to pull like enforcers and whatnot. But I, but I think with just how many mobs they have here. So look on the left side. You see Cheese here. Oh, they're going down on the side of Cheese. Please be rest that man. They have to battle us. So Ricky has it. Oh, but they get the cry what? of pain. 
And that no. is going to be a full wipe for Cheese. That is catastrophic for Cheese here. Now they're going to start this mini boss once again. But Legendary, if they get this kite working, this might be what they need. We'll see if that's what they plan to do. Nope, they're pulling in. Okay, so it's, it's just the pulls here. All right, this is their they full count. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They need to 90%. And so, like, we know that they're not going to be... So they don't, they don't kill they any forces. They have a summon, but, like, they didn't use it yet. And think about what they did earlier as well, right? They killed off that arcade manifestation. They killed off the yeah. mobs upstairs and all in the patrol captain Gerdo oh, room. Right. Now they have all that space that might facilitate the kite of these three mini bosses. So it all comes together here. We'll see if that's Dude. what Legendary are up to. Tobo did perish. He's going to run back, you know, though, like, so it looks uh, like this was maybe an unplanned death rather than a planned one. That You know, sometimes in this dungeon you do have planned deaths, but I don't think that's what that one was. So now they're getting in position here. All three mini-bosses are here. Look now, you can't fight them with the boss because they have this massive, nasty aura. You can see Igloo powering up an Eternity Surge. Eternity Surge into Pyre is going to get combat with all three of them, get some nice threat. Then Lapan is going to pull to Lixe here. Let's see Let's if we can at... maybe watch Igloo on yeah, the side of... Yeah, exactly. He is going to be... Wow, he has gotten away fast, and he is just running for his life here. <laughs> now, Amakaya is going to stand still, and she's going to cast those Screams of Pain. Igloo hits the Renewing Blaze here. That's going to full heal him for the damage that he just took over the next few seconds. But the question is, how is he going to continue to survive these things? I guess he's going to hover. The stairs? And then while he's hovering, he can run away and keep spamming a uh, living flame on himself for these future cry of pains. So he's baiting up these stairs. Remember, they pulled up here earlier, so the trash isn't here anymore. Fire breath to get some threat. That's also going to give him... Oh my goodness. Okay, so as an evoker, because he has fire breath ticking on this now, yeah, he's going to yeah, get yeah. some instant cast living flame procs. He's going to be able to use those on himself to heal. There's Obsidian oh. Scales, one... Oh, not even Obsidian Scale actually necessarily used there on our tracker, so maybe not. It looked like it, though, so maybe it is. Maybe our tracker's just not showing it. And now he's flying back over the side and hovering away! Wow, look at this guy. Wow! Dude! And look at Tilixay playing Look at Tilixay's health here for Legendary! Let's, 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 cut back to the, let's cut back to the other four. Let's cut back to the other four and see what's going on. Like, they're actually starting to drop pretty low as Tilixay is getting higher and higher stacks of this burning intensity. Lapan has a lot of cooldowns left available for him. He still has that bubble. Um, He's now, never going to die, right? Barrett. It's Splat that's going to die, I think, is the first person. The, that Feral Druid, while they do have a decent amount of yeah. off-healing at times, they are certainly the most vulnerable here. Splat ends up going bear form there for a sec. That was actually for incapacitating Roar to stop those casts on the imps. And now it's going to be Barkskin to try and keep Splat alive. A Word of Glory lands on him as well to heal. He does have some free regrowths as well in his globe, in his rotation here if he wants them. Igloo actually gets chunked right at the end there, but does oh, manage to win. Incredible, incredible performance from Legendary here. And now they are just a little bit away here. Lapan going to go on a little adventure here because he has a, his shield mogged to Truthguard, the Legion artifact, which means that he's going to be able to, to detect which of these packs the spy is in. Oh, look Looks at, like look he guessed spy. wrong at first, but they got the right one second. So that's okay. So the deal with the spy game um, on the TR is that it's been sped up to any of the uh, people that you click on at the bottom. They have a set time. So at the top, it takes 30 seconds for them to get to the po uh, get to the point and turn into that uh, dreadlord. But at the bottom, they also take 30 seconds and they book it up the stairs. <laughs> Yeah, they have just zoomed up here, and they're actually going to pull it back here because Lapan was the person who guessed wrong and got sent back to the front. Now they're going to be able to get this pull going, though. They've got everybody here starting to do their damage. Meanwhile, Cheese are also almost finished here. They are working on their spy game as well. Fragments looking around for that spy. There are 10 seconds of death timer here in Legendary's favor. And in addition to those 10 seconds, they're also further ahead in this dungeon. So if Legendary can just hold on here, they might be able to put up the only 2-0 of our day here. That would be incredible out of them, especially... You know, think back to Cheese. Cheese were one Echo of Doragosa away from being in the upper bracket and sending Echo into the lower bracket, oh, right? That was their dude. last series. If they go from that into being 2 0 out of the lower bracket, that will be just the most heartbreaking day for them. I am, oh, and, just imagining it causing me pain. And I mean, dude, Legendary, it's off the back of them hiding all three of the mini bosses on this fight. It's, it's just so sick. I love this strategy. 
for legendary it it's it's not something that you would think of is possible like i, I remember uh hearing some of the teams they were kind of talking about they're like oh yeah i wonder if one mini boss is like kiteable and then it's just like oh apparently teams are kiting two it's just like the word the word on the street is that two teams are kiting two i never thought oh yeah i'm a cut is able to be kited around the whole entire area but legendary and igloo showing how it is possible it, it's just a masterpiece i love i i I was surprised that they were pulling the manifestation trash, but I think the moment that it clicked for both you and I, that was so cool. Yeah, I also love that you can have Igloo playing a DPS, but you can't take the healer job away from him, right? No matter what, <laughs> he's he is going to have that healer job of like kiting mini bosses like we did back in Freehold and in, uh, in season four of BFA, right? Uh, while yeah. the rest of the group kills the boss. And yeah. look at the damage I mean, that he's putting out as well. Really goes to show you the versatility of these players. Not the stat, but the ability to play multiple specs. Igloo, you know, a healer main, but just doing insane damage here on this Devastation Evoker. Wow. Oh! Do you think he's get? Do you think he'll get PI here? I suspect he will, yeah. We'll see if that PI comes up, where it goes. Looks like it may have landed on... Oh, no, it looks like it's gone on a melee, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it looks like it's actually gone on Tobo instead. Also, of course, very good on a DK with Lust and Army. And yeah, you can see yeah. on the damage meters there, Tobo, only because of the PI. Oh no, Igloo's still fighting him, actually, for that top spot. Hang on. As long as Igloo remains Igloo in Dragon Rage, his damage is phenomenal here. But as soon as Dragon Rage expires, Igloo's damage is going to fall off a cliff with the boss this low on health. I mean, dude, if Melandris is dead on the side of Legendary, they have 10 seconds of death advantage in their favor as well, so we're not even going to be waiting for 10 seconds to see if Cheese are able to kill off Melandris. This is going to be solidified for Legendary. There is a question of whether or not if Cheese didn't wipe to I'm a cut ya, could things have been different in this map? It wasn't the most clean thing for Legendary, but Cheese with one mistake on I'm a cut ya, allow Legendary the opportunity to kite their way to a 2-0. That was an amazing dungeon. What a way to end the day. I, I absolutely loved watching that. The uh, Just like the parkour drag fear that we saw, just getting away from all the mini bosses, keeping the rest of his team safe and able to just deal with Talixia on their own. I loved it. It was great. It was tragic for Cheese coming so close, right? Having a, such a small thing be the difference between winning and losing. But hey, you know what? Legendary, like I said, they were part of the other 2-0. Now they get to see what it's like on the other side. Yeah, 100%. And that side here for Legendary lived up to their name. It really was a Legendary route. I'm still so ecstatic about what we just saw. First, I was like, okay, why are we why are we not engaging that boss, right, Tedalus? I think you had the same approach, like, get that boss bold. We can still put stuff on top of that. We've seen it before. Here, yeah. on the side of Cheese, that's exactly what they did. I really like that Satsi was going up the stairs and grabbing some of those stair mobs down to kind of keep that one mob gaming factor very low. I think we're going to see them run in here now. Uh, Zatsi coming back and they should come down the stairs on the right side. Yeah, here we are. And then Legendary basically also did that stair pull, but they did both sides after patrol captain. So Lapan is going to run up here, grab everything that's up there because we now know they need this space later on. So they're just going to grab everything that's here and they're going to grab everything that's at the bottom of this arena to make sure there's a lot of space for the shenanigans that this team has planned out later on in the dungeons. Of course, that gives them so much count previous to what is going to happen in the Telexe area that they're not going to need to play any other mobs there. They can just have everything here, kite it down. Well, actually, Tobo is the one unlocking the skip, which is like, that's your slowest class. <laughs> and he's going to run all the way there, get those buffs, open the door for you while the rest of the team is here and just fighting it down. And I think after that, that's kind of the highlight of this key, right? I'm not sure if the... Yeah, we have... Okay, so this is first. This is where things went wrong for Cheese. I think even if this had worked out, probably Legendary was faster, but you can see it here again. Femme unfortunately dying. They had Amakacha basically heal a lot to full health. They had to redo it, had to all release five deaths, but here is the, the big action out of Legendary, getting all three of those mini bosses, and I said it in our in our green room as well. I want like a igloo one hour skipping <laughs> 
exciting a version where we just have like a fancy saxophone sound and we're just going to have him running all the round. I thought yeah. that would be very, very cool. <laughs> but yeah, in the end, Legendary reigned supreme here and got that 2-0, the only 2-0 that we saw in all of today's games, which feels crazy to say, but that's, that's the global finals for you. Yeah, I, I, I can't believe it. Oh, go ahead. Worth, worth noting here, the, uh, the damage meters are going to be a little bit off here because something we didn't uh, expect, but because the players got so far apart from each other during those uh, kiting skips, it actually does oh. cause a little bit of a problem for our ability to get all the combat logs and, <laughs> and everything together. So uh, numbers are going to be a little bit off from what they actually were, but uh, you can see still... It's very impressive damage coming out from the team, and also some impressive healing, of course, given that the the pressure on these comps was how do you stay alive without a healer throughout this dungeon. Yeah, it's it's neat that we continue to see such an incredible variety in compositions for all the dungeons, even when it comes to things like this, even when it comes to these fringe no healer comps even then teams have different takes on how that should be done how it should be operated and that's just been like a ton of fun to see the the variance of variety in uh season one has just been extremely good yeah absolutely and with, with legendary yeah. <laughs> legendary advancing that actually means that tomorrow in the lower semis, we're going to see Perplexed versus Legendary, which means that Shine is going to play Lapan, who both rate in the same guild. So there is like a, hmm. a little a little fight between guildmates that's going to come up. Oh, Bert. Uh, yeah. I'm sure there's going to be a little bit it's of also, it's <laughs> trash talking going on there. There are also, I think, like five or six different series in our bracket this weekend that <laughs> featured Echo players against other Echo players, too. Yeah, so. yeah, <laughs> Pretty for Pretty common sure. phenomenon like here given, in our global right? finals. The, yeah. <laughs> the Echo on Echo competition never ends, really. I mean, it's going to be the most Echo of them all. Well, we're versus now it's this Echo. Wolf Disco or something. Mm -hmm. Well, here's our bracket. And uh, four teams remain. Echo, Mandatory, Perplexed, and Legendary. The four teams battling it out to be the champion of uh, Dragonflight, MDI, Season 1. We're going to find out who it's going to be tomorrow. That is going to be a, a sick set of matches. And the jury's still out on uh, whether that's going to be Echo or not. There are certainly challengers in there. I think uh, a lot of people were thinking Mandatory was the one to maybe contest them. Um, perplexed, I had in there as well. Somebody had Legendary. I can't, I'm trying to remember who. But these are all teams and that no, people thought could no one had give legendary. Echo a run for their money. No one had Legendary, really? Okay. I thought I, I could swear I, I saw change, it. Can I change I mine? I swear I saw it. It's, it's, it's been a long day. You can change because... yours. I'm giving you permission. Okay. I'll change Tell mine to Legendary. Message yeah, yeah. me. All right. I'll change mine to legendary too. Tobu messaged me asking like, "Oh, did you do your Go predictions ahead. yet?" On like, I think Thursday, and I was like, "Yeah, we did." Are you sure you want to hear them? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> the motivation is you can prove to us all that we voted wrong. Well, they would have been my dark horse if I well, was allowed one. Same. Mm -hmm. same. I mean. That would be a great story, too, for them to come from the last stand qualifier, or not qualifier, tournament, rather, make their way all the way up to the finals and then uh, beat Echo. What a story that would be. And, and uh, while it's, it seems unlikely, it's definitely not impossible with the skill level that everybody's at right now. So it should be a lot of fun. It's just something like we saw so many two ones today. Basically, every single series except for that last mm -hmm. one that you just watched was a two one today. And I think that if you play back a bunch of these series over and over again, you're going to get multiple results. A lot of the times, I don't say every season, but many of the seasons, whenever you watch the MDI, you kind of have a couple of favorites coming into it and they kind of do about as expected. But really, right now, I think that there is a lot of opportunities for upsets and, and teams to really oh, yeah. test one another. Uh, I don't think this is as clear cut as what has been in the past, and I think that we we have a lot of competition left even tomorrow. It's certainly the closest I can remember it being um, for for a while. You know, both again, and I'm counting time before I started actually being on the show, and I was just watching. Right? It's uh, it seemed like there was always a team where you're like, all right, we're pretty sure this team's gonna win, and then you have a chance for upset. But here, 
It's all very even. Should be fun. Well, that is going to do it for today on the Mythic Dungeon International. It's been an epic day of matches for sure, but we got one more day remaining to crown our champion here for Season 1. So we will see you tomorrow for that. It's going to be a great time. Thanks for watching. See you then. Oh.